Hello everyone and welcome back to Fight Night Legends EU. My name is Scarzig and I am joined on the desk today by Manitas filling in for Panda, of course. Glad to have you, my friend. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to cast these games because uh, we have some great games to come and some great decks and players. Mm -hmm. It's uh, my first time uh, debuting as a, a caster internationally and it's, it's, it's a great time. It's, it's, it's a really great time. Yeah, I think that is going to be awesome. Again, thanks for joining. And just for those of you who are also joining us today for the first time, uh, we're going to quickly go over the format for Fight Night Legends. We've got a double elimination bracket with our eight invited players from all across EU. The matches are going to be best of three. The players will bring two decks that do not overlap regionally, of course. And to win a match, a player must get a win with both of the decks that they brought. Um, because it is a double elimination bracket, you have to remember that the grand finals from the lower bracket wins. It will create a bracket reset. And it seems like it happens all the time here at Fight Night EU. And don't forget about that sweet $200 prize pool that will be split across the top four. And the top two players will be automatically invited back for the next uh, Fight Night EU. That's right. And um, for the bracket, uh, we already have the, the games uh, ready. And uh, we have some interesting games and some interesting players. Uh, first off, I want to start with Spikes, uh, which is probably one of uh, the most known names in here. Uh, he's from UK. He made part of the EU Masters uh, past team and is... Uh, uh, he has some pretty consistent uh, uh, results. I'm uh, pretty looking forward to, to see some of his games. And also from Mate Asher, which is very known in the community and with a lot of uh, top cuts. I think this is going to be a very interesting matchup. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm honestly looking forward for all the players. Like I, I know all the names here and uh, I've played against almost all the players. And uh, uh, I know the, the, the capacity of all the players. Uh, Kalamitas from uh, Thailand is also a, a top cutter from the, the region and is going to play against uh, Bajatak, which, uh, which is, uh, I think, is qualified for the Xeshi uh, team and uh, has a lot of top cuts, is a very consistent player and probably one of the strongest years. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Yarito, which uh, unfortunately couldn't um, attend, uh, which was going to play against Tirano uh, from Spain. Uh, also known for his uh, top cuts and uh, for his uh, leather results. Then uh, for the last matchup, uh, as far as the starting, we have uh, Kono Jornoda, which uh, might be a new name for um, the spectators. But if you played the top ladder in Europe, you know this definitely this name. He's from Russia. I think he qualified for the Masters Russian team. Not 100% sure. But uh, he definitely brings some good decks with some interesting decks and is definitely a strong player. And to match that, we have him playing against Bratchet Kara, which is already known from the community. It is probably one of the players with the most top cuts and uh, one of the, in my opinion, one of the best players in the game right now, I would say. Yeah, Bratchet Kara has, you know, made a lot of very powerful appearances at Fight Night Legends EU. And like we always say, any of the matches that you're going to see today could be the grand finals of almost any tournament in Europe. These players are fantastic, and they're bringing a wide variety, trying to outthink each other, not just with meta decks, but with some off-meta builds as well. We do have the first match of the day already set up. It is going to be Kalamitas versus Bajatak. And Kalamitas, a young player, as you mentioned, from Thailand, still doing a lot of work. A lot of the top players in this game, I think so far, have been a little bit older, have that, you know, old school match the gathering pedigree, but we have a handful of very young up-and-comers that have just been hitting the scene really hard. They're just sponges for information and matchups, and they just play well. And so I'm really excited to see Kalamitas uh, bringing that representation, taking it to Baj Attack, also a very young player who's making a name for themselves here in EU. Exactly. And as I said, it's from the Access Republic and a very young player with a lot of talent and a lot of top cuts. And uh, um, as he's saying, his, his, his favorite tech is, is a combo player and he definitely brought some, some combos. He, he brought some spice and some things that he liked. Uh, uh, we definitely have some new talent and uh, by new, I mean uh, new in terms of age. Like mm -hmm. I've noticed that many of the top players also are very young, even though we have a, a big difference in ages and we have all 
uh, ages in terms of players. I've noticed there's a lot of like young players with a lot of talent, and it's the case of, for example, Bajatak or Kalamita. So this is definitely going to be very interesting, and we could be looking into the future um, of uh, the pro scene in Runeterra in terms of the young players. Yeah, and you know these younger players as well aren't afraid to try something a little bit new. We've got uh, Kalamita's Zoe Vi list. Now, this has been one of those decks, very similar reputation to the old Heimerdinger builds, where it supposedly is a very strong deck, has a great win rate, but only a few players can really pilot it to its maximum effectiveness. Uh, you know, affectionately called Ruben Zoo or Ruben Pile. Um, this, this deck has had a recent resurgence, and apparently, you know, it is strong enough to make an appearance here at Fight Night EU. Yes, it is definitely. It it puts some pressure on the board. We can definitely see some interesting decks like Gifts from Beyond and this uh, list from uh, uh, Calamitas. Uh, this is a deck that is uh, made to just uh, be able to clear some of the opponent's uh, stuff and still be on the board. It, uh, as you said, it resembles as the old Aimer Vi uh, mm -hmm. list with Targon. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to see some of gameplay of this list because it's probably one of the lists from the current meta that I have played the least or uh, haven't seen gameplay. And, and we're we actually have... going to be jumping into game one. We aren't going to see that list right away, but fortunately because of the format, we will hopefully uh, still get to see that. We're going to see the classic TLC versus Aurelia Azir. Now this matchup, uh, Aurelia Azir is considered to be a little bit favored just because the removal doesn't line up as well as you'd like when you're playing Freljord Shadow Isles, and you kind of get that multi-pseudo rally scout weakness of the TLC being exploited already. Badge Attack opening up with Sparring Student on turn one with double Deus in hand. Looks to be a powerful start. This is definitely very powerful. As you may not notice or may not know, uh, Deus is definitely the... Um, third champion in this deck, besides the Zir <laughs> and the Aurelia. This is definitely the machine on this deck. And also having Sparring Student uh, early on is very important, because if we're always summoning uh, units and making that Sparring Student uh, big, we're dealing enough damage in the early game to execute whatever we want in the late game. So this is definitely a matchup that could go for Badge Attack if he executes it well. Mm -hmm. we, we saw a little bit of caution there not going for a greedy lead and follow to try to get a bigger sparring student. Uh, no shenanigans there. And Calamitous also playing a little bit slower, not playing the Lissandra on curve, uh, kind of chilling out because despite the power that is in Badge Attack's hand, you know, we still have to get to the later stages of the game and see if the synergies will truly come together. Vengeance, very nice tech to just keep this inspiring Marshall off the board for another round. Yeah, but it's going to be answered with um, with um, lead and follow. I'm still not used to some of the cards. I sometimes forget the name, but it's going to be answered. It's going to uh, summon the a lot of one ones to attack into uh, Kalamita's face. This is the problem that uh, um, TLC has to answer with Azira, really, which is when we answer to some of his uh, most uh, its most cost uh, answers, and mm -hmm. we can develop some big attacks, which is the case now. Ooh, I like this. Fading memories on the sparring student to get another chump blocker here. Yes. This guarantees our uh, Lissandra survives and guarantees a block on the sparring student, which, uh, as I said, is a very important tech to deal the most damage early on to win. So and this is very smart. Despite the smart stabilizations here in the mid game, the inspiring marshal was sent back to the hand. This needs to be dealt with again. And uh, Kalamita is still at 9 HP. This is you know, within striking distance of Aurelia Azir. Trundle now also coming down. There is still an avalanche and a withering whale. Things aren't done yet. It's just dealing with this big sparring student is really the, the issue, I think, right now. Exactly. And uh, as uh, we're seeing, even if we go for a Venus for the side of Calamitas, it's definitely not the play to kill the, the, the sparring marshal. So this is going to stick here and it's going to deal a lot of damage. And uh, we choose to go for Avalanche to try and clear Ire uh, both Irelia and the Sparring Student. Uh, but we see there's another Sparring Student. So Badge Attack was already ready to whatever the, the, the calls from Calamitas and the answers would be. 
um, to execute the big attack, which will be right now. And uh, I don't think Calamitas has uh, anything in hand that can answer these uh, big threats that uh, is going to is going to do. It's it's going to be very big, yeah. And there mm -hmm. he goes. It's a surrender. Yeah, the double deus with inspiring marshal. Just that one mana spell uh, going to generate three one uh, three three ones four for three ones actually. And it's just you can't keep up with that that wide board as Trundle Lissandra, and that's that's basically the weakness that Aurelia Azir really exploits. And the avalanche could have been pretty strong there, but the shape stone was just enough for Aurelia to survive. And it seems like whenever you think you have a good line. Aurelia Zier potentially has the answer, and even being able to pressure that inspiring marshal, you're just delaying the inevitable. Yeah, and uh, Azir really is too strong in the, as, as a deck, because uh, when we have answers, there's always another answer that they could have for, mm. for that, and we're just losing some of our answers. So uh, it happened as the case, and uh, the game went to budget attack, and we're going now for the second game, where we have Shivana Aisol against uh, TLC. Hmm. So this is this is another uh, strong matchup for TLC, where they go above a little bit above the uh, the Targon Demacia, right? You, even though they have so much value in the late game with the and Saul, if you just blow up their deck, <laughs> then uh, you just want to end the game that way. Um, it's the matchup isn't as bad as it used to be. This deck has the Demacia deck has started to be get uh get a little bit bigger with the screeching dragons and the concerted strikes and running even more late game because these bigger bodies don't line up so well for the tlc removal here so screeching dragon double screeching dragon potentially in the mid game could give calamitous a lot of trouble yes and as you're saying now the the matchup is not as bad as it's used to be to demacia because especially because of shivana because this type of bodies uh, uh, are big enough to survive avalanches and withering whales and just stick on the board for a really long time, which is uh, a problem that TLC has to deal with the Masia decks, especially the Golden Ages ones, which is uh, big enough units to stick on the board and deal damage that we cannot answer. And we already have the case. We can pull the 3-3 tree -tree with our Screeching Dragon and deal 7 damage with one attack. Mmm, so the box is actually going to come through. Make sure that this trade goes. And Shivana to the rescue with single combat. You can see that Bajatak knows how the way this matchup is going to go. If I can keep my board alive, I can keep this pressure going. I don't even need to rally. Cal Calamitous in a very similar situation, already down to 9 HP once again. Yep. This, is, this looks like a fast game if uh, Calamitous cannot answer uh budget attacks uh board and it doesn't seem like because we can play the two um the two gems on shivana and we can play another screeching dragon and we uh threaten little for next round and uh, not even an avalanche into withering whale okay with uh no because on attack shivana gets plus one plus one so not even a avalanche yep. a second one into withering uh, withering whale uh answers this so it's just a, it's just another desperate blocker here from Calamitas, and this is this is again because you aren't threatening lethal, just further development, and exactly. threatening to pull this beard to the side, and Calamitas just has to keep the seven mana open for this vengeance. I don't know how greedy I would be to play a second lieutenant now, because we haven't seen an avalanche, and we could bait that we have a sharp side. Because if uh, we make our opponent waste a second avalanche and uh, we have answers to survive to make our minions survive, it could be very bad for for the TLC. So that's definitely a consideration, and I'm pretty sure that Baj Attack is considering that because Kalamitsu's passed with eight mana, which yeah. means that it's probably going to do uh, a box. And but even with the box, it's not good because we pull with uh, with our Lich and uh, the tree tree. So it's definitely trying to bluff some stuff. Uh, to Baj attack, and uh, he definitely went to the. Um, he played the the fangs. Ooh, yeah. You said that uh, playing lieutenant might have been a little bit better to threaten sharp sight, and so Kalamita is just going to commit to the box here, and exactly. that's going to be yeah, uh, living for another round. Shivana still levels up here from the dragon damage, the plus one plus one from her attack, and then another from the level up. This is still a lot coming through, but. 
the the thing about Demacia Targon is, you know, there's no burn. If somehow Calamitas can stabilize from here, there is the matrons in hand, but no trundle quite yet to tie this together. But we can level up, uh, and I think it's the case, we're going to level up Lissandra just to make sure that uh, we have the the Watcher in hand already, because uh, we can in two rounds already do the, the OTK. And the tough one Nexus is pretty important to minimize damage, especially playing against um, Demacia. Mm -hmm. And the Withering Whale is healing for three, we have Vile Feast to heal for another. It's going to be close, because there's a lot of challenge units in play right now, and any of these just needs to hit the Nexus, pretty much. There's the open attack. How good would it be to play the stunning, uh, the, the stun now? I mean, we know there's a Matron, so it, the Calamitas could play another Matron. But uh, what if, for example, he didn't have anything besides just one Matron, and pulls a Renation? We could bait some things, but... I also like the, the open attack. It makes uh, Calamitas have to use everything already, and we still have chances and ways of killing the um, the Lissandra because we have the strafing strike that we gained from. Uh... Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't yeah, have anything. Too much, just too much pressure and just not enough healing there. The open attack seals the deal, and a very quick. 2-0 going to badge attack there, who was actually favored by chat as well. We just got the data here. 65% uh, voted that he was going to win. And after that first match, I don't blame them. Uh, just very quick punching through TLC. It's been a deck that has ha enjoyed a lot of success for a lot of time. And now that it has a, no a new deck on the scene that gives it so much trouble, it's been pushed to the fringes. Spikes was actually able to you know, top Fight Night EU last time with the list, but it, a lot of very, very close wins uh, in order to take that out. And the meta, I think, is unfortunately shifting against the deck in a big way. Exactly. Uh, while we have a zero, really, and the meta is impossible to play TLC, uh, at least safely. You can play it, because uh, you can play against some Draven Azrael's, you can uh, also queue into some burn, like discards mm -hmm. or other type of actual burn. Uh, but most of the decks are we're, you're going to see is Trash Nozzles, which is not that favorite for TLC. And the Zero Aurelia, so you're in big trouble if you find the Zero Aurelia. And we saw how. Uh, we, we saw one inspiring Marshall or one dice is enough to finish one game. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we do uh, have the next match queued up. We're going to catch the next game in the set between Spikes and Asher. This was a set that we talked a little bit about when we analyzed the bracket earlier, and this match in progress looks to be Aurelia Azir getting scooped up by Ezreal Draven. The, we love uh, to see it. So how, how do you feel about this matchup overall? Do you think that Ezreal Draven is actually favored, or is this like just another one of those, the deck has a good enough matchup? I think it's favored somehow to Draven Ezreal because we have a lot of ways to defend ourselves with uh, uh, our spiders, we have ballistic bots, we can stun with Arachnoid Sentry, so sparing student is not a problem. Uh, I've seen case of Spikes that he has two Thorn of Rose, which is an interesting attack and I really like, uh, especially because it baits some removal from uh, our opponents in certain matchups. And in case of uh, Spike's list, we have a lot of clears. We have Static Shocks, the Tri-Beams, as usual. We have Culling Strikes, two Scorchers mm -hmm. to deal with dice. So we have many ways to just finish everything our opponent has and is bored, no matter if he's a Zero Relia or whatever. So I think it's favored for the Riven Ezreal, and we, we can see that happening, I guess. Yeah, and uh, I just want to point out we've got Shady Character, and a they who adore and play, these were like the worst <laughs> tribe <laughs> even populators of all time. <laughs> I, I didn't say anything, but I definitely noticed that amazing seven mana two two. And that means only one unit died from the spike side, which is more interesting. You getting a tribe beam on seven and only having one unit dying until then is it's fun, and it's definitely fun. Some basically spikes low roll, but it's still everything is still in control, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the the thing about Aurelia Azir is when you're running a deck with enough removal and enough bodies to chump block, you can just run them out of resources and droplet 
is the only source of card draw, and that's still just a combo piece. So here it is, Azir versus the world. Spike, Spikes is still on 6 HP, and, you know, the miracle could happen. Oh, this is interesting. He got the Scorched Earth. He got the Scorched Earth to kill Azir, and... Ooh. This, this this feels bad for uh this feels really bad for it. Oof. This oh, is an there it is. <laughs> I was just going to say that like you know leveled up Azir if you get a Deus or an, a Marshal or an Aurelia or something like you could pop off and just just completely seals that game one. We honestly I would love to have seen the beginning of that game to see how it all stacked out, but I think we caught the most important bits. We saw the crazy dry beam low rolls right into the finish there with Captain Farron. Definitely. And I would say that Spikes really got uh, Yami Yugi's spirit because that <laughs> definitely was the best draw you could get there. Uh, even though I think his end was pretty okay. It was having entire board and also mm -hmm. Retraven is fine for the rest of the uh, the round. But definitely that Farron was 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 the key. It was, yeah. it was the key. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, if, if you're going to win, you got to draw like a champion. And Spikes did the exact same thing uh, during his last fight night EU appearance. And so getting into the next round, we've got Spikes on the classic TLC. Um, he plays his deck very, very well. We just got done talking about how the meta does not favor this list right now the way it used to. And playing it into Aurelia Azir, Spikes was like you said, top decking like Yami Yugi in order to win this matchup. And I don't know, you know, how much the variants can possibly be favored going into Trundle versus sparring student Deus Azir. You've got champion on one, champion on two, and then a champion on three. Let's go. Yeah, on, on the case of Asher, we do have the champion on two into champion on three. As I said, Deus is the third champion in this deck. Uh, but uh, Spikes is running some interesting text. He's running two Ice Shards, which I personally really enjoy the two Ice Shards on TLC. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good tech. Uh, he only runs two Sentries, two Tavern Keepers, and one Bubbling Bjerg. So he's not interested in the Spectral, uh, that are interested in trying to draw consistently the Spectral my turn. He's trying to make sure he survives also with the two, the boxes. So it, the deck has some sustain to, to try to win this matchup outside. So Spikes as a chance, but it's definitely going to be hard with this hand. Yeah, without the lack of, uh, with the lack of Ice Shard, it's pretty rough. I do want to give a small call out to Spikes' choice of including Flash Freeze in the deck. Um, his logic behind that over three sisters is just like 90% of the time, you just want Flash Freeze anyway, and I'm not going to pay the plus one mana, so I definitely respect that read. Early Lissandra is one of the key ways that TLC can stabilize and survive, so if the rest of the hand keeps up with removal like this, another copy of the box, um, it could be very difficult for Asher to go through um, with Vile Feast and etc. being threatening. You can't preemptively do your punishes and your combos with lead and follow it it forced you to play a much more honest curve with Aurelia Azir despite being favored you you still have to kind of play a, a bit slower yeah definitely uh the fact that we have uh Lissandra for the side of spikes is going to help a lot I would say uh so Asher just took a lot of time to think about this one. He's probably afraid of uh, Avalanche, I would say. And uh, um, that's why he didn't drop Sparring Student. And if, if in the case of an Avalanche, we can always do lead and follow. So this is this is very interesting because Spikes just do a greedy pass, I would say. And trying to bait some more stuff from the side of Asher. And uh, there's a consideration on uh, Aurelia. The thing is, if we drop Aurelia and there's definitely an Avalanche, we just lose... We have to choose either between Aurelia or Droplet, so I can see why both players are... At least Asher is taking some more time in thinking this round. Mm -hmm. Spikes, because of, you know, just the knowledge of this deck and this matchup, uh, takes the time to think when it's necessary, but also has a knack for passing in such a way that it doesn't give away any information. Exactly. Like, 
Like the, like the hesitation here, you're thinking, okay, they don't have Avalanche. If you have it here, you're always going to snap cast it. But in this matchup, not even necessarily because you have so much mana open. You know, you have to consider lead and follow, that sort of thing. So right now, Spike says, okay, should, should I try to vile feast the sparring student to just try to get it to connect before it gets buffed up? Exactly. And this is also very interesting uh, for Spikes for taking time. Not besides uh, the possibility of uh, Vile Fist, but because he can be telling that, okay, I have an Avalanche and I'm not sure if I want to play, which is a bluff for mm -hmm. Asher. And we know that what he actually wants to do is the box right now. And I think he's, he's, he's going to do. Yeah, but it's definitely going to be answered by the lead and follow. So we're probably saving, I would say, the droplet and start some drawing, because we definitely need to get some gas going. In in a lot of other matchups, I think you would save the Sparring Student, especially with a with Aurelia in hand, you've got Azir and Deus. The potential for this card to get huge is pretty big, but in this specific matchup, it's it becomes a lot more difficult to safely set up the Sparring Student, and getting the card draw is going to be a lot better for your long-term success. One copy of the box down, there is only one other copy uh, in Spike's list. Exactly. But there's still two uh, Ice Shards copies, and one of them is in, in hand, so I guess we're kind of fine to 1-1 one, one attacks. Uh, we can deal with that. Kind of. I mean, kind of. Th th this still seems scary. Like, attacks like this seem very scary, because it's... It seems like s small units, we're just, okay, we're just taking one or two, but if we see all of these units, it takes too much damage. So this is starting to get a bit scary for Spike's side. Mm -hmm. Ooh, even holding back the spider here. Uh, just saying, you know, I can take a little bit of damage here. It's still pretty early in the game. Uh, and Asher even saving the shape stone. Now that you've got leveled up Azir in play, the plus one attack on the tokens means the tough on the Sandra isn't as important, and so you don't need to shape stone to uh, trade up into her. Exactly. And especially because you can use shape stone for an actual little. In case of spikes, I can see the save on spider, because from now on, all the one ones will be two ones, so we can save more HP with this spider in an, an access attack instead of the, the previous one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where you, you, you're holding back a block and just because you know there's going to be something more important to block down the road. Getting Trundle here as well. Ooh, it's tricky. It's yeah, tricky, you know, it's like, I'm going to attack here. And Asher, honestly, you could take the damage, right? If, if you want if you want to shape stone, you definitely could. But to do so, you're, you're putting like Azir in danger. So yeah, just take the damage. Yes. And uh, if we do shape stone to kill it, we are in danger to avalanche uh, Valfeast mm -hmm. or avalanche withering whale. So it's better. We we can take this four damage. Like there's no problem. It's it's just uh, as we say the silly trundle just dealing some four damage. We, we it's fine for us. I'd say. I know. I think that I think that players just take the four damage from trundle a, a lot more often than they'd like to admit. Exactly. Uh, I think it's more rare for me to block a trundle than to actually take the damage. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. just, it's, it's just four damage, it doesn't matter. Then eventually we die because of four damage and we're like, okay, maybe it's mattered in the end. <laughs> I know, you died in like double plated ravine. Uh, Ice Shard is going to stop this first wave from the Flawless Duet. Asher does still have an attack token, still has enough mana for Rivet Dancer and Blossoming Blade. Uh, can you That's survive all of scary. these waves of damage, Mr. Spikes? I don't think he can. And the and the most funny part is that we still have mana for uh, an homecoming to drop something. Like, for example, if he wastes all his mana, we can just do homecoming from uh, one of uh, our 1-1s one attacking and Trundle to take out a blocker and have another attacker for our next attack. And uh, we still... We, we can do a lot of stuff. This is... This is this is just I don't think I don't mm. think spikes can survive this one. It's yeah. too much damage. And whenever you whatever you block, it's just they blade it's gonna make Asher just blade surge on reaction. Exactly. You you ha you do have the box, but again, uh with it only dealing three damage, you just respond to the box with blade surge. 
uh, Azir comes out to play. I think Spikes is uh, seeing the writing on the wall, unfortunately, despite the very valiant effort here in the in the early game, the removal just stops lining up when you have, again, these units with lots of HP that TLC just kind of struggles to deal with. Exactly. And uh, the worst part about this is because we have to block with both the Talisandra and the Trundle. No, I mean, not in the, this case, because we're definitely getting the box and we're letting it go. But in the next attack, uh, we have two switches. And we're going to have three switches. So we can actually just make it so that... Uh... Ooh. Yeah, don't you... You can uh, you lead and follow the... Aurelia. I mean, the Blade Surge, rather. You Blade Surge the Aurelia, and then you just Blade Surge the Aurelia with the Azir back onto the bench. Yes. So basically, y you can just get a way to just uh, smork with this Azir. Yeah, you don't even and you don't even need to do like a fancy double Blade Surge there. You actually still have the attack token. So there he goes, as expected. Azir Aurelia taking the game against TLC. And again, Spikes plays that matchup probably the best you can from the TLC perspective, but it's a lot of pressure. And if you don't draw like I think last I think last week when when Spikes won it all, he was he teched this deck a little bit uh differently this time around, but was running like three copies of the box, I think, had I don't think was main decking Avalanche at all. I think was only running like one copy and had like triple main deck ice shard and was consistently leveling up Lissandra to get the free Ice Shards, and that what was really was locking out the game. And with Aurelia Azir, now that I think it has finally made it through that tempering process of the competitive scene, where players recognize that, hey, you know, it's not a deck that if it gets countered, it starts to lose. The mastery of the deck as it's existed now for a little bit longer has increased, and players can actually pilot it through um, also, it's bad matchups, and it makes it a lot safer of a tournament pick here. Yeah, definitely. Azir really can definitely be pilot against uh, some counter matchups. And I, I, I definitely can say that as an Azir Strash player, sometimes I think I haven't won a game against Azir really. I, uh, that probably says more about me, but uh, uh, that's different. But definitely the, text, the, the decks are getting more tacked, and... Uh, uh, even though, as you said, he attacked more with the triple ice shard in the previous uh, fight mm -hmm. night, uh, this time he, he decided to go more for the for the avalanches, and definitely avalanche is not the best against his deck because most of the units are coming on the attack, and avalanche cannot answer to the attack. So, as expected, Zira really got to win, and we still actually got to see uh, spikes holding on for a really long time, uh, seeing that the hand uh, that Asher got. So. Uh, I guess it was the best that he could do with uh, the hands that were provided and mm -hmm. married to the, to, to, to the players. And getting into game three here now, uh, the fates have aligned and Asher is going to be on Nightfall versus Freljord Shadow Isles. This is Nightfall's worst matchup, hands down. This region combination, just the removal, just wipes your board. You can pray for uh, all of your Crescent Guardians and your other three HP units to come out for Freljord Shadow Isles to not be able to wipe it as effectively. Notably, Spikes is uh, also running Blighted Ravine, which allows that removal to line up a lot better Exactly. And I'm kind of sad that we're seeing this matchup in such an unfavored way, because I really like Asher's deck. is uh, running two Cloven Ways, which is a very interesting tech in this meta. And also, Asher is a believer. He believes in Moonlit Affliction, and I've been saying this card is bonkers, because I've tested it in Mist Rates. It's really good, and this oh, can give no. you some really good attacks. <laughs> Oh my god, Moonlight Affliction and Mist Race? Don't tell him. Yes. Mute the stream chat. Do not pick up this <laughs> forbidden technology. Uh, but to be clear, Fearsome is very good into Aurelia Azir right now for the, any of those who are asking. We're seeing a lot of spy, uh, Spider Aggro take advantage of that. But to get back to this matchup, uh, I do really like Nightfall as well. Cloven Way is a fantastic card. Um, it's great to duplicate with Fading Memories as well to just lock your opponent out. I think that because we saw Gravitum so much from Aphelios, we know how strong an effect like that can be. So if you can just take that power, package it with a body with Overwhelm, 
uh, yeah, you get to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, Asher is pushed through a little bit of damage, but is working on, I think, just trying to level up Nocturne as, as fast as possible. The open attack here really isn't that great because of Ice Shard or Withering Whale, so you're sort of forced to develop on top of all of these 1 HP units. Exactly. So what I would say from Asher's side is trying to develop both the, the um, Crescent Guardian and Diana probably, and trying to get uh, a good attack. I think we can probably level, yeah, we definitely level Diana this round. And we're in a pretty bad spot because even though we already saw one box coming out and we pushed some damage, uh, we don't have that much gas on our hand, we don't have ways to just sustain the late game, so we need to make sure we deal a lot of damage now and that we have a good attack. And with 1 HP units, it's definitely scary. At the very least, when you do lock in that attack, even though the units will die, you're still getting some level up progress on Nocturne, which maybe sets up some sort of combo here as we get uh, later into the mid game. Uh, it's a little bit desperate, of course, to go for Unto Dusk. Uh, you can push through a little bit more damage by refre by reprocking the plus two attack on the Crescent Guardian. Uh, but you really, really want to save those for Doom Beasts. But I think that, as you mentioned, the lack of fuel is going to force that line. I mean, if our Crescent Strike survives, both these in the Crescent Strike uh, on the on the Crescent Guardian. Mm -hmm. uh, not Crescent Strike, my mistake. Crescent Guardian survives both the Onto Dusk here or in the Doom Beast. It's basically the same damage on the attack, so uh, we definitely want to probably do one Onto Dusk here, I would say. But uh, I can see why he would choose not to do. It depends on what Spikes do on the attack. If Spikes choose to, for example, do an Ice Shard uh, instead of a Withering Whale, we definitely don't go to Onto Dusk because there are ways for our unit to not uh do the the damage in the face but if we mm. see for for example a withering whale we could consider an onto dusk especially because we're pulling um the tree tree with our diana and spikes right now just thinking about what what's the best line of play for removal like the ice shard is pretty obvious but there's still a lot of damage uh being threatened around the sides if you know you let things just play out the way they are with the very standard line of the ice shard maybe keeping mana open to develop trundle or lissandra post combat you're still you're still taking a big hit and nightfall is one of those decks that can surprise you with the definitely. damage output it's definitely that that can surprise you and sometimes even otk you with just one attack uh, spikes is playing it really well by just passing it doesn't need to do anything it just needs to wait for the attack and just play mm. the defensive way and he chooses to go for the Withering Whale, which Asher just said, okay. Yes, we take the hit, and again, no Unto Dusk tells us we, uh, we can push through a couple more points of damage there and draw a card. Um, but Asher just looking to save this, even though it does draw, uh, just looking to save it for a, a, a slightly better target. Again, maybe Doom Beast or something to get some more direct burn. Uh, it's one of the, I've, I've won this matchup before. It's what it's again, the, a very hard matchup. Uh, you are forced essentially to develop into the removal. And if you get the right combination of cards and card draw, sometimes you can survive that onslaught, but with double ice shard, Lissandra about to come down, Trundle as a potential very heavy blocker that can stop fearsome. It's going to be a struggle from this point out for ma asher at six hp you generally want your opponent to be almost on the ropes and 14 hp is still a massive mountain to climb yes it's definitely a very big climb that asher has to do uh as you said it definitely should be on lower hps to be easier for asher to deal because uh uh whether we want it or not um nightfall is kind of an aggro deck so we need to deal big chunks of damage but we're seeing a trundle going down and getting a stalking shadow from the top deck is really important to refill our hand uh we can try to go for a stygian but that gets answered pre pretty easily even if we go for the the extra uh attack on it so that mm -hmm. doesn't seem like the best answer maybe a crash and guardian because survives uh both avalanches and uh Multiple ice shards. It has a lot of HP and it procs into a good a good attack with five H 
uh, five attack if he procs the nightfall. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of options. I think this is this is honestly kind of difficult. It's either Crescent Guardian or Shade Stalker, in my opinion. What would you probably choose here? I'm I'm still thinking Crescent Guardian. The Elusive, if you get like multiple Shade Stalkers down very early and you have a lot of chip damage coming through, I would say maybe double down or triple down on that. But Crescent Guardian, I think, might actually be the way. Just raw damage is what you're looking for at this point. Exactly. And he definitely chose the Crescent Guardian. He saw the line that he needs those big boys attacking into the, the face. And then next round, there is a, a strong open attack. As you, you just open attack, that way you can sidestep the avalanche, etc. The box won't work. It forces uh, spikes into having double ice shard or ice shard withering whale, which we do see in hand, unfortunately. But it's like your best option, I think, because the developments here getting punished by avalanche or or the box is a little bit too great. But we haven't seen an avalanche prior, and uh, there was a round, I think it was round three, where we could get avalanched, and we saw there was already one box being played. So we can have mm. the answer, like the read that he only has one box, and he hasn't played one avalanche because he didn't have it in the early game, so pro possibly he doesn't have it. And we know by looking at the end that he doesn't have it, so he probably can do that read. The safest mm. route is definitely the open attack, but it also gets punished by double ice shard, which we also see, so... Asher definitely goes for the development of the flight because it's the smallest unit and we can still develop after that and even stun Trundle if there is something. Like for example, if uh, Spikes decides to drop a Tavern Keeper or something, we can definitely do some stuff here. Ooh. Now, Unto Dusk, this is this is another interesting. When you proc the Unto Dusk, you also uh, level Diana. The second Unto Dusk can also pull that. We get Nocturne on yes. the top here. But uh, this time playing something is literally greedy to, to do it. So it mm -hmm. chooses to go for the attack and pulls the trundle and we're dealing a lot of damage. As you said, there's this is the type of rounds where no, uh, Nightfall just decides to go full face with a lot of damage. And as we said, we've got Ice Shard to clear the flight and then Vengeance actually coming through on the 7-3. The double Ice Shard wouldn't clear that damage. You're opening yourself up for Pale Cascade here. I'm um, just going to take five instead. This is smart. Trying to get the Pale Cascade that we didn't get, but it's still a lot of damage. We're pulling uh, TLC into 6 HP, which is scary. It's definitely scary for the TLC. This is one of the matchups where you actually want to be running Atrocity. Um, but again, Moonlight Affliction, you know, to double down on top of this, Asher actually not going to take the risk of playing the the uh, Nocturne there post-combat. Just going to float the mana and save it. If you, if you summon the Nocturne then, um, you get to still go into the next round with a lot of mana. Your second Nocturne will become an unspeakable horror. And then by generating a Nightfall card, you can potentially get more fuel. Uh, one of the ways that this list can start to exist in the later stages of the game here is unspeakable horror, getting like Lunari Priestess, and then you start invoking and getting more value. Uh, I would have liked to see that line, but Asher just recognizing Nocturne at 4 HP is like the biggest thing in this deck, and I need to be very specific about when I develop. Exactly. So Nocturne is basically a win condition, especially with... Um, we know that from uh, Spike's side, there's only the um, the pillars and the Everest and Sentry that we, we're seeing now, which cannot block an attack from Nocturne and other units. So we definitely have to be careful with our Nocturne. Uh, I would say that we can still hold on maybe the Nocturne. I don't know if it's... Because we still see six uh, mana from Spike's side, which means there can be an avalanche and we could get uh, um, Ice Sharded or Double Vile Feasted in the next run. Or even Withering Whale Vile Feast. There's a lot of possibilities to then kill our mm -hmm. Nocturne on the next turn attack. Uh, it is close. And like you're at this very awkward mana total where you want to do you can't do nocturne plus cloven way you can play your ephemeral crescent guardian to set up cloven way but and spike's just going to go for the sacrifice right now of course just to draw a card 
and gets Blighted Ravine off of the top. This is exactly what you need to see. It's a little bit of healing, and you're putting a stopper on Asher's ability to just develop into an open attack once you get that set up. Exactly. And this is going to be, if he plays Nocturne, which he does, this is going to be the biggest nightmare for Asher, because it's happening not exactly with an Avalanche, but kind of the same way as I said. We have Ravine to do the, the Avalanche work. So we gain 4 HP, we're dealing 2 damage to everything, we're killing the Diana. And next round we can do Withering Whale and Ice Shard and kill that Nocturne. Like, easy. So I would say that Spikes stabilized and got into a decent spot to try and uh, gain control of this game now. Mm -hmm. And it's not even that Spikes... does Spikes does not have any threats in hand. It's just that once nightfall runs out of gas you, they're just going to slowly die to just one trundle that's in play and it's just hitting you over the head it's only an event and it's an eventuality before you get spectral matron pulling a spectral matron you don't even need to worry about uh you don't even need to worry about watcher at this point uh so exactly. we're in the same scenario that asher's been in all game where it's that cat and mouse of developing into the removal we do have a lot of 3 HP units uh, coming down, which is a nice saving grace. We definitely do. And the thing is, even if we don't have that much uh, gas right now on Spike's end, we definitely have the two um, Entreats, which means we can get another Trundle. I think the, the worst case is getting the, the other Lissandras, because we already have one. But we can start getting that... Trundle uh, finisher that you said um, to try and finish the game on Nightfall doesn't have anything. But this is still scary, even though we have an answer for uh, our Nocturne, uh, uh, for the opponent's Nocturne in this case. Um, we still have a five, two 5-3s five attacking uh, the face. So this is kind of an awkward position for both players, mm -hmm. because in, in Asher's side you see a lot of mana being unspent, so it means a lot of answers possibly in hand. And for Spike's side, we see 3 HP units, and we only have 2 damage, which is the Withering Whale and Ice Shards, so we probably yeah. need to use that Flash, um, I flash wonder, Freeze. And you, and you talked about how Asher potentially has a read earlier of the Avalanche, and I was wondering if he, had, if he was going to go for the read of... Ice Shard Withering Whale killing the Nocturne and pulling the the pillar with Nocturne instead and just swinging through with the uh, with the Diana and the Crescent Guardian to push. Now we do have a potential lethal with Unspeakable Horror going straight to the Nexus and then that Nightfall effect would boost Diana. Exactly. So, but, but the thing is, we also know that Spike says Flash Freeze, and we do know that there's the, the Flash Freeze in hand, mm -hmm. which is insane, because if it was an actual Three Sisters, we wouldn't be able to play uh, a Flash Freeze at all. So, uh, big props for, for, for Spike, seeing that actually that one mana matters a lot in mm -hmm. these type of situations. That so, is true. If, if, if Asher had put that lethal on the stack, it just baits Flash Freeze, and you get no damage rather than just a little bit of chip here. And now Spikes is still desperate against all of Asher's top decks from this position. We haven't seen a single Doom Beast out of the deck yet. Only one Stalking Shadows was cast earlier in the game. He's, he's, he's trying to make the reads. He's trying to see how many uh, um, answers I've seen. He already saw the two Withering Whales and the two Ice Shards and the Blighted Ravine, and I think it was at least one box. So he knows that there are almost no answers in Spike's side, so he can play a bit more um, safe for his side. He can start developing, and uh, basically it's now on RNG's side, which is, he has no, uh, there's no answers almost, so if he has it, he has it. If he doesn't have it, I win. So it's more of a case in this, this side. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely what I see for him trying to see. Yeah, looking uh, at all side. the removal trying to do some quick calculations. What are the chances you have this, that, and the other removal? Um, but despite this fierce battle, you know, Nightfall existing, you know, what is considered to be an aggressive deck against all of these sweepers at 10 mana, no combo has come down yet from Spikes. Like, if this is... 
despite everything that's happened, this is the best case scenario for Nightfall, where you aren't going to die to the combo, and you have so many outs for lethal. 90% uh, of the chat still thinks that Spikes is favored here in game three of this really close set. I don't even know anymore. I don't even know who, to, who would actually win this one. This is very close. Spikes is... Is is like kind of it's it's kind of desperate because it doesn't have the way to do the combo, so he's kind of desperate to try to find those last answers. Mm -hmm. And Asher is starting to lose all his gas. He's starting to lose everything to do, uh, even though he can do a good attack now. Since he was seeing the the stack, not the stack, but the the history to see how many answers were already done, he can do actually the safe developments of the flight and maybe the um, Stygian on Looker. Because he knows that at this point it's just probably one Vengeance, a Ruination that we never see before, and it's just a one-off. And possibly just uh, one Avalanche uh, that actually hasn't been drawn yet, I think. I think we haven't seen an Avalanche yet, so... No, not a single one. And exactly. Asher is, again, just you... When you're playing the Swarmy deck into all of this removal, you have to shift your mindset, and sometimes it becomes difficult to shift away from playing around all the removal to shift back into that aggressive mindset where you start to hunt for like uh, stronger outs and lethals, taking those bigger risks to develop. Things have been so fortunate for Asher over the course of this game that trying to uh, overcommit and not throw becomes your next concern. And the way that Asher developed, just... Spikes actually has the, a, a perfect way to answer this, because he can just flash freeze and do the last box. Mm -hmm. And he survives two more rounds, I would say. At least he has one more round to try to find this combo, or just a way to survive. And he, he actually can, because now he can play Trundle, then he can play the Pillar next round, and level up Lysandra, and then there's always the free... Um, the free ice shards and the tough nexus so mm -hmm. yeah maybe <laughs> asher here is, has been sitting on these cloven ways because he wants the stun for the watcher i think it's been yeah. so the game has gone so long that like the odds of not having watcher down at this point is just way too low um we finally have another diana being drawn for a pale cascade that's a little bit more fuel uh there is this still is White Knight for, for is Asher. open deck lists, so Asher knows that there's one ruination in the deck and has to like respect that. Every time you develop, you're like, okay, are they gonna ruination? If they do, I still have mana left over to redevelop and try to push lethal here. Yeah. And definitely killing the Nocturne here is is very important. Asher is, as I was going to say, in a very awkward position. Because uh, we now have ways to level uh, Lissandra, and we've we've seen two entries, so we know there's one champion in hand. We don't know which one. If that's a Trundle, we're happy chilling. If it's a Lissandra, we're not happy chilling, because there's ice shards and ways to deal with our stuff. And also, we we saw that Trundle got uh, two uh, got plus two, mm -hmm. so that could actually mean. Like, it, it's actually hard to read, because we know that's one from the Pillar, and it can be one from uh, a Matron, it can be one for another Trundle uh, spell in hand, or the Renation. So, there is no way for Asher to also read what is the, the card in hand at this point. I mean, now that there's a Lissandra in play, you can probably read it's either Matron or the, um, or the Renation. But this is... This is very scary for Asher, I would say. This is where I would say Spike starts definitely stabilizing and trying to just sustain himself and every round playing ice shards, doing clears, and uh, still has a Vile Feast to gain one more HP and get another blocker, so maybe we can see more four or five rounds? I don't know. This is going to actually lens that I never expect Nightfall to go. Yeah. The <laughs> it's like when you when things come down to the wire like this, Nightfall does have a lot of strong top decks thanks to Stalking Shadows and Unto Dust to have draw that burst speeds into other draws. There's potential for like fading memories plays, but Spikes has not played a matron yet. 
a spectral matron and asher has not seen a single doom beast and that little bit of extra burn would have gone such a long way but with two five fours in play uh you can pale cascade here to save the diana and draw a card or she's gonna die to the free ice shard from leveled up lissandra but drawing the card here i still think is important there's doom beast that's the finisher and It'll that's deal one damage to, to the nexus I mean, if it's 1 HP Nexus, it's more than enough. It's all we need. Alrighty. You go. You gotta go for the open attack here, right? Yeah, if, it, uh, if, if it's not an open, it's I think it's uh, kind of GG, because uh, we know there's the Ice Shard to answer our Diana. We definitely have to go. Yeah, you've got two Overwhelm units. Uh, Lissandra is... The visual effect there from her level up is is obscuring it, but she is four HP with tough. There we go. And so with only one HP being able to block, there is enough coming through. The miracle has the prophecy has been fulfilled. I've you can count the amount of times Nightfall has beaten Freljord Shadow Isles control, and you can count all feel the rush war mothers tlc like all of them just under the same umbrella of just board sweep and removal finally here in round 15 or 16 uh nightfall manages to cross the finish line no doom beast required a very long game like uh, an, uh, honestly a very long game that i didn't expect to end this way <laughs> these are the type of games where you look okay this is going to be favored for this side because it's definitely a polarized matchup for this side but it also depends on the way the players play and obviously the draws and this was the case that lissandra even though uh, the tlc got all the answers uh, all the clears uh in the end it was not enough because we didn't have ways to do our combo and uh, yeah. the units from Nightfall side were starting to get some like big enough to just deal some damage like Nocturne having 4 HP. Then the Cloven Way the tech, the two off is making the way into the game and just winning the game in the last the, the, the last round, honestly. If, if it wasn't for the Cloven, it wouldn't be game because the stun on the pillar was very important for this open and the Overwhelm also making the, the extra mm -hmm. damage because the Ice Shard in hand wouldn't make any th difference because the spider is just is kind of useless, we would say, in blocking there. And yeah, like the, the Cloven Ways, they were so clunky throughout the entire game. I think that M.A. Atcher was just sitting on both of them for the most part. Like, do I want to be more cautious and sit on them for the Watcher? Um, there was just a lot of really weird turns where you don't have enough mana to play the Cloven Way plus Nocturne or Cloven Way plus your Crescent Guardian to really double down on that Overwhelm. And at the end of the day, the just the body and the keyword mattered a lot. Uh, no Moonlight Affliction, no Doom Beast. It was just the key, like, power, power cards were missing from both sides. But Nightfall just kind of just has that ability to... It has that extra staying power that a lot of aggressive and swarmy decks typically don't have. And so in when you're playing all of those sweepers, Nightfall can still sometimes take you uh, take you down. So Asher will advance and is going to be taking on Baj attack. So Rano getting the buy, of course, going to be taking on Bratched Kata. And we've already got Spikes and Calamitous now slotted for the bottom bracket. And again, Yarito was unable to submit Dex and is just going to have a, another buy there for Kono Jorno. Exactly. And we have a very interesting matchup here, which is Siriano and Bratchet Kata because of the lineups they brought. And uh, we also have Mate Asher against Baj Attack, which is also a very interesting matchup with very strong players. I'm very excited to see uh, the games we're going to see. Like this, this, this has a lot of potential. But I'm, I'm honestly happy with what we saw. I'm honestly mm -hmm. happy to see a matchup ending in a way that we're <laughs> not expecting. It's it's like the, the those things like in Yu-Gi-Oh when we <laughs> win in a way that we're not expecting. It, it, it's just it's it's mm. just it's just satisfying to see. Yeah, when the matchup goes the way that you know it doesn't typically go, you know it's still a card game. Some new things can still happen, and hopefully this trend will continue when we get back from this break. Stay tuned.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Fight Night Legends EU. We just had the first part of the bracket action-packed uh, conclude, and we are moving through to the next stage of the bracket. The next match we do have slated is going to be Serrano versus Bratch Kata. And Bratch Kata, as we know, has been, you know, just a power player, and Serrano showing up from Spain, you know, Panda is here with us in spirit. He would be rooting all day for his Spanish player. 
And it's just a powerful region. Whenever we have Spanish players show up here to Fight Night EU, they're always just doing gangbusters. And Serrano very easily has probably the spiciest lineup overall for today. And his opponent, Brachkata, um, has been, you know, just competing in Fight Nights across all of these weeks, I feel like. It, it, whenever Brachkata is invited, it seems like a no-brainer. Such a strong player from Bulgaria and is always trying out some off meta things as well trying to shake things up or get an advantage here in the fight night format definitely brachus is definitely a very strong uh, uh, player that has done a lot of appearances here and is also a very known player for his top cuts if there is a tournament in lore we definitely know okay probably brachus is going to do the top cut it's it's just a common thing <laughs> so uh, I'm kind of excited to see the list that they brought. Um, I, as you said, that Brachet Kata sometimes brings some spice to shake up the meta. That's very interesting lines to to bring here, mm -hmm. uh, especially when we see a lot of Azira, really and TLC. I really want to see what decks they, that that Brachet Kata might be bringing to into this this meta, but. Uh, uh, definitely, we're going to have a very interesting matchup because Cyrano from Spain is also, as I said uh, in the beginning, a uh, very strong player from Spain, doing a lot of top cuts and uh, top ladder finishes. And uh, is also my my neighbor in terms of country because I'm from Portugal and uh, <laughs> all my all my Spanish fellows uh, uh, fellows are my neighbors basically. So it's kind of hard to know to root for. And obviously, I have to be uh, with non-bias, so I cannot root to anyone, but it's... Oh, no, it, it's fight night, my friend. We have the biases here, and I am Ooh. loving this LeBlanc list. We saw in a previous fight night a Legion Marauder build, I believe from Den. Uh, it was the Legion Marauder Strength in Numbers variant that was also running Incisive Tactician. But this one, no longer running the, the Legion Marauder package, but is doubling down on Incisive Tactician. This deck looks to be uh, a little bit more aggressive, is gonna be running Hearth Guard to still meet that five attack unit requirement for the Drafarian Assessor to meet that reputation requirement. Uh, but the rally of Incisive Tactician is starting to be a little bit more uh, beloved by these mid-range Frostbite players over things like Shunpo or Katarina, who used to be a guest star in this deck. Um, with the Reckoning and Culling Strike, sometimes this list can get an early mid-game setup and then blow you out of the water depending on the uh, depending on the matchup. Like Reckoning hits uh, Nasus Thresh really hard, for example. So there is a lot of potential in this deck, um, but I think Incisive Tactician is probably the most uh, off-the-wall inclusion, even a one of three sisters to get an extra Frostbite. Yeah, and definitely this incisive tactician is very interesting because most of the times you can proc the um, the new mechanic uh, reputation kind of easily in these decks because we have a lot of units with three attack, uh, with five attack. My mistake. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just basically a six mana rally. It reminds me of the um, uh, eight mana uh, cap. I think it's Tiana. Yeah. Oh, Tiana uh, Crown Guard. Yeah. I, I was going to say Tiana. Dragon Guard Lookout. Ooh. Uh, but the thing is, Dragon Lookout <laughs> doesn't have that much play. It, I, 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 I honestly haven't it's, seen it's, that it's, card it's being played. It's a pet card of mine. It's a pet card of mine. Maybe, yeah. maybe if Incisive Tactician, you know, pops off today, we'll see all of these Aurelian Saw lists or throw a one uh, Dragon Guard Lookout in the list or Golden Aegis or something like. Oh yeah, Rally is strong. Uh, but overall, I do like uh, Serrano's lists because sometimes, you know, if you are you play something that's a little bit unexpected, you're just catching your opponent by surprise. It's a, it's a list that your opponent might not have prepared for or just a matchup that they haven't played in a very long time. And you can get a lot of mileage out of that sometimes. Exactly. And there's a lot of other uh, tech ways, I would say, in this deck, which are not that common. Because we are seeing two Elixirs of Iron, generally we see only one, is mm -hmm. it's more strong on the spell, so it's trying to make sure that it sustains itself. We're not seeing Flash Freezes, the only two Ashwins as usual, the three Whispered wo Words to try to get the draw, and definitely the triple Culling Strike, which is staple. And generally there's, uh, it's, it's generally changes in numbers, but Brattle Steel and Troll Chant, 
it's either 2-2 two, two or 1-3 on cut because they kind of do the same in early games. So mm -hmm. you try to balance it the best way. For example, I prefer the one bridal seal into two, three troll chants, which makes more sense into the early. But we see two bridal seals. So this is definitely trying to be consistent against uh, Thresh Naza's type of decks, mm -hmm. uh, I would say. Yeah, the, the triple calling strike can give you a lot of mileage into Aurelia. Azir, of course, you always feel like a god when they play that Azir and then you slap it with the calling strike. It forces them to have a lot more respect where they have to, it's like Lee Sin, where you have to have a little bit of spell mana floated to play your champion safely. But going into the first match, we aren't going to be seeing Frostbite. We're going to be seeing Serrano's other list, Championless matron lady of clouds into tlc please serrano keep it you know you want to keep it i've played a <laughs> lot of this deck recently not this build that serrano is bringing but i've 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 played the shivana version and this is just so much fun and he has the combo already he has the mobilize which is a very important card uh that some people are running and i really like the tech and he has the matron and the city of clouds this is just this is just going to be very fun to watch. I can assure you this is going to be fun to watch. Yeah, keeping the mobilized in the opening hand, um, you've got the Matron and the Clouds. And this is a matchup where both decks are just playing towards a late game combo. And so Serrano just has all the time in the world to just kick back and get the combo pieces and then get a board full of 2020s. Uh, Brachkata is running one or two Ruination, just two Ruinations actually, which is a which is a card that is the only thing that can stop Lady of Clouds. Yeah, looking at Brachkata's list, we see the two Ruinations and two Vengeance. We also see the two boxes, no Ice Shards and two Flash Freezes. Doing the same read as Spikes and most of the time Three Sisters is just a Flash Freeze, so we need uh, the one mana. This list looks consistent against Thresh Nazis, probably. That's why the double renation. Even though Right of Negation can counter it, I think this is pretty consistent. And we already see one renation in hand, which can definitely deal with uh, the big board of uh, Matron Citria, which is scary. Definitely scary. Mm -hmm. Serrano just waiting an extra turn on the Mobilize to just draw another card so you can get a better pull. Um, we do have Oblivious Islander potentially coming down to discount the Spectral Matron further. And then you can get uh, Lady of Clouds down even earlier. Uh, it's just unfortunate because doubling the HP of Spirit Leech isn't going to do a whole lot in this matchup. You don't have the Mask Mother yet to really take advantage of a uh, potentially ephemeral Spectral Matron or Lady of Clouds or even the Darkwater Scourge. While things looked very strong for Serrano, there's just a couple key cards that will really tie this together. And when we compare that to Brachkata's hand, we've already got Trundle on five, Matron ready to go on eight with the pillar, Lissandra's in hand, and a Ruination just as a failsafe. Uh, this could be the matchup where the Matron combo just pops off for Brachkata. Just one or two rounds too fast for Serrano to take advantage. Exactly. And yeah, as, as as you were saying, like the Bratchet's Cutter's end is honestly the only grail of uh, TLC against this type of decks because we have the answers and we have the Lissandra and we also have the Trundle. I think the only thing missing is just uh, the ephemeral copy, like the fading memories and everything else is. Oh, and we have the second Renation. So honestly, C3 doesn't seem that much of a problem for Cutter's side. I do understand why we waited on the Mobilize and it's very important because we want to get the most value out of it and we definitely did and uh, i also understand why we would do the islander on the matron because we're attacking on even so we can attack with the matron um buffed when we play it mm -hmm. so needs to keep the spirit leech alive just to have another target in play potentially for these other spirit leeches that are ready to go um, this deck, when you draw the Triple Spirit Leech, it can be very clunky. The same thing happens in Nasus Thresh, but you can't cut the Spirit Leech because you need as much card draw as possible to get your, uh, combo pieces here. It's just, for, this is just a matchup and with the opening hand already having the combo pieces just really devalues the, the Spirit Leeches overall. But now we're finally getting into things. Spectral Matron onto the Lady of Clouds. 
Boom. This is this is just satisfying to see. A board like this just feels good. Unfortunately for Serena's side, Bratchet kind of played it really well and saved those three mana HP. And now we have exactly nine mana where we can play one Renation and blow the entire board. So even though the intention of bringing some some action, some fun into the game and for us to see some big units, Bratchet Cut is just going to blow that away and just take all the units with uh, the um, Renation outside. Mm -hmm. And who knows if this deck will adapt in turn. We saw Lady of Clouds getting a lot of really hilariously easy wins uh, when it was first brought to Fight Night. Uh, the way this deck just has massive stats allows it to go above and beyond like Aurelian Saul decks. And at the time, uh, like the, the TLCs weren't really teching Ruination. And so now you just have room for it. Like Brachkata here has anticipated Lady of Clouds to be a bit stronger, uh, especially in a tournament scene where you can manipulate the matchups a bit more in your favor. And so we'll see if Lady of Clouds adapts to the Ruination in turn, maybe trying to slot in the Undying package, for example, so you can keep your board alive. But Bratchkata opting for Avalanche over the Ruination here. A very interesting choice. It definitely saw that killing the um, A2, we're only probably taking 6 damage or 12 at most. We can probably sustain until that. And we can save the Ruinations for later uh, Citrus. Because there could be another matron in hand being played next round. And if uh, we do a renation now and next round there's another um, matron, we just can't answer it mm -hmm. and could be very problematic for us. So that's a pretty good read. And ending up in pretty comfort for Bradshaw Kata, only taking six damage, even though costing a Trundle and a Kindly Tavern Keeper. Yeah, Serrano uh, being very patient, like again, Getting that extra card for the mobilize, holding onto the single combat. I think there was potential there for maybe another trundle to come down post combat. Maybe wanted to save the single for that to punish. And Brajkata just with TLC, you want to do the as little as possible and make these small plays have as much impact. Like look at this, this one one spider is holding back this six damage, and it feels amazing. Exactly. And right now the board for the side of Cyrano doesn't exist besides the 6-3, so basically we, we have to build it again. We just bob the build the board, we have to put some units for our C3 to just uh, have to connect something again. So Brad just kind of made it way into sustaining and stabilizing by just one uh, avalanche. He talked about the possibility of Trundle being dropped and that's why he did it the way he did and saving the single combat. I don't think Bratchet Carter would drop a Trundle. Um, uh, I, no, it's not the case. He would drop the Trundle, but I don't know if he would do single combat because in that case... No, he would. He would. I'm, I'm spacing out. I was trying to see ways because we have to also be scared yeah. of the Lysandra to be, um, to be leveled. I know exactly what you mean, where you're analyzing so many lines of play that it just yeah. starts to collapse back in on itself. And you can really see the pressure that these players are are under as well, where they're trying to calculate these same lines of play. We have both hands to look at, and Serrano essentially has to play around everything. Like, doesn't realize there's two ruinations in hand waiting for any big development. And as you talked about, after you do your big combo with the Spectral Matron, if you don't have Mask Mother in order to save those ephemeral units, you just cash in and then you have to rebuild back from square one. Yes, definitely. Like, this is basically a complete reset on, on the game, I would say. Like, the Avalanche did the reset and the, for, for both sides because we lost the boards from, from the both sides. So, my analyzing was like, I was trying to see a way where we prevent. Uh, anything from seeing, but this is just a very complicated state, I would say, to to, pr to, to predict anything, because mm -hmm. everything has to be built again. But I think what Siren is probably going to try is just going for the Mask Mother play and build a big uh, lifesteal unit with uh, Fearsome, which can surpass that uh, small spider and even a possible um, Lysandra. And it's... 
it's ironic that this deck that's known for getting such massive stats in play, before it does that combo, it's playing like any other like slow, swarmy deck that has to take that risk every time they play a unit into the removal here. Mask Mother going to keep the stats and keyword of lifesteal from the Dark Water Scourge. And Serato actually hesitant, even though this combo looks so good, doesn't want to throw such an important piece away. But you've already committed the Dark Water Scourge, so you just have to go all in. There it is. Is this going to be enough to bait the ruination for Brachkata? I don't think so, because the ruination is more important for other big units. Uh, next round, with this board, we're only taking 7 plus 4, which is 11 damage, which puts us at 4 HP. So it means we're still surviving. And at the cost of a spider being pushed by a 6 tree. So I don't think it's a ruination yet, but it could be. Um... I honestly, looking at Precious Card of Hand, I don't, I don't think there's anything of interest to play. Not even a Lissandra, because you don't want to bait it into the, the challenger. Mm -hmm. With one, with one Matron down uh, and two Ruination in hand, I think that you do feel more comfortable just cashing one of them in here. And as you mentioned, there's not really any other good plays to make this round anyway. Just wipe the board. That way, if there is another Matron about to come down, uh, you're just forcing Serrano to take another round or two to reestablish before that combo hits. And this gives you room to... You know, do your pillar into Spectral Matron. You've got the Lissandra also waiting in hand. So yeah, I can definitely see how why that Renation came out. Because we also have exactly money to play another Renation this run. Even though, well, again, Cyrano has to rebuild the board. So mm -hmm. it's, again, in a reset state where we have to do everything again. So definitely makes sense to do a Renation at that point. Maybe not risking that much HP just to try to be greed with uh, with our clears. It's definitely a good play. Mm. And so I don't think looking at the Lady of Clouds here at eight mana, Darkwater Scourge is going to be the only pull off the Stalking Shadows. Really unfortunate here. Um, again, so many strong ephemeral cards, but the Mask Mother is the the card that really pulls us together so you can be very greedy about these lines and keep those stat lines in play if this was a more aggressive matchup you wouldn't mind just playing the dark water scourge three mana healing for five uh you know that's all she wrote but from this position Ser serrano can't do that slow development any longer because the units aren't going to stick to the board you might even need to just play out a dark water scourge and then cash it in with spirit leech and just keep drawing looking for your mask mothers maybe protege uh another spectral matron at this point even if your board is empty you can still do matron into lady of clouds and get two big bodies exactly uh but uh playing it even though all of that dark water scourge being dropped here feels really bad so yeah this is definitely a weird position for serena where there's actually no good units proactively that you want to drop I would probably go for the, the draw play. We definitely need a, a, a matron or a way to just just be on the board consistently. And uh, having triple dark water, especially because of the, the pull from the, the Stalking Shadows, might be good to sustain eventually with HP, but it's not what we exactly what we need right now. So it's, it's definitely going for the play and is overing from the cards. So this looks like it's going to be a Spirit Leech on the Dark Water Scourge. Just getting that card draw. Lady of Clouds, it's a very explosive deck. Once you, if you get anything to stick, doubling those stats, giving it Challenger is massive. If Brachkata, you know, overcommits, thinks, okay, well, I can go for my combo this turn, goes a little bit early, taps under Ruination, Serrano maybe pulls something off, you know, gets that big board set up into an open attack. And it's not just even just about like the stats hitting you. It's the fact that like Spectral Matron and Mask Mother have Fearsome. So as long as you pull uh, one or two units to the side, the rest just hit your Nexus. Um, it's a very violent OTK. Spectral Matron is now about to come down. Summons exactly. Lissandra to get the Watcher. Exactly. We probably need this level up on Lissandra to get the tough Nexus. Uh, even though uh, I would say... Having all the big units from Serena's side, the Ice Shard doesn't make that much of a difference. Uh, but uh, I definitely see that there's a need of leveling 
the the the, the, the Lissandra to try to get the Watcher and try to sped up our combo from Kata's side. Yeah, so another another matron could come through. Needs two more eight drops. We just got a sneak peek there to discount the watcher to zero, but a matron, of course, will just let you pull that. Has to end the round. Brachkata just making a slightly proactive play, reminding Serrano that I've been passing this whole time, but you are still playing against an opponent. You still have to worry about what I'm doing. Uh, and so Serrano now feeling the heat, just going to develop a blank Radiant Guardian. Yeah. And uh, even though it feels bad not having the tough and the lifesteal, in this match, it, it, in this matchup, I, I mean, doesn't mm -hmm. make that much of a difference because there aren't that many units and uh, uh, TLC is not properly the most aggressive uh, deck for us to try to get HP through it. Just getting a, a quick switch of perspectives here, no big deal. Uh, Serrano does go for the Stalking Shadows. I wasn't sure if Serrano was going to take the round end there that was offered by Brechkata, but uh, just gets the pull here into the opening hand, and it is a... Ooh, Cursed that's Keeper. Yeah, that's Spice. That's that's a pretty good tech to, to have against TLC, because uh, I don't I don't think any TLC player likes to, to kill uh, a Cursed Keeper and put a 4-3 onto the opponent's board. Yeah, if only we could have gotten these a little bit earlier to maybe combo with the Spirit Leeches. Really unfortunate. The four threes getting their stats doubled is fantastic as well, because an 8-6 is extremely threatening, has good trades into most other units, survives tons of removal. And so this is actually giving Serrano a very good Lady of Clouds when you look at the stat lines right now that are looking to be doubled. Exactly. This is this is an actually really good uh, C3 for uh, Serrano's. Uh, the only problem is, as we know, um, Brachikata has a second Renation, and mm -hmm. he's probably trying to bait Cyranos into playing everything he has to then do the Renation. Because probably in Cyranos' mind, he's like, okay, I've seen one Renation, there's only one other Renation in the deck, probably doesn't have it. Uh, but mm -hmm. it was a kind of sus Renation, because it was not on a C3 round, and uh, Kata knows that there's a C3, so. There might be some mind games in, involved right now, um, but is, this is definitely very smart from Bratchet Kata's side, trying to do the Vile Fist on the Cursed Keeper and then pulling the 4-1 for a good attack with the 6-6, six, six, trying to get another trade. I can predict next round a Citria into a Renation, I think. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things where Serrano is the one that needs to develop a board-based win condition. And Brachkata has the tech. We we already kind of passed through that meta where Lady of Clouds was able to catch TLC unawares, take advantage of the fact they weren't running Ruination. And now that they've shored up that weakness, uh, Lady of Clouds is the one that needs to adapt in turn. So here it is, Lady of Clouds coming down to double these stats. Quite a spectacular board on that side, and Bratch Kata now just saying, okay, I can just wipe this with Ruination, and then it just comes down to top decks, right? Trying to get this Watcher down. This is a championless variant. There's no gonna be there's not gonna be any shenanigans around being able to shuffle another copy into the list. This is what I was trying to see. Like we actually don't need to wait on top decks. We just copy this with Ruination. Oh, no. Exactly, and then we just finish the game next round. It's our attack, and there is no way that Cyrano starts shuffling stuff without champions. So, this might be the, this might be the GG. This was probably one of the top decks that uh, Bratchet Kata needed, either the Ephemeral or the another Matron. So yeah. Or actually deciding to go for uh, playing Oats a Matron. For defense. Okay, saves the Ruination. Okay. If you, I guess if you have the means to develop a board, then I guess you could just go for it. You can single, uh, but it doesn't really matter. It's it's just all about, it's all about just surviving this turn. Yeah, and there's also a flash freeze in hand, so... Okay, Brashed Card is kind of fine, even though this, this seems like a, an odd way to do it. This is, this is, this is fine, I would say. I mean, if we look at Cyrano's end, it's not that fine because there are literally four ways to four single combats. Yeah, I mean three single combats and uh, the one one more mana single combat. 
the expensive one, basically. And uh, there could be ways to deal with uh, this um, this watcher next round. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So uh, if Serato just doesn't attack, it ends the round. It says, "Okay, uh, if you want to play the watcher, it gets killed by double single." As the flash freeze. 17 HP. There's actually not. <laughs> there's not enough uh, attack. Uh, uh, attack in play to take down a watcher. Lady of Clouds. I think they don't really care about having things like inserted strike because their stuff is just so big anyway. You don't need to rely on two units. But yeah, again, just setting up the watcher here for the open attack. And it's GG. I was actually ignoring the <laughs> fact that we could play the watcher this round. And that yeah, would actually yeah, mean GG. Once you, yeah, you fade the matron and once you summon that extra eight drop, it just discounts the watcher to zero anyway. So you can just play the real watcher. Very rarely do you die to the real watcher. It seems to always just be an ephemeral copy and it's just like, okay, I guess I die. Or they play two or three ephemeral watchers, but a rare, a rare outcome indeed to see the real watcher come down and actually be a threat. Um, but again, Lady of Clouds, Ruination is the one card that stops it. And so Bratch Kata doing a good job of just taking that first game, having the tech, predicting. That's This is sort of his specialty, right? Even if, you know, you don't win the overall tournament, you're making that top cut, you can still be confident that you have a good read on the metagame. But now, going into the next game, this is going to be a matchup that Lady of Clouds absolutely adores. Demacia Targon, a list that struggles against anything that is bigger than it. Exactly. And this is, as a CTA matron uh, player, uh, this is exactly what I like to see. I like to play against this type of decks. This Shivana or Aurelian Soul decks are pretty, pretty, pretty good. Like to to us, because generally we build uh, bigger boards, because the twelve twelve is always higher than any Aurelian Soul the opponent plays, and you can get the value trades and obviously even one shot. So this might be favorite for Cyrano, I would say, but uh, we still have to see. We we know what happens when we say sometimes that this is favorite, and we even saw it <laughs> yeah on the ca one. the <laughs> caster curse baby. This, exactly. this variant is running three Shivana and two Aurelian Saul. So not opting for Zoe, not trying to sneak in a Jarvan, just having the dragons in and saying, you know, that sixth champion just isn't worth it. By running two Aurelian Saul, there is going to be potential for Sky's Descend on some crazy stuff later in the game. But this is... This is a pretty toolboxy variant that Bratch Kata has going right now. There's only two Dragon Chow, one Slurry Sunforger, um, it, only one Guiding Touch, one Star Shaping snuck in, and a single Judgment as well. Uh, so a lot of just weird tools that force Serrano to consider the, in their lines of play. Off the Stalking Shadows, what do you take here? Uh, I would be greedy and uh, probably go to Spectral Matron, but then I probably would lose the game, especially because we have another <laughs> Spectral Matron. <laughs> so uh, I probably would go to something that we could curve out. Maybe Mask Mother into the Dark Water Scorch and is overing over it. It's a good oh, option. Yeah. He knows we did it. see We did see the last round how like important mask mother was oh the green line the main getting duplicated <laughs> let's go okay the i like Cyrano. going big we like the chunky units and we're definitely going for the spectral matron we go for the greed because we know also that one way we have to win is if we eat a c3 now in the draws we oof, when we got to this immobilize this is this is good we can double mobilize. If we get a Citrid, it's so big, honestly. Greed is greed maybe was the way in the end. Honestly, when when you're discounting the Matron, it doesn't even feel greedy anymore. This is just the correct play. You've got the 4-1, the 4-3. We've got Glimpse Beyond to draw two more cards. If Lady of Clouds hits this hand here in the next two or three draws that are about to happen. Oh man, Bratchkata is not going to have any time to set up 
uh, a mid-game dragon board to even hold down the fort against this. Yeah, because uh, definitely if we find the C3 on turn 6, we start just doing some... Yeah, on turn 6 or even 5. I don't know. Five we can't because we still need to mobilize and, and we wouldn't have is... mother. <laughs> oh no! Spectral Matron is not designed to be this chief. Breaking exactly. the game <laughs> in real time, right before our eyes in 4K. Just hacking, lowering the mana cost. Even though we have a good attack from Bratchet Cutter here, it could uh, pull some pressure into Cyrano because we still need to find the Citria. We're having a po uh, like... Hypothetically thinking of a Citria, this would be big, but we still need it. And right now this is a very threatening board for Serrano's health if he doesn't deal with this correctly. He can block the 2-3 with uh, uh, the Spirit Leech, but not sure if it's a correct play to give an extra gem to brush his card next round. Could mm -hmm. be a mistake, so opts to just let it go. I really, and... really like the blue Sentinel in these uh, in these Dragon lists, these Demacia Targon decks, because you have that that pseudo discount the way Herald of Dragons would work for this list. And it's just a two, three that's great for chumping. And it does pressure your opponent quite well. Cause they're like, oh, if I kill the blue Sentinel here, they could get a uh, Screeching Dragon or Eclipse Dragon or Shivana down around early. So I, I love the pressure that it creates. Vanguard Redeemer, unfortunately not finding Cythria. Exactly. Unfortunately, we couldn't find the Cythria. Uh, we're gonna get a trade here from Brush's card side is trying to level up Shivana because it's definitely one of the win conditions and it's always getting bigger the more we play with it, uh, we attack with it and get a kill. Uh, but Cyrano opts to try and find the Citria. That's just all we need. It's just one Citria of the Clouds. One more draw and we possibly have a big Citria next round. Come on. We just, it's approach time. Citria, please. Oh, mm. not, not, um, Okay, so we don't get we don't get the cherry on top of this giga discount Sunday, but there is a six mana matron, a seven mana matron, and I think that's another seven mana matron on the far left of the hand as well. So the next few turns are just going to have pressure after pressure, and with Mask Mother also being added into the mix, uh, you're able to carry over that ephemeral onto a real body that Bratch Cat is going to need to deal with. The hand is all spells on the Demacia Targon side. So the stuff that's in play has to get as much value as possible before it goes down. No Cetria, this is sad again. We just want the Cetrias. But uh, unfortunately we can't. I think pulling the Radiant Garden is the correct way exactly because it's a big unit that can deal with the dragons. It trades directly the Screeching Dragon, also threatens a bit the, the Shivana and also it's a value trade against the Sentinel, so it's definitely a good pick. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you can play it now, uh, but good for later rounds. All right, so Dragon's Clutch being cashed in there gets Screeching Dragon and Aurelian Saul. Still a little bit more mid game fuel to keep Brachkata above water here. Dust, uh, Darkwater Scourge is going to be combo with the Mask Mother, it looks like here. Exactly. I definitely think it's the play right now. We don't have anything else that can build a big board uh, with only 4 mana. So this puts the 7-7 seven, seven with Ephemeral. Oh, not Ephemeral. Uh, it would be bad if we got the Ephemeral, but gets the Lifesteal and the Fearsome. And it's a good blocker to all the 3 units on the other side. Even though we know there's ways to answer with the Concerteds and the single after an attack. Um, or even the sharp side we just throw can deal pretty easily with the Mask Mother, but it's still was, the power play. Mm -hmm. I was thinking uh, if Bratch Cata would actually throw the Dragon's Clutch down that last turn to try to get Eclipse Dragon to play for the Daybreak this round and get Aurelian Saul on 8, try to get out ahead of this combo but just keeps the mana open, wants to stay flexible, wants to keep these combat tricks up. The Concerted Strike uh, is going to be pretty big here, hopefully to clear the 7-7 seven, seven and save Shivana. If she levels up the Strafing Strikes, Ooh, it's can just... keep Serrano from developing a board for Lady of Clouds. Exactly. Like, if we are able to deal with the board and... Uh... 
Uh, this this was all that Bratched Cutter wanted. He wanted the the mass murder to block the the Shivana because of our ush, and we mm -hmm. still have mana for single combats or concerted or even a sharp side. So this is good for us. We're taking out the board. We know that uh, uh, there has been a lot of drawings and uh, uh, Islanders that discounted cards and. Uh, a lot of stalking shadows, so there's a possibility with the mobilize that there is a matron, and we need to make sure that no Citria buffs any units. So mm -hmm. taking the safe route from Bratchet Kata's side and getting response with uh, the actual uh, Radiant Guardian, which is a big chunky unit. Yeah, this this becomes a little bit more dangerous. You can maybe cash in the 6-2, uh, which gets punished by single combat. Like, you can't go for Concerted Strike here, uh, because, you know, like, single combat would, would really disrupt that. Exactly. I think it's just about passing. There is no need to play anything from Bratchet Cutter. We can definitely play, and I can mm -hmm. see that. Like, for example, a Screeching Dragon, or even trying a single combat just to take out. There's, there's reasons why, but there's also reasons to not do anything, because we still have to wait, I would say. And it's just one more unit, even though it's scary if it's an, an 8 10 next it's, round with Challenger. Uh, <laughs> it's it's there's still just the option unit. to develop the uh, the Screeching Dragon, like you said. But goes for the line, says, I need to keep this board clear to make the Lady of Clouds as bad as possible. Right? A lot of the mid game combos have already happened here, and this was the outcome I was a little bit afraid of. Exactly. And it gets traded. I mean, we lose a Screeching Dragon, it's bad, but we still have a Shivan on board. We still have a Sentinel, honestly, that is not going to give us any ramp at this point, but it's still a 2-3. Uh, and we took out of one unit and a single combat. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still positive for Brushed Cut outside. I probably wouldn't do anything, but uh, this is also a good line to try to minimize the possible Citra. Yeah, so now you're... In another scenario where you're like, okay, do I glimpse beyond the Lady of Clouds? The bottom of the deck is so, so rough. So many cards have been drawn. We're already almost to round 10. Aurelian Saul's just about to drop down. And there is no threat from Serrano's side. Despite getting the, the Matron early off the Stalking Shadows, discounted with Mobilize, discounted with Oblivious Islander, there just hasn't been a good moment to develop those bodies and swing through. The Screeching Dragons and the Shivana have been enough to keep things under control. And without a board, this deck's combo ability, you know, goes massively down. And Bratch Kata now is just cruising to the late game. And without a big combo turn to keep this board even, if Aurelian Saul levels up, then potentially zero mana celestials can actually carry through yes and we know celestials can be very scary great beyond um it's definitely one of the scariest ones so getting for example a zero mana great beyond in the board is something that Cyrano doesn't want to see no matter how many citrus he does have in his board so it's actually really sad that we, we saw the greed play from the matrons and it almost looked insanely good and we just needed to see one c -tree. We're taking a bit of time to find that c -tree and that's kind of sad. We already drew, I think it's off the deck, it's been 20 draw, uh, like I think there's 21 or 20 cards left. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we saw. And it's it's kind of sad, having like three copies of c and not finding one, it's... We, would, we could say a low roll, but it also can happen as a card game. And uh, Bratch mm -hmm. Card is capitalizing on that and just uh, making sure the Shivana is getting all the value possible and while c clearing everything on the board to make sure C3 has the less value possible when it comes. And when you're in the Demosthenian matchup, there are certain times where you can just, you know, do a pseudo combo. You just want to play the Spectral Matron down. You can punish your opponent for not having a board that blocks Fearsomes very well, uh, well at that particular moment. But that's what Brach Kata has had, right? A lot of units with four and five attack in play. So even if you want to go for the Matron, they can still block. You have uh, combat tricks like single combat that can just kill an ephemeral unit immediately. Even so, so, if you have something small. Um, and now, I think that Brash Cat is picking up that Serana's kind of desperate here with the Glimpse Beyond. 
and it's going to prevent that card draw. Yeah, this is just going to prevent it. Brush's card is probably getting the read that at this point, Cyrano doesn't have either a Matron or a Citria, so we have to minimize the draws and make sure that uh, uh, we keep on this side. Because once we drop the Aurelian Sol, if there is no Citria on the side or no board, we're kind of fine. So it's just as I, I was saying, Brush's card are just capitalizing on it. And uh, as you said, the fact that also um, we're playing against the Demacia deck that has obviously units that can deal with Fearsome, the power plays of uh, Matron into Matron just to get a big attack cannot work in this situation. So this is getting into scary lanes for Cyrano. And uh, I would say Bratchet Kata is currently epi chilling with this board. Just uh, playing with his dragons and doing Talking some Talking Shadows and... number three. Four options, no Lady of Clouds has to take the Spirit Leech here. All of the card draw, I think, has come out of the deck now. There's one real copy of Spirit Leech, I think, still in the deck. And it... this is going to be Lady of Clouds in the bottom quarter of this 40 card deck? Pretty much. This is uh, this is actually a low roll. Actually, not getting a Citri. This is this is kind of sad. I, I really want to see the Citri coming to the board with th all of those matrons, but uh, this uh, there's still hope. We got obviously the Spirit Lich, probably not pulling the defense with the uh, Islander into the Shivana, because we're still we're still alive and for HP we're still fine and we obviously need uh, some some food for our Spirit Liches and we probably don't want to use the other uh, Islander for it, because it involves us playing it. And we, if we don't block this way, and uh, Kata doesn't uh, kill the Islander now, we can always do the, the Spirit Leech directly, without mm -hmm. having the problem of possibly not having units to do the Spirit Leech. Yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, Demacia, Targon, they don't burn, but you need to keep your HP total up just a little bit. This because the Shivana is just getting huge, right? So if you if you take all the damage here, you're just yeah. Look, is even going to cash in the strafing strike to make this uh, Shivana as big as possible. This is lethal with both of these strikes going through plus sharp sight. Exactly, this is actually lethal. Um, this is a this is a very interesting little puzzle. I was not even seeing yet. <laughs> I, <laughs> this is a very interesting one, but it can be answered because there's a um, there's a single combat, so you yeah, can always you, you can single always combat your two one into the two three, so that Shivana loses one proc and then you live at one HP. I think is exactly. the way. I mean. We can also single combat the 4-3 into the 4-5, because that way we're cancelling the healing on Shivana. Mm, mm. Both ways are kind of fine, we just need to find a way to at least be at 1 HP and not die. Obviously we die to another single combat, or... Okay, he opts for this one. So obviously we would die to another single combat or another strafing strike or a sharp side, but we cannot play around that, that at this point. So, surviving at 1 HP with a dream of still finding one Citri at least, we can... Oh yeah! Dragon's Clutch's other effect. Not just drawing two dragons, you can also break it open to give your dragons plus one, plus one. I've, I've only seen the card played in that stance one other time. I completely forgot about that power. Ah, Bratch Kata had the lethal puzzle and then had the one extra, extra, like, step and just didn't... Maybe saw it and maybe decided not to use it. Maybe said, you know what? I want to just draw more. Maybe that yeah. was the line, but one HP. I mean, at this point, your opponent's going to die to a stiff breeze potentially. There's no like Radiant Guardian or Lifesteal Mask Mother in play, so I think that Brachkata might just be confident to, that uh, there's a closeout for this. And there it is, no Cythria once again off of the Spirit Leech. That's sad. We're not seeing a Cythria this game when we have a four mana matron. <laughs> this is, I've never seen such low-cost matron. 
Like, this is actually funny. If we actually got one C3, this is probably the funniest game I've ever seen in my life in terms of mana costs. Like, this is... This is... It's just all funny. The, yeah, yeah all the rest of the combo pieces came through uh, to discount the Matron. There is even a potential that, you know, with 4-mana Matron, 5-mana Matron, you could just double Cythria. You could double Lady of Clouds. Exactly. So basically, we just need to make a board now and try to survive and uh, do a Prage on a possible C3 next round, maybe. Dropping the Radiant Guardian to try to, to get some some life. And uh, not sure if we drop the Islander to get the extra blocker. He yep. opts not to do it. Yeah, says just, I'm, I'm even right now. And unfortunately, the caster curse came through. We talked about how Lady of Clouds can do wonders against Targon, Demacia, but any deck can falter when you don't draw your uh, your card win condition here. Uh, Spell Shield on the 8-8 means that there's no combination of single combats or anything that's going to be able to chump this. And that is going to be lethal indeed. I kind of feel bad because I actually talked about the Great Beyond as a possibility with your Linsol, and it was oh it there it is being no Cythria in twenty seven cards. That is a big set. There is some. There's additional. There's some weird additional math there because when you stalking shadows, you look at the top four, and then it shuffles your deck again. So who knows if Cythria every time it was getting close to the top, the stalking shadows threw it back down at the bottom. But uh, yeah. card games, thats it happens to the best of us. We saw earlier where Spikes just didn't get Matron like for their combo for a long time and Nightfall managed to like break through and it's whew, no Cythria. It's still a double elimination format. So Serrano will still have potentially the chance to make that combo work, get all the bad RNG out early in the bracket, and then just carry through in the lower bracket there. Yeah, I definitely want to see more of Serrano, especially because of the list they brought. I really like the Citrim the, the Citri Matron version. I I really enjoyed the deck, and I'm I'm sad that we didn't see the Citri. And mm -hmm. not only a, a caster curse, as we said, maybe, <laughs> but. Uh, and again, we, we're seeing a bad matchup ending up the way we were not expecting. Because uh, when we look into this matchup, we know that Citri Matron is probably favored because of all the big units that it makes. And it can deal with the dragons and with Aurelian Soul. And uh, since we didn't find the Citri, obviously the Aurelian Soul deck has the bigger units and the ways to deal with it. So it ended, be ended up being uh, probably um, a result we were not expecting, especially because... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly yeah, sad. it was it was it was a it was a heartbreak to to yeah. not see that combo go off. But you have to remember that Bratch Cata was also like sweating the entire time. Every time a Spirit Leech came down, every time a Glimpse Beyond came down, is this the turn? Is this the Cythria? He was doing his best to to keep the board under control, though. Uh, but we're gonna take a quick look at how the rest of the bracket did go here. Um, so Badge Attack actually takes down Asher. 2-1 to one to move to the winner's finals now against Bratch Kata. So now we're going to have Serrano taking on Calam Calamitous, and Asher is going to be taking on Kono Giorno, who got the bye here in the lower bracket. Spikes actually being eliminated, unfortunately. The TLC pick that was so strong for him the last time did not come through today. Exactly. Maybe sometimes it, it works like that. It's a card game. Sometimes the mm. deck works really well in a week and the next week it doesn't work. Card mm. games have some variance and also the matchups we hit. So um, nonetheless, it's still a great run from Spikes on the, on the last uh, week because he got the win. And uh, even though he's already eliminated, he's still a great player. And also TLC might not be working that well, but it's still a great deck in my honest opinion. And we saw it taking out the Citria deck uh, in this round with Brash yeah. Kara. And yeah, even if you think a deck is unfavored, if you are comfortable with that deck, it's still, you know, your best strategy to bring something that you've practiced. Um, but we'll see how the rest of the players are able to uh, sort out their matchups when we get back from this break.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Fight Night Legends EU. As we moved through the bracket today, we've gotten a heaping helping of card game variants. Uh, players, the, the theme of today's bracket, I think, is just players not getting their combo pieces, despite however long the game manages to go. But we are now moving into the winner's finals to determine our first grand finalist. And those two players are going to be Bratch Kata, who we just saw take the game versus Serrano. And that is going to be... Uh, I'm just blanking badge attack who has been moving through the winner's bracket as well from the Czech Republic. Another young player who has adapted to the meta quite nicely and has brought a couple powerful lists with the Azir Aurelia and of course the Demacia Targon Dragon list, which has been existing as the, you know, sort of fourth or fifth deck in the tier one lists here. Exactly. And uh, uh, I think I've mentioned uh, Badge Attack feels very safe in playing Azir really. I think it's one of his mm -hmm. favorite decks from what I've seen. And he has a lot of games with it, so he can show us some interesting lines with the deck. And uh, obviously pulling the most, uh, the, the strongest decks to Fight Night is a good option. Mm -hmm. Because in all tournaments, it makes sense to pull the great decks. First of all, bringing the ones where you feel most comfortable, and then if there is nothing you feel that super comfortable, obviously bringing the strongest ones. And the Zero Aurelia and uh, Dragons is definitely one of the best options for this current meta. And so getting into the comparison of the of the decks here, both players did bring Demacia Targon for their dragon variants, but they both have unique takes on the idea. This is Badge Attack's variant that does have the three Shivana and two Aurelian Sol, just like Brouch Kata, but is including the one Zoe in the list. This one appears to be a bit more traditional. Mountain Goat has found its way back into these builds just to have a better early game blocker. Uh, against Aurelia Azir and the gems kind of let you bully your way through uh, with just that healing, extra chumping, having the extra attack power to potentially take down uh, stronger backline threats. Notably, no blue sentinels in this list. I praised its ability to sort of pressure your opponent into uh, maybe letting you ramp into an early screeching dragon, but potentially badge attack just saying, well, my, the, a good player is not going to kill the Blue Sentinel and give me the ramp anyway, so I'm just going to kick back and run something a bit more proactive in the Mountain Goat. Only one Fangs and one Radiant Guardian, however, means that this list might be a bit soft to something that's a bit more aggressive, but uh, overall, a uh, pretty well-rounded variant. Yeah, and we see triple fangs. So even though there's no more uh, than one Solaris and Forger or Radiant Guardian, there are ways for us to survive. Also, no uh, star shaping, so we're obviously just counting on our units. I think this is a very solid list because most of the cards are just uh, copies of three and uh, one of two, uh, like on, on, on two copies. Like, mm -hmm. I see there's just a trying to do the curve the best way and trying to be consistent in doing our combos with the dragons into the Aurelian Soul, which explains also the double dragons clutch, so we want to draw consistently the dragons. And and then comparing that to very quickly Brachikata's list that we just saw has the blue sentinels and the dragon shouts as a two of each for in the early game. No Zoe and a lot more scattered one ofs. We got a guiding touch, a judgment, a star shaping, um, and one Slary Sunforger. These extra cards sprinkled in because this is an open deck list tournament just forces your opponent to respect them, right? Like, oh, I could go for lethal, but what if they have Guiding Touch? Guiding Touch sort of acts as like a fourth, like wonky copy of Sharp Sight, gives you a little bit of extra card draw, and then the judgment at the top and, you know, really makes your opponent like hesitate if they do have that lethal. So I do like it. And the players are in challenge right now. We are going to uh, get that sorted out here in just a moment. But when we analyze not just the dragon decks, but the other list that the players brought, again, with uh, Aurelia Zir being part of the equation, and then uh, also, excuse me, TLC being part of the equation, I think that when you look at it from that perspective, uh, Batch Attack is probably favored. We saw earlier in the day how Aurelia Zir can really bully uh, TLC. Yeah, I I do agree that there are there is um, some advantage into uh, badge attack because of the zero really into the TLC matchup, but it also depends on how the Bratched Kata and the uh, uh, badge attack queue in the first round. Because as we are seeing, um, a zero really into dragons is not as favored, and uh, Bratched Kata can get a win with the uh, with the with the dragons here, which mm. uh, takes out the mirror match. 
Ooh. And then TLC just has to win against Dragons again, possibly, which is a good matchup. So this is this is kind of good for Ratchet Kata. This is probably the matchup you wanted to do first. Yeah, so you get this out of the way. We've got Shivana in the opening hand, which is a fantastic chump blocker against the Sand Soldiers and the Blades. You get so much free level up progress in the Fury uh, to start bullying the back line. If Shivana gets too big, then you have the constant threat of strafing strike over and over and over again to keep your opponent from setting up Azir safely. But with Sparring Student and Deus, you know, Brachkata is already on a massive clock here for damage so far. Exactly, and uh, no we've seen that one, Azir... two, or three drops. That's got to be a death sentence in this matchup. Yeah, and uh, the only, the, also the problem with this is that we've seen that Azir really today, today has been very consistent in getting the days into uh, Azir. Like mm -hmm. I think all the games we saw that happening, days into Azir. So and also without having neither Lieutenant or the Sentinel or having. We don't have any early game from the Bratchet Kata side. We don't add a way to sustain ourselves against a sparing student. So even if we drop a Shivana here, yeah, we can get a Shum block now and uh, maybe uh, and get the Fury. Mm -hmm. But we're already in a very dangerous situation because uh, we let the our fella uh, Azira really develop what they wanted. Yeah, you play the Shivana down. Uh, the Sparring student goes up to a 4-4, four, four, so Shivana can't get a value trade there. You have to just chump a soldier. Shape stone versus hush. We have sharp sighted in, in this equation. It's very rough. It's it's very rough. I know that Brachkata would really like to do like Shivana and then, you know, uh Oh man. This is, this is gonna hurt. Whoop, the Dune Keeper as well. The the sparring student gets even bigger than I was uh counting on. This is gonna hurt a lot. And look at this! Badge attack saying, I can attack with Azir here because you have to block all of the rest of this damage. Azir, this is a safe attack. Very rarely do you see even uh, Aurelia Azir when they're at a massive advantage risk the Azir like this in combat. Yeah, this is... This is a lot of damage at one round. This is a very smart uh, pull from Badge Attack, knowing that I'm obviously going to pull the most damage I can, because Sparing Student is a big threat. He cannot just uh, not block the Sparing Student, because Stone Shaper, uh, Shape Stone, I mean, just uh, kills yeah. Ratchet Kata. Yeah, you can and... preemptively hush, and then you just buff it back up anyway and get your trade. Yeah. So there is. this is basically uh, Badge Attack putting a check on Brachet Kata and saying, okay, I'm almost killing you. Do you have a way to survive? <laughs> I got game? I got Spark Student into Deus into Azir. How good is your hand? I'm pretty sure this is... This is just really good, uh, good hand. This is honestly. cruel! Yeah, you think is... you have the answer. You think you're going to stabilize and then the Shape Stone shuts you down. Even if Brachkata drops the fangs, stabilizes from here, that's a huge mental hit right yes. there. Brachkata needs to not tilt, play this one. That is very interesting is that we can start doing some pressure from budget attack side now with all the blade dance like blossoming or like the four mana or the two mana we can just start doing stuff and uh, losing the shivana there was just very very important for budget attack i think this is one of the best hands for uh, azir Aurelia, and we've just seen it we've just seen it very consistently yeah the homecoming bounces back the lifesteal unit there is going to be no threat of stabilization here into the Ribbon Dancer means that Azir is leveled and even more damage coming through around the sides. A 4-1 is a nice blocker, but it can only block one thing. It can also actually just pass here and go to 1 HP, but then die next round because there is no way to do anything. Because The problem of this is that on open, uh, which means next round we're just winning uh, as Azir really. so this is... I think this is game. I think, uh, yeah, I think this is game because you, we... Yeah, you uh, can't go yeah. wide enough. Yeah, we could even play the other one drop uh, to have something else or just go with the Blossoming Blade and uh, just... Uh... We were we were living... We didn't realize how good we had it when Azir Aurelia wasn't also running Nopify. 
Yeah, it's and, uh, and now it's we're, we're back. That was honestly, whew. we know that that dragons can go the distance towards Aurelia Azir, but when you have no early game, like if you had the one, two, three drop to to build up towards that Shivana, where it wasn't her versus the world to get blown out by the one card, there's still a little bit more hope there, but. Even when you have the right cards in your deck, you still need to get those proper draws. Just really unfortunate. Kept a Shivana in the opening hand for that uh, for that Fury proc, for that level up, the easy level up potentially. And, you know, the rest of the deck didn't come through for Kata. So Azir Aurelia gets its win, and now Kata needs to go for the reverse sweep. Exactly. This is, this is honestly kind of sad to see, because uh, as you said, having the two drop... Or just something early game could be enough to sustain for a late game. Uh, but since on turn 4 we were taking too much damage and the Shapestone would kill us and even trade the Shivan, it, it, it was probably, it was just game. And now we have basically the TLC against uh, Bajatax Dragons, which is trying to get a free win. And then we have the Mirror, which is going to be, I hope so, a fun game to watch, because Mirrors... When, when both players have good ends and um, decent ways to, to play it, it it's, it's pretty interesting to see. So, mm -hmm. But we, we see a pretty decent start from uh, Budget Attack's side. We have literally the curve, we have the Lieutenant. We don't need anything on tree, but we have Shivana into Screeching, which is all we want to see. And there's already also Lissandra and the Matron from Ratchet Kata's side. Uh, which means we just need maybe to find the Trundle, especially because we have the... Uh, pick a follower, uh, and we have another matron, so I guess we just can actually le level Lissandra with matrons. Mm -hmm. The 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 dragons list feels uh, really good into this matchup, just because if you get a curve like this with like screeching dragon, it's very difficult for for TLC to remove. However, this was before you know the ruination tech started to show back up. So if things get really dicey, Bratch Cat is going to start floating mana, just taking a few bonks from <laughs> from the dragons on the Nexus in order to float that mana and and just play a ruination. If you wipe out your opponents like early mid game, they just have a bunch of dead combat tricks in hand with an empty board and then you're just good to go from there. Despite that, Badge Attack is very happy to have this uh, this setup right now before Ruination Mana is a threat. Yeah, uh, Badge Attack even uh, um, over over Radiant Garden because there was a possibility. Uh, even though we don't care about the Life Steal that much uh, against this matchup, the tough is kind of good against uh, the clears because it means that neither Ice Shards, neither Vile Feasts, uh, neither Withering Wells deal damage. And Avalanche only deals one damage to the unit, so it's basically a, a chunk we're pulling onto the enemy's nexus. Mm. And this, this this is an interesting setup, because if uh, Bratchet Kata does an Avalanche here, we can answer with a sharp side. Yeah, you go which... for the sharp side to survive here, and by getting the Screeching Dragon set up, you're, you're threatening to, again, level the Shivana. This... Yes list like the ability for shivana to get those strafing strikes and you're attacking while also controlling your opponent's board is just massive where eventually if your opponent doesn't have the right removals they don't have the ability to to make meaningful blocks anymore and all of the damage that's going to hit the nexus is you know really what matters i think that tlc has been on like between 8 and 11 HP in the mid game consistently. This deck is really beginning beat down and decks have just overall, I think, become more aggressive uh, in this current metagame and TLC just hasn't properly adapted to that new level of aggro uh, from opponents that typically didn't used to do that to them. Yeah, because even though uh, TLC is really good to deal with uh, um, burn aggressiveness because of all the healing and the ways to deal with uh, small units, uh, TLC has a lot of struggles against uh, any unit that has 4 or more HP. It has to um, commit a lot of resources to clear those units. That's why the mass is pretty strong against the TLC. Whatever the, the deck you're using uh, with Tamasia, it probably has a good chance against TLC. And this is the case. The new meta has a lot of... Uh, uh, decks that work the same way as Masia in building their units and uh, as we talked before this dragon list has become a bit more greedy with the Shivanas and the dragons to be able to deal with this matchup too and also with the Zero really because of the Fury.
sharp sight number two to save Shivana during this trade. She's going to get that plus one, plus one. Just maintaining that HP, right? It's so difficult for the removal to line up. Bratch Cat is actually empty. Only on round seven, still far away from playing the Spectral Matron. Uh, there is the pillar in hand. It's going to be close, I think. We have the, the combo next, next couple round. round. Yeah. And the best thing is we have the combo next round. I'm just, it's exactly what I said. We need the trundle to, to, to get the combo because we can play the pillar into copying the pillar and playing again. And uh, we don't have exactly the combo, but we can at least level the, the Lissandra, which is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because getting the tough Nexus means that some of the, a lot of this damage coming through isn't going to hurt as badly. The Ice Shards maybe go a long way towards uh, chipping away at these at these dragons to line up for the rest of your removal. And what top deck do you need right now to, to finish off this combo for Bratch Cat? Uh, from Bratch Cat, I don't think we need uh, anything for the combo, but I would say we need something to sustain. Like, we have the Flash Freeze, which is really good to sustain here. We used one Flash Freeze against the Shivana, which mm -hmm. take out basically five, H uh, 5 damage and save us 5 HP. And the Vengeance is also pretty good, because we have mana to play Lissandra into Vengeance. And uh, if there's a single combat coming out, it's also fine, because the unit is already dying. And, okay, it gets a trade, but it's less one single combat also out from the end, so... I think now we're, uh, as Bratched Kata, we could be on a pretty good spot to start stabilizing slowly. Mm -hmm. There's also no um, no ruination yet, so sometimes against dragons, if you can wipe like two or three things, that's really all you want. And there's the pillar, pillar, matron, matron. So that is going to be all four eight drops assembled for Lissandra, but it's going to take one more set of rounds to... Get that to go through. Yeah, this play makes sense for the reason which is uh, he's trying to have a board to defend himself from uh, mm -hmm. uh, any attack next round. So playing Matron into Matron, since we have double Matron in hand, that helps us sustain that. We still have the, the, the Flash Freeze, as I said, so we just need to survive next round. This 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 can work, because this... Okay, this doesn't work because we have the, the Ush, obviously, and we yeah, have the Stealth Hush, so that still goes through. And then that way, all these Ephemeral units drop off, and then you're yeah, potentially able to swing through. Yeah, and we can kill a Shivana. This is very important, because killing the Shivana means that if there's another Shivana in hand, which is also the case, when we attack with, um, with the Matron, uh, there is no way to, to fill the end, uh, fill the deck with uh, yeah. another Shivana. Just kill off the dragons, and so Ratchkata has managed to, despite this curve, right, the Shivana Screeching Dragon, a lot of pressure coming through, a lot of board control, surviving all of that removal, just wasn't enough to actually hit the Nexus. Dragons specialize in controlling the board. Once they get that overwhelming advantage, then they can swing and hit the Nexus. But now, with the Flash Freezes, stopping so much of that from coming through means that the Watcher is ready to go. Exactly. And even though uh, our Lissandra now is going to get killed, we can still do one Vile Feast. We can, we can even play our free Watcher if you want. Honestly, I don't see a problem in, play in playing a free Watcher now. Like, with yeah. three mana, what could be the, the worst case that happens? Not even Strafing Strike that the Shivan is getting could kill the Watcher here. And mm -hmm. we can open attack. So we, we've seen a Shivana being played to the deck, so it needs to be... Uh, and we've seen the Screeching Dragon being drawn now, so it needs to have another Shivan in hand. Or somehow playing an Aurelian Soul and playing the Aurelian Soul spell in case there's two Aurelian Souls. And I think that's pretty mm. difficult with the mana count we have right now. So I think it's pretty safe to play the Watcher here. Like, there, I, I, I would honestly play the Watcher. Yeah. So everything goes as you said. Watcher comes down. Bodge Attack was trying to just keep the board alive push some damage through, used Hush to cleanse a Frostbite rather than saving it for the Watcher. Um, even if you have the Hush for the Watcher, when you set it up preemptively like this into the open attack, you you miss out on the opportunity to silence. You can top deck Shivana here, right? Shivana number three? Doesn't get it. 
I think this is game then. If, yeah, if there's the open. No Shivan in hand. Yeah, it's just going to show us the animation before the surrender. And uh, Oh, just, yeah, just uh, going to actually just let it end. Yeah. GG. Out of cards. And so Brachkata operating the list, doing what it finally wants to do, going to take us to a game three. So this is going to be the dragon mirror match that you were hoping to see, Manitas. I'm I'm hoping to see some good action here. I don't want to see someone getting a really good hand and the other one getting a really bad. I want both of them mm. getting a perfect hand. I want a really interesting matchup out of this. Because if there's one thing I understand is that the Masia mirror matches generally tend to be very skillful. Because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's like ch it's fully chess. You don't want to make a move and lose one of your units or one of your th uh, of your threats. Because you definitely need every of every single part of your value. Because it's there isn't that much draw and value in Demacia, so you need to preserve everything you can. So the potential. Uh wild card in this mirror is the zoe on turn one which bratch kata is not running uh manitas had speculated earlier while we were on break that the exclusion of zoe is just a uh, taking one less good card out of the deck that nasus thresh potentially can kill for a slay proc exactly uh even though both lists are kind of built in a way to to be good against it because of triple concerted and triple hush this is Definitely a good um, deck to it because most people generally, I think, play double concerted in this type of decks because concerted is a very cost, uh, yeah. uh, high cost uh, clear. Concerted has has just gone up in value for Demacia. I mean, back in the day before that card came out, they really struggled to take down, you know, anything like if any deck that had access to a bigger stat line than them. And so Concerted Strike lets you get your big board and then convert that to just control and tempo on the opponent. I think that uh, Screeching Dragon is one of the most important cards in this matchup just because it beats down a lot of everything that isn't more expensive than it in this matchup. Like it's that perfect like dividing line between the early game units and then the late game units and then the Screeching Dragon starts to scale. Exactly. And I do believe, too, that Screeching Dragon is not only one of the best cards in Demacia, a really important card in this matchup because of that. Because uh, being able to get the value trades and being able to get a big dragon in the board is, is, is what makes this matchup good. Is basically the value trades is just winning the board. And there's a possibility for us to see some Dragon Shaw murders in this... Uh, and, and there we go. We're mm. just seeing Dragon Shaws just being eaten and chomped up by dragons. The the triple Shivana is a little bit rough here, actually. Just going to go for the confront, which is nice. You're turning Shivana into a screeching dragon here. But if if Brachkata was in a better position here, of course, then then having the three Shivana is kind of rough. It's like it's like this, right? Sh Shivana wants to stay alive and doesn't want to die. So then you just have like these wonky three mana spells in your hand so this is just basically Baj going all in and and trying to uh yeah and just trying to press this advantage here on top of the shivana now with the six seven it becomes very difficult for bratch to safely uh develop the board and try to take this back i also think that since we didn't see anything going out on four into that dragon show we probably predicted that there could be obviously a screeching dragon so oh, using yeah. the Shivana spell to kill the Dragon Shaw, we're basically taking out level up on a future Shivana if it is drawn, which was also the case. Yeah, the and... one plus one doesn't go through on the Screeching Dragon, also denies that card draw. Exactly. So it's basically the most value possible. And as I was saying initially, this is about getting the most value out of all our cards. It's just getting the value trades and mm -hmm. making our units stick the most possible, making sure that we have more board and more hands. So this is basically... A play that works that way because there was also nothing that was that much interesting to play in barge attack side because even though we can play a fangs to get some uh, um some uh, some value from uh, uh invokes it wasn't that great in that position so it was just about denying that draw or that value and making sure that our shivana is in a good spot which is the case mm -hmm. and branch kata 
thinking very heavily about how you you want to go for this combat, right? Like, Bodge Attack has six mana up. Is there a concerted play? Is there sharp sight? And there's so many factors to consider uh, that it you hesitate, right? You can't make the trade you want to do. Are you going to develop Lieutenant here to get another pull? Is Screeching Dragon going to be the one that kills the Mountain Goat? Are you going to try to kill the Shivana with a single combat? Uh, so many lines here. Concerted Strike. Ooh, Bodge Attack giving away a little bit of info there. No, I think it was not... I mean... It didn't go entirely to the stack, so okay. It, okay. I think it didn't show as a spell from for Bratchet. Now it shows. Now it definitely does the info. But uh, uh, it's kind of risky to play that. Yeah, now Bratchet kind of knows like, that. Okay. It's kind of risky. Oh, just doing it the opposite way, so that way Shivana gets the uh, the Fury stack. And it's leveling up. I mean, I think it gets the Fury stack either way. I don't know if they changed Concerted Strike lately. Uh, most of the times. Uh, when you have two units striking, doesn't matter oh. which one is striking first. And I've, I've seen many times where the effects are proccing twice. Um, not sure if it's the case. I could be saying something completely wrong, and I'm sorry. No, if I that, think they started strike. I think it was like it was like bugged for like a patch and a half, and then they fixed it. So we all have like Mandela effect memories of it working a different way. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, uh, that explains and it. So single combat bails you out here, right? I mean, it gets you a trade, but the Shivana is still leveling, I guess. In yeah, and then part. and then this Shivana has Challenger, so if it, it survives this turn and levels up, and then the next round is going to challenge, this is terrifying. This is scary. Yeah, this is very scary for Brashad Kara, especially because this looks like Naza Thresh's type of mirrors. Whoever has the bigger Nazas generally wins, and. Whoever has the bigger Shivana, generally also winners wins mm -hmm. here. Yeah, because once once things get beyond like five or six HP, that's when you need to start looking at like concerted strike and sharp side to be able to fix these trades back in your favor. Uh, notably, Bratch Kata does have judgment in this deck, so if you know, despite the board advantage that uh, Baj Attack has built here with the Shivana, they're still just going tall on one unit. And if Brachkata gets to this Aurelian Saul, there is the second Saul in hand to maybe do Sky's Descend. Um, I wouldn't count him out of the game just yet. It's just that Baj Attack has just been lording over this mid game, which is uh, what you and a few viewers have also speculated is where the Dragon Mirror is won and lost. Yeah, definitely it's not entirely lost for Brachkata. It's obviously just a very hard situation, I would say. Uh, it's just those painful uh moments where you have to okay i have to sweat this one out because i'm i'm behind but definitely the double or in solid hand is a good uh, a good read and uh i would say that getting that aurelian soul eventually is yeah dropping now the eclipse dragon to try to drop an aurelian soul next round after a shivan attack and then having the skies ascent can be the way to win because um, many times in Targon mirrors or any matchup with Targon, if there's a Skies Descending oh. dropping in a f ooh. ooh. The Moon Silver to get the Nightfall effect on the Eclipse Dragon gets two incredible pulls. Those two are really good. Even though Vox is not seeing play as a main card, it's really good to be like drawn in this way. This is the extra value sometimes you need. And Great Beyond is just it's just being great beyond. It's just good. Like there's there is no way to explain the card. It's just so. I, I really yeah. Cool. When we talked about dragons before, they might struggle to actually hit your nexus and close out the game. But then the great beyond coming through to to save the day. Bratchcat it has a star shaping, has potential access through Aurelian Salt to get this card as well. But it might be too little, too late. It might be a little bit too late. Even if we drop the Aurelian Soul now, we're taking 9 damage. And also, we can pull Aurelian Soul with uh, Shivana and get an even trade. Yeah, exactly. There can be an even trade. I'm not even sure. I think Strafing Strike when gets the healing is after the combat, right? So there yeah. could be also a possibility where you do Strafing Strike on combat to kill the two tree in uh, yeah, yeah to kill the two tree and mm. then it heals back and you have an 11 11 shivana and it gets actually better even a better trade to to Ariel and soul 
So, Aurelian Saul does come down. Three very strong options being offered here. Uh, you have Immortal Fire, maybe get a blocker versus the uh, Great Beyond. Ops for Supernova. Yep. It's probably trying to get another... Okay, there, there it is. It's a 12-11. Yeah, the, is... the bonus stats just from attacking. And there comes the Ush. And... We're in a good spot now. Did, uh... Oh, did Bratch Kata just swing this game back into his favor? Takes a Actually, big possibly. hit from the Great Beyond. Still lethal being presented by Baj Attack, but Bratch Kata opens a window of opportunity. Do you just... Especially because two single combats in hand, it can kill the Great Beyond. This is actually it, oh. just twisted. Aurelian Saul created an Immortal Fire. As long as Baj Attack doesn't have another Challenger unit. Oh, this is risky. I think it's like, okay, do I sacrifice Aurelian Saul? Do I force them to block me here? If they go yeah, for the block, you can just play a second Aurelian Saul. Takes the hit! This suddenly has come down to the wire. Both players are now one swing from lethal. Oh god, this is actually so scary for both players. If this, if this Immortal Fire drops, there's obviously a direct trade to with, um, with the Great Beyond. Even though the Fangs can get the stuns, and we're seeing that. Uh, is uh, overing over that. So we're taking out the spell shield, and here comes the Shivana. And uh, you can also play. Uh, and now the, the Supernova! Fangs. Oh, that is true. That, that is actually true. Off of the Aurelian Saul. Got offered oh. Living Legends, Immortal Fire, and Supernova, and chose. Correctly takes down the Great Beyond and scoops up the Shyvana for good measure. I didn't even see it this way. I was thinking about ways to block. I completely forgot there was a supernova in hand. This is this literally deals with it. We just cleared uh one champion, and it's not even clear. We just obliterated from existence one champion and one of the strongest units ever to be created in this game. Just <laughs> that way. Yeah, 11 mana to deal with that great beyond. And now Baj Attack is picking up the pieces, gets a challenger unit with a wide enough board. Aurelian Saul is invoking like mad! These pulls have been so strong! This is so insane. This is These are honestly some of the best invokes. RNG invokes, by the way, not actually choosing. Yeah, I've I seen know! Her. Because Aurelian Saul creates a random Celestial from the entire pool, pool of Celestials. So you if you can do it better if you're picking them yourself. Crescent Strike off of the Fangs, both sides are, are just popping off here. Just praying to the Cosmos to give them what they need. Is this going to be lethal here with the stun? There's one more Fangs to block. Hmm. There's a possibility that there's little, but I kind of doubt it because we have the double single combat in, in hand for Budget Kata. So there's four mana, so... And uh, Budget Tab knows that, but he's probably going to try the little uh, anyways, because he has to do it. If he doesn't go mm. for it this round, he's probably dying next round. Cause yeah, just, Aurelian just, Saul just bullies through. Yeah, it, 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 Aurelian Ooh. Saul completely bullied this game. This was a complete bully. <laughs> oh my god, it was looking so good for Baj Attack, and finding that window of opportunity to set up the Aurelian Saul, he did so much work, didn't even level up, just having that big stat line with the Hush to wrest control of the board away from that massive Shivana was all that he needed. And we see the single combat in, in, in answer, and... I don't know. This is this this looks like even though there's a lot of HP for budget attack, and as you were saying, like somehow this Aurelian Soul just just actually sweeped back to uh, Bratchet Kata to the game. Wait, yeah, you want to kill Silver Silver Sister here? I think it's possibly the Silver Sister, but you, you, you it's kind of hard. The Silver Sister is like killing you slowly with the elusive, but the um, Golden Sister is uh, healing you back. And yeah. he's already too low, you want to probably finish it, so... Oh, uh, that, yeah, it's close. Because, I mean, there's Aurelian Saul in play, 
and you're probably going to get one shot by Great Beyond or or something. It's oh man. This okay. Is intense. So Bosch Attack making the the choice here to kill the Life Steal unit to say. I need to t cut off your ability to heal if I'm hoping for a lethal rather than trying to focus completely on you not killing me. Exactly. So, the, and there's still a chance if uh, budget attack somehow, uh, but there's no star shaping in this deck unless we get uh, Aurelian Soul and we could probably even invoke the Overwhelm unit. We could probably even get Cheeky Lethal. Just. Just right there, very sneaky pulling out, but still kind of hard with this hand. We might have to be able to just try to sustain until that, especially without any healing now on Ratchet Cutter's side. There's a Crescent Strike. Another one. It's this... Oh, it's... I mean, there's a Judgment in Ratchet Cutter's side, so... And he cannot yeah. <laughs> turn yeah. Aurelian Soul because Aurelian Soul just loses the spell shield. It so still has, probably... It still has spell shield. You are right. Uh, yeah. So this is very intense. And I thought that Zoe would do a little bit more work for for uh, for Baj attack, but it turns out that having the judgment at the top end is a much stronger tech for the mirror match. Exactly. And this is a lot of damage. Aurelian Soul is leveling from Bratchet Cutter's side. Mm-hmm. And now with Aurelian Soul leveled up, we are going to get a zero mana Celestial being added to the hand. And with all the Celestials in play, Sky's Descend is still an omnipresent threat. Come on. What? A okay, the Traveler. We're, we're just traveling through the Invokes, I guess, now. We're just gonna travel. Baj Attack took the line of play that they needed to with the Shivana, drew triple Shivana, right? So did Shivana into confront, bullied out the mid game, and just didn't get any top end. No Aurelian Saul from Baj Attack's side. Uh, isn't running the, the star shaping to maybe get a Hail Mary here. Um, already cashed in the Celestial from Eclipse Dragon. And you can just see the struggle. Demacia hates it when the opponent is doing bigger things than they are. Yeah, so basically we, what we got proven in this game also is that Aurelian Sol is definitely one of the best late game machines in this game in terms of value. Because the amount of value in Bratchet's card aside, both in board and end, is just insane because of one card and it being Aurelian Sol. We can even do this trade. Because we're also getting the... the um, the Immortal Fire again because of its uh, passive. So this is just overall safe. This is just safe roots for Bratchet, Bratchet Cutter at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just protecting Saul. That way you keep the Skies Descend open as well. <laughs> that second life! You can Concerted Strike the Screeching onto like the Silver Sister or something, so it goes up to a 5 attack, and then the Mortal Fire gets popped by that single, right? But at this point, you know, if you're spending mana just to make your opponent's really good trades a little bit less good, rather than developing against this Onslaught... Pretty sure we're gonna see some Skies Descent action. What do you think? Okay, no we're not. Budget Attack <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was uh, what usually when Aurelian Saul levels up, I, I can't even I don't have any games like that come to mind where a player leveled up Aurelian Saul and didn't win. But it's very rare that we actually get to see that. Right. Because uh, the 10 mana Aurelian Saul and I think it was actually played on round 10. We got the discount from Eclipse Dragon, but it still came down like round nine, round 10 D committing your whole turn to that play is, you know, just a big commitment. And in the Targon Demacia mirror, you do have that time. And so Brad Kata just saw, you can just see the power of that card taking over the mirror match. Yeah, definitely. I would say that if you're able to take the mid game, Shivan is definitely the best way. And uh, if both players have Shivan in board, definitely the, the, the big Shivan is going to do the, the mm -hmm. it's going to do the, the damage, is going to do the beats for the player that has it. But if we're going to land on, on turn 8 and after because of Eclipse Dragon, 
Whoever drops the first Aurel and Soul that sticks into a board is definitely going to get all the value and all the mm -hmm. advantage. Because, as we were talking about earlier, uh, Demacia uh, struggles a bit with getting value by, by itself and drawing, and uh, Aurelian Soul basically does that. And we saw basically Aurelian Soul completely smashing the game on late game and being able to give mm -hmm. all, uh, honestly, some of the best invokes I've seen in my entire life. Like, <laughs> right, that was an incredible <sighs> sequence. And so Brachkata is going to secure that spot as the first grand finalist, and we are going to move down to catch the tail end of a lower bracket set between Serrano and uh, Giorno, who are in game three uh, of, their, uh, of their match right now. And that's probably going to be a very interesting match to see. I'm not sure which list uh, Giorno is, go is using right now, but I've, I've seen some mm -hmm. of his lists. And, for example, his Dragon's list has 10 one-offs. It's just... <laughs> it's, it's a lot of one-offs. Very, and, very toolboxy. Yeah, and it's, it's also a good way to see the things, because you're making your opponent just play around all the things. He has to think about all the possibilities, and the deck is just overall consistent by itself, so kind of makes sense all of these one-offs, I would say. But jumping into this game, we've got Lady of Clouds staring down a lot of overwhelm damage. Mobilize comes through. You can do Matron to the Lady of Clouds to develop two blockers here. But Serrano gonna take it on the chin? That's... that's very ballsy. Wait, but didn't, uh, Jorno pass there? What? It, He's it, passing... It, it, it's it's got to be a visual bug. Jorno doesn't have the attack token, right? What? Wait. You, no, it probably knows that Serena wants to develop and it's just passing like, okay, yeah, sure, don't develop. And it's probably going to attack here. If I think in Serena's case, like, taking advantage of those passes are just... It's just... Wow, cool. yeah. Yeah. If you say if you if you end the round and don't develop anything, I'm happy because I have a board. Doesn't go for the preemptive kill to set up a radiant post combat. That is ah, galaxy game. brain. But <laughs> in response to uh, Serrano being able to develop that last round, we now have the matron Lady of Clouds. Three of them in the hand to make up for Serrano not seeing any of them in that previous set. Yeah, and we didn't see any Citria in like 27 cards in the previous game we saw from Serrano. And this time we're seeing... we could have seen a Citria on 6, but we're seeing it on 7, basically. I mean, not every time you cannot draw it. There, there are some games where you obviously have to draw it. And this is the case, and we have a very, 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 very big board from Serrano's side. And it can deal pretty easily with the uh, Overwhelm units from uh, Kono Jorno's side. And we're looking at Co uh, Jorno's uh, hand, and there is a Sejuani that can just... Um, uh, that can uh, do some um, freezes, uh, but it's probably not enough. Like, it's five units into four units, and all of the five units are way stronger than the Jorno's side. I think this... This is going to be a board, uh, a reverse board, where we were seeing uh, Giorno's uh, Overwhelms taking over, and just one card was enough to, to make that change. So now the trades need to come through. We've got the Radiant Garden killing the Ruin Runner. Um, it's a matter of... You can see Serrano's respecting. Very obviously, like, uh, a Frostbite or something. Not wanting to just have, like, the Lady of Clouds and the Spectral Matron be the ones that are uh, trying to hit the Nexus here to threaten that lethal. is just going for better trades down the line, making better use, potentially, of this 10-10 Ephemeral to take down a unit rather than uh, threaten. Exactly. We could at 8 to... HP, though, I don't know. I guess with your, with your board big enough like this, and with another Lady of Clouds about to drop down, your remaining units are going to have enough HP to where you aren't threatened by Overwhelm any longer. Yeah, even though there there's going to be obviously the two um, draw chance to make uh, its units survive, mm -hmm. uh, this is this is a lot coming through from uh, 
uh, Cyrano's side and a lot of damage and all of the units are sticking on the board, honestly. Yeah, we're prioritizing, obviously, um, the Ruin Runner because of the spell shield. And we're taking 14 and uh, we have only one Ruin Runner at 6 HP on our Nexus against four big chunky units and we know there's a Cetria. Mm -hmm. And we don't know when she's going to be dropped. There's uh, Battle Fury. Swings through. I was going to say, like, if you if you get Battle Fury and, like, the other exhaust that was cashed in last round, you'll be able to pull uh, that 8-3. Do you, you still live if you, don't, if you don't do the exhaust last round, but Jorno just kind of did it preemptively to take a little bit of the edge off. Yep. And even though with this Battle Fury, it's not going to be enough. It gets easily traded. Yep. And we just see another Cetria. I honestly want to see another Cetria. Come on. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much, Cyrano. I appreciate it. We're going in. This is just. This is just a lot. Oh damage. no! Goes the oh, Garrity no. mode. The cake emote. We're seeing cake on stream. Oh <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, you have to savor that. You know, Serato's been waiting to do that to somebody this entire tournament. So, of course, you have to savor the flavor of that delicious Lady of Clouds cupcake and move on uh, throughout the lower bracket to maybe get that rematch. Exactly. So, basically, we just saw Citria dealing pretty well <laughs> with the Overwhelms, honestly. Like, Overwhelm starts pretty strong, I would say, because of the early units and the, mm -hmm. the chunk units have. But once you have a Citria on board, it's just practically impossible. And we saw it. Mm -hmm. Just a Matron on Citria, and all our units just deal with everything they do on their side. So I'm pretty happy. Finally saw a Citria. In mm -hmm. fact, three Citrias. But uh, yeah, it, it was, yeah, it's, it's fun. I'm Overwhelm happy. is a deck that uh, I think, you know, just still has that means to punch through a lot of matchups is decent into Aurelia Azir but Lady of Clouds you know a deck that maybe not all players were prepared to uh, face today and we'll see if we'll uh, continue this streak of Lady of Clouds showing some more success in the, lower, in the lower bracket when we get back from this break
Hello everyone and welcome back to Fight Night Legends EU and you are just in luck because we're just about to head into the loser semi-finals between Serrano who is fighting their way back after some heartbreaking RNG earlier in the day and against Asher who brought a very aggressive uh, lineup to try to take advantage of the slower metagame that has developed here in the tournament scene. Exactly. And uh, as you say, after an heartbreaking loss with Citria, after mm -hmm. 27 cards and seeing no Citria, finally got to win on the lower bracket and is going now to try to fight for a spot on the finals and get again uh, an invite. So first mm -hmm. of all, he has to play against Asher on the semifinals. And I'm, again, I'm also ex I'm so excited to see all the Serrano's games because yeah, it, it brought Citria. It's just, I really like this deck. And I think this is going to be a very interesting matchup because uh, um, Asher brought Nightfall and Azira, really, which are two kind of aggro decks. And uh, Cyrano brought LeBlanc, Ash, and Citria. And in case of Citria, this list, I think it's a specific variation. There are a lot of variations mm -hmm. of the deck. I played specifically the one with just Shivana. There are a list of versions. Shivana mm -hmm. Kalista versions and also just Garen ones. But the champion less is more focused in trying to get the combo. Therefore, the triple spirit leech and the cursed keeper uh, existing to sustain. So you can use the mask mother or the spirit leech to use on the cursed keeper. And then we have the Obvi oblivious islanders and the mobilizers, mm -hmm. which try to reduce the cost either of the citrus or the spectral matron or both. Uh, Mobilize is a card that is kind of slapped on, I would say, and is very important this, this, in this deck. And all the games I've played with this um, with this archetype, Mobilize into a Matron and a Citria, or just a Matron or just a Citria, is so important in unlocking certain rounds and making the play so more fluid and on curve. And I really like the fact that it's bringing three of each, uh, three of uh, Mobilize, three of Matron, and three of Citria. So it's trying to be consistent onto this combo yeah it's just, it's just about you know getting that card draw and i mean serrano has learned perhaps a little bit over the course of today's broadcast you know keep lady of clouds in the opening hand and, and let her rock i've seen this deck also you know like mobilize making the dark water scourge mask mother combo instead of a five mana combo it's a three mana combo being able to squeeze that out earlier in the game get that seven seven fearsome lifesteal going can just wall out a lot of decks even things that not stuff that's just necessarily very aggressive in the early game but a lot of mid game decks as well struggle with dealing with that stat line and i think that serrano maybe is just relying on those mid game natural stats and the stat increase from lady of clouds to do the work even opting to run strafing strike over perhaps what could be a concerted strike in that slot just wanting another cheaper uh, effect to get that damage to bear exactly and since we're going to see some kind of aggro-ish matchups having that mobilize into dark water scourge and a mass mother could be yep. a good option for sirens to trying to uh, sustain themselves since uh, Azir Aurelia and Nightfall are pretty aggressive and they can develop pretty strong boards, if we manage mm -hmm. to have, for example, on turn 3, a 7-7 with uh, um, Fearsome and uh, Lifesteal, uh, it's probably more than enough to just wait until the combo and then finish it out. Or even just uh, one-shot uh, the opponent, because if there's no mm -hmm. answer to that, it's just going to carry the game by itself. I think that Nightfall is very much going to struggle against the Lady of Clouds deck. Uh, Radiant Guardian in any Demacian variant is is one of Nightfall's biggest counters. It's very hard for them to deal with that much HP and tough. Um, the four HP means that you know the four attack rather means it can still block Fearsome even if you're trying to discount it with Nocturne. The Moonlight Affliction is only a one of in Asher's list, so it's not going to be as consistently uh, able to silence that to swing through. And when you're relying on Aurelia Azir, that's a pretty safe bet. But it comes down to, you know, what are the matchups going to be? What, what, what decks are going to be queued up first? And when you're thinking about Aurelia Azir and Nightfall, sure, you can get your sort of freebie with Aurelia Azir, and then your Nightfall gets farmed 2-0. And we could see Asher trying to lead off with the, uh, with the Nightfall. And if it's the case that the Lady of Clouds deck, which you already mentioned is teched very heavily towards that early aggression, thanks to 
the Dark Water Scourge and the Radiant Guardian. Maybe you have it sort of absorb its win onto Nightfall, and then you get the reverse sweep with Aurelia Azir. So there's a huge mind game actually going into what the players are going to play first with uh, the two decks in their lineups here. Exactly. And that's one thing that's very important in card, ga card games is what deck should I queue first? It's very important, especially when there are uh, bad matchups involved, when one of your decks is mm -hmm. bad against one of them or one of your decks is really good against just one of them. You need to know exactly what you want to queue first. And we have the Nightfall against LeBlanc. I would say this is kind of even. There, there's the big chances for the Nightfall to win because of the, the burn. But mm -hmm. LeBlanc's uh, Ash deck, the, the Freeze Ways, are just really good to deal with uh, the board threats which Nightfall creates. But this is going to be a very interesting matchup. Mm, I actually, I would have liked to maybe see uh, a keep on the Nocturne there. You can't be confident that the rest of your deck is going to give you a means to level him up though. So I do respect it. Shade Stalker used to sort of be the way that you could sneak in a lot of uh, damage versus ash because even if they're you know using their frost bites and their troll chance to save the value trades at least your unit is remaining alive um but now with the advent of culling strike in this list um the shade stalker maybe goes down a little bit in value so both players with pretty decent starts pretty decent hands and we'll see you know where the skill comes from we've got duskbringer on turn one to set up the rest of this curve uh and this is where an aggro player doesn't know what to do. Should I play the left to drop or the right to drop? And, <laughs> or even the goat. It's just it's just hard. We could just try to develop like mm -hmm. the nightfall procs on either the Diana or Shade Stalker and try to just uh, go for the nightfall route. But maybe yeah, the goat is is a good option. Yeah, if you play the mountain goat, you know it's going to trade into most of what Serana is developing in this early mid game, regardless. Uh... Ice Veil Archer coming through. This is interesting, right? You're you're just getting rid of the bad trade because you want to trade one form with the goat. Asher has to take this risk against Elixir of Iron or Brittle Steel. Um, but you still get the gem off the goat, which is your Nightfall Activator. So overall, pretty, you know, just again, even from both players. Exactly. This is um this is pretty even. And uh Dropping the, that Ice Fill Archer there was really good because we definitely don't want the goat to start getting the gems value because it's it's a way to always proc the Nightfalls and get their mm -hmm. win conditions. And jumping into turn 3, it's a very strong play to drop to LeBlanc. LeBlanc is never going to get an answer into this deck unless there are double Vile Feasts or double Unspeakable Aurors uh, mm -hmm. coming in. And for that, you need one more round, which there's already a way to save LeBlanc. So, this is going to be 5 damage that is going to kill either a unit or to the face. So in, in Asher's case, you have to decide what you want to do. You have to decide if you want to drop just the Diana just because, or mm. if you are the Shade Stalker, I, or even take the 5 damage. I think, yeah, I think you take the 5 and just float here. You get your 3 you get your three spell mana floated to add some flexibility to what you want to do. We have a big power turn coming up with uh, Dusk Petal Dust into Shade Stalker, Diana, and a Stygian Onlooker potentially. You don't think that, I don't think the Diana is going to kill the LeBlanc with the challenge, which is what you would like to see, but just pulling her to the side and pushing some damage through to even out what you just took is going to be the way of things. Serrano stuck with double Glory Seeker, which is nice for controlling the board, but you don't have chump blockers to develop into this. Uh, even though you don't have chump blockers, you have a second Ice Veil Archer, which is really good. Ice Veil Archer is the best defensive tool you have in uh, freezing uh, decks because it just makes one of the units impossible to attack because of the zero attack, and it's a chump blocker for another unit. So, and as you were saying, pulling uh, LeBlanc to the side, even though it might not obviously kill it because there are ways uh, for the LeBlanc to survive, which are Troll Chants, Bridal Steals, mm -hmm. or or whatever. It's just good to pull it to the side so we can pull 8 damage this way onto the attack. Even though it's it's going to get answered pretty sure by this Ice Veil Archer. Yeah, the Ice Veil Archer is fantastic for shutting down this attack. Uh, you are going to be saving LeBlanc regardless. But by doing it this way, you are cutting off even more damage and developing another blocker here. Uh, ironically, 
there's a world where you might even still attack with the Sijin Onlooker anyway, just to get the level up towards Nocturne. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a problem, because if the opponent blocks the, the Sijin with the 3-1, yeah, he gets a trade, but you still deal 4 damage. And that's mm -hmm. the whole purpose of this, um, this, this entire play you did, was to try to get damage into the face. You can just gem too. You can you can gem, definitely. But gem can also be saved for next rounds to proc the nightfalls. Unto dusk would uh, just give the <laughs> the Sijian onlooker plus two, and you're drawing a card. If Diana was leveled up, you could also make that happen. But troll chant, look at that. This is so difficult when you're attacking into frostbite because troll chant allows you to manipulate two trades at once. Exactly. And the thing here is for Cyrano is he needs to do the troll chant into from the tree one to the Diana because that onto dusk uh, is giving plus one attack because it's leveling Diana. And I'm not sure if it triggers Diana's effect and sh and she gets plus two attack, but if so, it definitely has to be the troll chant. If we do, if we do it, the troll chant it has to be that way. Mm -hmm. And Serrano's thinking, you know, do I want to just take four damage, not even bother risking the LeBlanc here, and just let the Ice Veil Archer go down, save the troll chant for when it's a bigger blowout. You, you have LeBlanc in play. You can set up Glory Seeker. Yeah, by saving that mana, you can just set up Glory Seeker here and have a stronger counter swing. And now, like, because a lot of the early Nightfall has arrived here for M.A. Asher, it just feels terrible when you mulliganed that Nocturne. It's one of those plays where you just have to... You can't count on it, but it's so strong if the curve assembles itself to make like nocturne on curve with the gem or dusk petal dust like the way to close this out as we get to the later stages of the game we're going to be seeing like yetis and all kinds of stuff like just stabilizing for serrano even like hearth guard and if you try to develop into that you're under pressure of reckoning i can see a line i i can definitely see a line here for asher though he can drop he can drop shade stalker into Doom Beast, so floating the two spell mana, and the next round going into Jam for Moonlit Affliction, and trying to get a big swing. Yeah, because the Glory Seeker can't block. Exactly. So you'd be able, you'd be stripping away your opponent's entire board. You still have to consider that. Uh, yeah, you just take the ten. I think that with the Glory Seeker, are you going to just pull the Diana? For the freebie, or are you going to pull the Shade Stalker because it's elusive? I think it's mm. going to be Diana because of the the, the free trade, and yeah. also since uh, there's Moonlight Affliction and ways to proc Diana, if we cannot block anything next round, uh, hmm. we just basically are saving our HP at this point for the future. And I, I'm I'm not sure, but I think yeah, this this troll trend has to to come down. No, no, you, you can unto dusk your Doom Beast, and then Diana still gets the plus two, and then you get to deal damage with the Doom Beast. Please he hear listen. me through the ether. <laughs> <laughs> he listen. He's listening to it. <laughs> Nightfall. Let's go. <sighs> the the efficiency. And you draw a card. Fantastic. Uh, we're getting some stats uh, from Twitch chat right now uh, that Asher is. 45% favored, and people are actually favoring Serrano right now at 55%, so still pretty close. But with the line with Moonlight Affliction that, that, that you predicted could be the way to go. Malice, though, double sigil of Malice now discounted to 1 HP, might have something to say about this next swing. Ooh, and the Whispered war, uh, Words is 2 HP. I really like my 2 mana draw 2 cards. I think it's... Uh... I think it's pretty strong, honestly, but uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is definitely a good draw for Styrano. Yeah, so, and, and having this Lari Soldier, I love, uh, because it's a one mana 3-3, three, three, very strong daybreak, daybreak effect that sets up the rest of your, uh, you know, that sets up the rest of your Nightfalls for the turn. Developing here, again, is very scary because of Reckoning. And Serrano plays Whispered Words, allowing me to draw two cards from my deck. And gets a Brittle Steel, which is quite nice. Yep, it's uh, pretty good to deal with everything that uh, Asher might do. 
because all his units are 3 HP or less. And basically all units on Nightfall decks are pretty much 3 HP or less, so... Vertal Steel is just a really efficient way to deal with uh, threats on, onto this, uh, this archetype. Mm -hmm. Even something really big like the Crescent Guardian uh, gets scooped up by Brittle Steel very handily. And if you go for Moonlight Affliction here, uh, then you're just... You're only hitting for 10, and without the potential to even threaten the lethal, it feels like a really strong commitment. Uh, that that you might not want to go for, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely it's not worth it to go for Moonlit Affliction anymore, because just putting on a 2 HP is, uh, is, is, is not the best outcome at this point, unless we draw another Doom Beast, and also because there are ways with 4 mana to deal with this, and we can see mm -hmm. uh, both LeBlanc spells on 1 HP and the Brill Seal, so... Basically, if uh, Sirena wants... Okay, just gonna go. push, just gonna push. I guess this is correct. If you push through a little bit of damage, if this all goes through and you set uh, Serrano down to two, uh, then maybe a Doom Beast or an Unto Dusk or something top deck can, can close it out for you. And Moonlight Affliction, you don't have that utility of, of like Hush where you can silence your own units to cleanse a Frostbite. I so still just... feel sad. Mm hmm. This play has such potential last round if we saved all our units, but this is still this is still um, showing how good Moonlit Affliction can be. Even though it's getting answered, there was a big chance that uh, I know, right? Uh, Nobody plays around triple LeBlanc draw. Yeah. The worst you're hoping for there is your opponent just to have like another frostbite or a couple, you know, combat tricks to soften the blow. But actually answering your board is so strong. And now we've oh. got Brittle Steel into Three Sisters Flash Freeze into the open attack on Ash should be uh, lethal here. Yeah, oh, there yeah. it is. Yeah, not even with the uh, Three Sisters. Yep. There we go. And we even drew the Doom Beast, which means that if we mm. actually got those juicy two damage on uh, the ten damage in the face, and uh, there was a way for us to get the proc on the Doom Beast, mm -hmm. we could actually finish the game there. Moonlit yeah. Affliction, as I said, I'm a believer on Moonlit Affliction. Yeah, too. I, I, I think like that, I think that the line was definitely correct from uh, from Asher. And the only thing that could have been improved is if you saw into the future what your early hand was going to give you after the mulligan, that you keep that Nocturne and try to use that to, to double down into a, a mid game. But uh, Frostbite is just, if you're trying to hit them on board, they they really beat you down. Like the there was a point in time where Nightfall did decently into Frostbite because they weren't running as much early combat tricks as they are now, especially you already talked about it. Serrano's version has a uh, triple troll chant, double brittle steel and two elixir of iron and three sisters. Like it's just, it's a lot to deal with. And then the double ice veil archer in the early game, like just stifled any aggression. So now we're going to see what nightfall can do into lady of clouds. I would keep Islander and Curse Keeper and try to get Islander on one into Curse Keeper on two for the reason which is getting a 4 3 to block uh, uh, Nightfall units is kind of good. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that play is that it can also get answered by a Di Diana, as we're seeing, uh, with a Pale Cascade or an Unspeakable. So, But he, he still opts to go for the Oblivious Islander with uh, Curse Keeper. We actually have a, a curve, we could say, of 1 2 3 on Serena's side. Even though it's not the best curve possible, but we do have it. Yeah, it's, it's all about just lasting, right? Once you once you get through this early game, if Nightfall is not going to high roll you, then they're the ones that just need to beware of taking any sort of trades that are going to give you a good Radiant Guardian or, you know, just Darkwater Scourge Mask Mother. Even if you don't um, cash in the Darkwater Scourge with Mask Mother, the fact that you can just play three mana if you attack me, I'll heal for five and offset so much of your damage. It it's basically like a three mana AoE stun when it comes to Nightfall. Exactly. And we're seeing a Stalking Shadows eating another Mask Mother or an Oblivious Islander. I would choose Mask Mother indeed. Seems like the best option in this case. And I think that Siren has a pretty uh, it has a pretty good hand to uh, deal with nightfall early threats. 
Hmm. And then there's the Stalking Shadows into a Burst Pass, of course. Wants to see if Asher is going to develop one more thing here. But Asher can just play the same game and just... Uh... Mm-hmm. Either burst pass with the uh, gem or just actually play the Crescent Guardian. Hmm. So Asher is just going to be a little bit more aggressive here. Uh, the Mask Mother does come down, so stats now even on the board. It's... Diana exactly. maybe fixes this a little bit, but the 2-2 the two -two stat line isn't going to be enough. No, the 2-2 two -two stat line this way does, is not enough because uh, Diana obviously dies on a trade. Mm. Uh, but there are ways, now that we have the flight, we can like start poking a bit with, with it and trying to get extra draws from our deck. So I think it's a safe play to go flight on, on as a first play. Also because it's just a one drop, we still have almost all our mana, so we can just uh, poke Siren and say, okay, hey, what do you have? What can you answer to this board? Yeah, maybe you do just swing through with the uh, with the Crescent Guardian. Um, it's another two damage you're putting in and even evening things out. Maybe you even cash in the goat here to get a gem because you have Stalking Shadows in hand, but you're going to need Nightfall enablers beyond that. And it looks like Asher is indeed committing to a very aggressive line here. Do you think Diana is also going to be the play on top of this? Just give your opponent a really good trade in exchange for forcing through damage uh, through some other avenue. I actually think that this is going to be an attack after this. I think Diana, he can play Diana to get just a, a bad trade and pull more damage. But I think now doing an attack like this, we're just at least pulling four damage from a unit on the attack and the two mm -hmm. damage from the flight plus two damage from the Crescent uh, Guardian, which makes a total of eight damage going through and putting our opponent on uh, nine HP. And it's better to do it now mm -hmm. before turn five, where generally is the Radiant Guardian uh, turn. And mm -hmm. yeah, there we go. Yeah, just uh, get the opponent. trades now to counter the Radiant Guardian. Serana was being very stubborn. Uh, Asher wanted to maybe see one more development. Um, and now the Vanguard Redeemer gets to take advantage of all this combat coming through. Exactly. And that's pretty much what Serana was waiting, I think. I uh, was waiting for these trades just to get an extra value um, in, in draws. And it cost him basically 8 HP in the Nexus, but... I mean, draw is important, and we always like to draw. And mm -hmm. Asher actually got the best attack, I, could, I would say, for this round. Yep. And then you get another elusive unit off the top, thanks to the draw from the flight, and you get the flight right back, so that's 4 elusive damage potentially being threatened here. Uh, Serrano now needs to, to kill a unit and set up Radiant Guardian, which there's not enough mana for right now. Exactly. I mean, we can do a uh, Glimpse Beyond on the 3-3, tree -tree and we're still one mana off of doing that, uh, mm -hmm. doing that so... Maybe we should do Oblivious Islander on, on something and do the Mask Mother. Okay. We can... It, yeah, there's a, actually the chance of doing double uh, Islander on Islander and playing... Uh, double mask, mask mother on both Islanders just to have a board to sustain, but it's it's kind of a, a it's not that good of a play because we start losing all our value in hand. Yeah, you're and then you're putting pieces of your combo towards just surviving in the early mid game. No dark water scourge to make use of these mask mothers feels really bad. If I'm remembering correctly, one of these mask mothers is ephemeral from stalking shadows earlier, so that would need to be a dedicated uh, mask mother. Uh, target for the other Mask Mother. Exactly. And I think it's the zero mana one. Because uh, Oblivious Islander eat it. And I mean, it would make sense. You wouldn't make both Mask Mothers uh, ephemeral. Mm -hmm. So this this definitely looks like it. I would say maybe Mask Mother the two one into another Mask Mother. And you make a 6-4 on the board with, uh, with uh, Fearsome. Yeah, so basically, mobilize coming through. I'm wondering if there is some sort of line that Serrano can or could have done with like Oblivious Islander, uh, discounting the Mask Mothers to try to squeeze out a, a Radiant Guardian here. Oh, actually, he opts to just do this one Mask Mother. I think mm -hmm. he's gonna play another Elite and try to get another draw, and probably not even attacking and just staying like that on the board, depending on what Asher plays now. Mm hmm. 
And Asher does want to develop here, just being a little bit cautious around the single combat, of course. Um, and does go for the Diana. So she is going to level, and this will be very helpful at getting some trades down the road. You've got Gem still in hand with the Doom Beast to deal two damage, give Nightfall uh, another Nightfall proc. Overall, I do I do really like this. Serrano cannot attack. It can't at all. And the thing is, playing Diana here is also good, even if there's a, a single combat. Because it's just an even trade and uh, less than the creatures on the board that can um, be buffed by Citra. Mm -hmm. And so the clock? Yeah, it's basically the a clock. Yeah, the clock is ticking down for, for Asher. A lot of early work has been done. But not only are you on a clock against the uh, Lady of Clouds combo, which, you know, you're expecting around round seven, round eight. But now that we're in the mid game, you have to start worrying about Radiant Guardian and, uh, you know, even Darkwater Scourge, Mask Mother uh, potentially being played. We know that I, I mentioned it before. The Radiant Guardian can just undo all of this work you've done in the early game and just bring your opponent back into it. And it looks like it is coming through. We've got Darkwater Scourge ready to go. Exactly. So the, the real question is, do we play Darkwater Scourge and Mask Mother this round, even though it has Ephemeral? Because I don't think so. Just to stop an attack, it doesn't make sense to do it right now. So I think it's probably going to be letting an attack go and losing a unit to just develop the mm -hmm. the Radiant Guardian. But obviously it depends on the on the development because we cannot go way too low. There uh, there is actually a chance for Yeah, um, you can go you can go uh zero mana Mask Mother to to kill one of your units and then you do have mana for the the Radiant Guardian, right? Cuz I that was mobilized so it's only 4 mana. But everything else that you have going on for you right now is a bit expensive. Like if you glimpse, you're just taking a blocker away. Whereas Mask Mother just lets you maintain an extra body and play to stop this. Right now we've got six elusive damage being threatened. Potentially seven with the gem. And then exact lethal with the Doom Beast on top of that. And I think this is lethal. I think we just go for Stalking Shadows, try to see what mm -hmm. we get. Do a gem on one of the ephemeral, uh, not ephemerals, my mistake. In one of the elusives and yep. try to get the lead a lot of out of that. Yep. You just jam the shade stalker, you attack, you've got Doom Beast post combat. And there's no single combat from Serrano to cash in on this lifesteal. I think it's gonna be game. Nightfall managing to slip under the radar right before these lifesteal units were hitting the board and undoing this early aggression the flight has just it is exactly what this deck needs for fuel and for chip damage we even drew another doom beast because of the flight drawing two cards here exactly and asher is just hoping that this on the stack right now isn't a single combat yeah and now we can just Breed of Relief, because there's no single combat, there's nothing to stop this Doom Beast, so... He can obviously play the Doom Beast from the top, just to put a little bit of salt, just saying, I just drew the, the little. How, uh, how do yeah. you feel about that? <laughs> and it's gonna be game. Uh, second game goes to Asher, and we're going to the decisive one. Where it's going to be Citria versus... I think it's a Zira Aurelia. Uh, yeah, Zira Aurelia is going to be playing into Lady of Clouds, and this is the matchup that we talked about both players kind of wanted right whereas zero Relia is the sort of list that can kind of be confident into most everything as long as you draw well there's been call it a curse or a blessing depending on your perspective but deus into azir has been consistently the turn two and turn three from the deck meanwhile lady of clouds with its tech thanks to uh, oblivious islander with cursed keeper and mask mother Darkwater scourge can potentially just set up a gigantic lifesteal unit and then aurelia azir is never going to be able to punch through in the early mid game the way they want exactly especially with the radiant card in tech and it's a two off in the deck i just checked and if we manage to get a radiant guardian on turn four or five with uh, mobilize if we're able it's just going to to stop all the attacks from Azir Aurelia, because our Radiant Guardian is just going to stop all the blades every time and just healing us back. It's like, it's mm. and th there it is. There it is. 
And it's important to note that Mask Mother does have Fearsome, so once you get this big body set up, uh, Aurelia Azir cannot block that very effectively. We've got Sparring Student on one, but no Emperor's Deus or Azir to follow up. Just going to take advantage of the turn one attack token to deal four with Dunekeeper. Exactly, so Dunekeeper is just going to deal four damage this round. Because we know that the only one drop in that deck is Oblivious Islander, and it's a combo piece, so generally it's not drop uh, in this type of rounds. We can save the Sparring Student for later rounds where we can play with uh, the the two mana that uh, the Ribbon Dancer uh, that summons the, some. I love the I love seeing Asher's reactions there to like top decking the whole coming like yes I want this this is a good card. But... Yeah, it, his his reactions are pretty funny to see. Is you can you can feel what he's feeling when he's <laughs> and now with uh with the ball back in Serrano's court uh hovering over his stalking shadows just to maybe take a look get a chance at maybe fishing for Darkwater Scourge or or just filling up the hand for a top deck mobilize to to fill this out could be quite strong yeah but I think he can also just pass and wait. Because uh, he's probably going to try and drop the um, the Lorant on the turn tree, and just getting a free trade probably on the on the sparing student unless Ribbon Dancer is played. Uh, if he can you, if you stalk into Cursed Keeper, it is pretty strong as well. Yes, because you still have mana to play that, and you get your four three. I mean, you cannot. Like, I think you cannot play Curse Keeper in, with this mana unless... Yeah, you can. But it's still also a very good option because you get a 4-3 that you can play. Yeah, you can play the next round. You get the 4-3 and it's a pretty good blocker for all the... For all the, the blades. But I think he, he opts to not do it. He wants to save that mana because of a mobilized. He probably really wants a mobilized on 4 in, uh, or on 3 to get uh, the lower cost on the Radiant Guardians. Okay. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't stop looking at Asher. I love that background. It looks like he's like a best-selling author. And that's like his headshot on the back cover. But uh, anyway, random thoughts aside, we've got Darkwater Scourge uh, now in the opening hand. All the pieces of the puzzle have now come together for Serrano. Exactly, and we see another sparring student, which can be played into another Ribbon Dancer. So we're going to see. Some pretty big uh, sparing students this, this round, I, I think. And oh, there's there's Citria. Oh I mean, man, it's all coming together for Serato. And meanwhile, Asher is missing out on his champions. No Aurelia, no Azir, no Emperor's Deus. Um, so, this, <laughs> so there's nothing to really fuel these sparring students. You can go for Ribbon Dancer here if you'd like. Um, this will buff these up quite. Uh, quite well. It's only going to be plus two, plus two. You know, when you have the Deus and the Azir on top of these blade dances, getting the extra token matters a lot. But every little bit of chip damage helps. Exactly. Especially because we, if it, Sirena does this block, uh, unless he blocks one of the two ones, we're dealing seven plus nine. Yeah, we're dealing nine damage with the two ones. We don't mind. I think we pull the other two inside. Just try to pull the most damage possible this round, because we know that possibly the the Lord and Protege is uh, is blocking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you if you attack with the two ones as well, the Protege blocks and then maybe pulls a Sparring Student. It gets like a ton of value, but overall, it what what's the pressure here for Sparring Student is that if you have to if you want to kill it, you have to do it immediately before your opponent plays something. Uh, you know what I mean? Your opponent plays a unit, and then it's suddenly it's a 2-2 two -two or a 3-3, three -three, and then it just gets out of your reach. So Serrano going to take advantage of that opportunity to just swing on the Sparring Student right now. Isn't going to develop any sort of uh, Dark Water Scourge this round, of course, but on round 5, we do have that combo. Yeah, and the best part about this is that uh, this we didn't swing with the two ones that would get traded. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, Lauren Protege has a pretty good trade into the Sparing Students, and in, it's basically surviving. And as you were saying, we didn't get any of the champions yet, neither uh, of the three ones, which is uh, Azir, Aurelia, and obviously Dai's uh, new champion. Yeah, from I mean, you <laughs> get, you get, as long as you get Azir, you know, before round four or whatever, whenever you're attacking, it's fine. It's totally fine. Yeah. You only and... missed out on one blade dance worth of value. He's he's a little late, 
but you know the it's emperor fine. is never late he arrives precisely when he means to exactly so we just got azir and i think everything is just going to be fine for uh asher <laughs> we're immediately just we... saying like oh never mind asher is good now because of this development now do you just open here against the tutu or do you want to greed for the marshal i because... think the marshal is just too good because if you open attack, then they still get a chump with the 2-2 two -two and they develop a Radiant Guardian post-combat. And then potentially just heal back up with the single. Asher's doing a little bit of math here. You have Nopify for the single combat. And if I they Radiant Guardian post-combat, you can Homecoming the, the uh, Ribbon Dancer. And then you just hit them back really hard. It's actually super dangerous for Serrano to develop Radiant Guardian this turn. Yeah, I also think about that, and he cannot even do the other play, which is uh, Scourge into Mask Mother, because that one is even scarier to Homecoming. So if there's an open attack, there's going to be a block definitely from the Lauren Protege on the 2-1, I would say, and that gives literally the info to Asher that there is a Radiant Garden in hand, and then we just have to Homecoming and uh, notify the... I mean, no longer we do that, but that was the possibility, and then we yeah. would notify the single combat. But obviously, Mate Asher cannot see uh, the opponent's hand the same way we see, and uh, Serenu is instead going for the Dark Water Scourge play. And Asher is thinking about an attack. So the Sand Soldier does get uh, plus three. Azir doesn't level up just yet. But if you attack with Azir, maybe you bait the Darkwater Scourge to blocking it all the way down at the bottom of the line. So I think it's actually a safe attack for Azir here. I mean, if that one damage matters, I can see that. I can see Darkwater Scourge now blocking the student. Or just getting a block from Lauren Protege to the 4-6. And maybe then getting a single combat to the 3-1. Which put us on 470, puts us on 2 HP and we can still do the Dark Water Scourge play. Because this attack is just so crucial for Asher being done this way. Because even though Cyrano is getting 5 HP out of this raid, he's losing obviously his Mask Mother. Or, and he's not developing um, a Radiant Guardian. So this is very smart from Asher's side. And Cyrano knows that. Cyrano knows that if he trades with the Scourge, all his play that he had in mind is completely flushed out because he doesn't have the Scourge for the Mask Mother anyways. Yeah, and like if you try to even out the trade onto the Marshal by single combating that way, you still have an Azir in play, which is, is going to threaten you even more. And protecting the Azir yeah, against the single here is fantastic with the Nobify. Yeah. Such a... Just a blowout card. You need these really cheap and efficient combat tricks to resolve in this matchup in order to keep up with the tempo that you are under. So Azir lives and the Dark Water Scourge is still at the very least going to heal for five. And we're at two HP. This is this is very scary. Anything yeah. with uh, with Blade Dance is just game. Yep, there oh. it is. And I thought, honestly, I really thought that the Inspiring Marshal was going to be too greedy of a play. Um, we've seen players even, you know, talk a little bit about earlier where you would cut Inspiring Marshal or maybe try to run something else in that slot just because that five mana commitment play is opening up sometimes too big of a window opportunity for your opponent to uh, rest control. But Backing up that play with Nopify was fantastic, and even with the Radiant Guardian coming out with Lifesteal, it's not going to be enough because of Homecoming. Exactly. And if you put uh, it on the stack first, you're worried about, uh, like, single combat, of course. Ooh, there's Strafing Strike then. We can actually gain some HP here, yeah. even with Homecoming. But is it enough? Because next round, we're just getting a big swing. We can just uh, send a 2-1 and... Uh... Even with the uh, even with the strafing strike, we can just send yeah. the. You can just you can just play Marshall, and then yeah. your Sand Soldier being created from Azir gets like a ton of attack. You're just attacking like super wide, right? There's no judgment in Serrano's list. Yeah, 
And he's obviously going to the, for the strafing strike here to try to get the, get the HP. Yeah, it's Probably. sad. You can't even clear the Azir. Man, if Radiant Guardian was still a 5-5, heavens to Betsy. To be fair, it is rare that Azir isn't leveled up at this stage of the game. He's got to be like 9 out of 10. I haven't even got a glimpse of it. It is pretty possible. It's either 9 or 8. Um, I was not counting. So, two sparring students. Uh, Azir, yeah, Azir, sparring Marshall, Ribbon Dancer, which summons another one. And there was... Yeah, there, it's, it's exactly at 8, I think. 8 or 9. I mean, either way, it's leveling now. Yeah, it's on 9. There we go. Asher just listened to us, I, I guess, and just mm -mm -mm. Uh, showed us. <laughs> Somehow. So now you've got um, Azir. You can Blade Dance uh, a couple times here. If you play Ribbon Dancer, you just get one Soldier and one Blade, and then that's going to be five damage. No, they get plus one, plus one each, and then the bonus damage from the Sand Soldier. So Ribbon Dancer is lethal, right? I think playing Inspiring Martial. No, it's, fi it's five. I'm thinking that, that Serrano only has five HP. He has six, so it's not lethal. It's not. Yeah, I think it's... Right, right. Yeah, it's inspiring Marshall into Ribbon Dancer. Just, just feeling the curve exactly on the on the cost mana. Mm -hmm. And Aral is also okay because of the the spell, because of flawless to it. And we're leveling Azir, so we're basically doing an attack for six damage now with our spell. Even though obviously there's going to be an answer from uh, Cyrano's side. Uh, I mean, otherwise he's dead. So he mm -hmm. he definitely needs to to play something. Yeah, the, the homecoming, like having the Nopify for the single combat, having the Nopify for the Radiant Guardian, uh, these units that you need to uh, stick to the board either to get repeated reps of value or in order to feed to the Mask Mother so you just get a big lifesteal fearsome unit that your opponent can't really block and you're just getting like free chunks of healing while also furthering a win condition of actually threatening their Nexus. Asher is still at 20 HP, so even if the hand was like completely bricked here, you probably still have one or two turns before you die. Exactly. And I cannot, uh, uh, the same way as you couldn't stop looking at Asher, is, is just talking a lot. Is, is probably, this is, a is this a very hard situation because your opponent has 8 mana total and 7 in, in minions. It's, it's probably afraid of what could be in hand that could be answered. And he was probably thinking about inspiring Marshall, and he's probably explaining to to the stream uh, that. So I think this is uh, follows to it, and uh, just getting at least four damage there. We can also do Ribbon Dancer. At least Ribbon Dancer cannot be answered directly as a mm -hmm. spell. Yeah, just play it because it's uh, it just does the blade dance immediately. The only problem of us doing anything related to Blade Dance is that any trade for the Mask Mother summons directly uh, one buffed, uh, uh, in, I mean, lifesteal and tough uh, Radiant Guardian. Yeah, so that's this, true. Yeah, so this is basically two damage going to the face. We're blocking three because of the Sand Soldier passive. And obviously, Siron is just gonna spam that Radiant Guardian. But I don't think that's going to be enough. And, do, yeah, I don't think Radiant Guardian is enough to stabilize from, from this position regardless, even though you're giving them the trade to set up the Radiant Guardian. And I think this is an open attack here. I mean, Flawless do it is not doing that much because uh, you're playing one mana and you summon two blades at 2-1 and the uh, Sand Soldier at 2-1 and uh, the sand, it, it just gets traded. Probably you pull, yeah, you pull one damage because the... No, this no, this is a game because of Irelia. Irelia uh, spell yeah. actually yeah. makes game. I was I was trying to think that it gets yeah, traded. Then you block, traded. yeah, oh, then you it. block the with the Radiant Guardian at the top of the stack and then Irelia, even if you go up to eight, it's still four, five, six, seven, right? No, oh, then you then you just uh then when you attack attack, you still get to swap with Aurelia and Azir to sidestep this lifesteal anyway. It with the double it? blade surge. I think we had lethal. 
We could have swapped with the first blade just for the exact four damage, but it's fine. A either way, it's just just a zero really things, I guess. And it's just and fine. It's like, you can see that this deck has a lot of options available to it at, at any given time that even when you have a big lifesteal unit, the uh, the damage around the sides like still offsets that value. And being able to, to get that win with Nightfall is what really clutched uh, the rest of the set for sure for Asher because when you compare both decks as part of the lineup, you know, Nightfall is the one that's going to be easier to prey upon. Exactly. I'm I'm sad honestly to see the Citra Matron going down. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Cyrano lost is uh, which means is out. Uh, but we saw some interesting games, and we definitely we saw three Citrus going <laughs> into the board in one game. That's I think it's it's a good show. It's a and, win for everybody. Yeah, it's it's a win for everybody. And uh, yeah, this this last game just showed a bit on how Zira really can deal with the things. Homecoming went from an unplayable card where everyone memed about to <laughs> probably. <laughs> Yeah. One of the most played cards now in Ionia. It's actually surprising. I would never expect something like this. I wonder if they're going to send it back to five. <laughs> oh no, that would be actually funny. <laughs> oh my god, they're like, okay, homecoming. Like they cr Riot has like one of those giant NASA computers that takes up a whole room and it's crunching all the numbers and it's like homecoming is actually the card that needs a nerf. And it's like, brilliant. We'll play Radiant Guardian now. But um, with Asher clutching the victory in that set, uh, we'll be moving on to the next stage of the bracket, and we will see how that shakes out when we get back from this break.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Fight Night Legends EU. We are in the final stretch of uh, today's broadcast, and the next match we have set up for you beautiful people today is going to be Asher, who we just saw take down uh, his opponent to go up against Badge Attack, who has been battling through the bracket very valiantly. Badge Attack, a younger player who actually took down Asher earlier in the day and only got sent to losers because of Brad Chicato, who's waiting in grand finals. So uh, right now, Badge Attack trying to get that rematch, and Asher actually going for a revenge match against the person who put him in losers. Exactly. We actually didn't uh, see the full uh, length of the match of the Badge Attack and uh, 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 made Asher in the beginning, yeah. I think. Uh, I think we saw the last game. Um, I don't yeah, I think, I think it was game three. Yeah, we saw game three. So this is probably Asher going to try to get the revenge mm -hmm. and get the sweet final and try to qualify for next week. We have some pretty interesting lists from both sides, uh, and we've seen them playing the list. So um, I'm pretty excited for this one. This is this is going to be probably even fast one because at, at least yeah, from uh, Asher's side brings aggro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both players have brought Aurelia Azir, but both players have different takes on the on the archetype. There's still a little bit of science being done on this list. Despite its power level, it does still have some flexibility regarding adapting to the metagame and adapting to its poorer matchups. This is Asher's list once again, opting for Navori Conspirators, only two copies of Homecoming and triple Inspiring Marshals. I know that there is some sort of redistribution of these cards from time to time. Nopify being a recent uh, card that started out in the list, dropped off of the deck, and it now has found its way back in. And we've already seen on today's broadcast how powerful Nopify can be when your opponent goes for a desperate play to even out the board or make something happen and you can shut them down. Exactly. And from a, a badge attack side, we're going to see that the list is not that much different. I, I really liked an Avari Conspirator too off in the Asher deck because it allows some uh, funny things with droplets and even the green, glade, uh, the green glades and all of that. Mm -hmm. From a badge attack side, it's triple of everything except inspiring Marshall. So all units, it tries to be the most consistent in drawing the units. And it makes sense because the deck is already so good and it does everything so well. So you want to be consistent on drawing those cards. Green Glade can be a finisher because of uh, its passive. And inspiring Marshall is really good. But for example, if you get two off in the first three rounds, it can actually clunk a bit your hand because you don't want inspiring Marshall in the, in the beginning. And, for example, in the mirror match, I don't think it's the best deck because you probably um, mm. want to go for Blade Dances and level your Azir first. It obviously makes sense and it's, it's yeah. good in the late game and makes a difference. But in the early game, if you have an Inspiring Marshal and your opponent is doing all the shenanigans, it feels really bad to not be able to be in the board. So these are pretty good two takes on uh, Azir Aurelia. And I think both decks are pretty consistent on the playstyles they're trying to bring. Yeah, the uh, it shows two different philosophies about the deck, right? Where one with the Navori Conspirators wants a bit more flexibility, wants a bit more combo potential, double dipping on those units. The other one goes for a more consistent through line, has the Green Glade duos to have a more explosive opening, potentially to just straight close out a game rather than going for combo -y shenanigans later down the road. Inspiring Marshall being cut down to a two speaks to the fact that maybe it's a play that, again, gives your opponent too big of a window of opportunity. But going into game one, Asher opting to lead off with Aurelia Azir and Badge Attack going to take a more defensive role with the Dragons. Radiant Guardian and Fangs in the opening hand and Shivana uh, are really great indicators of a good mid-game defense. And last time we saw this go down, the Dragon deck had no play for the first three rounds and just exploded. So now with a two drop, maybe this is enough <laughs> to hold down the fort. Yeah, this is we both are laughing probably because of uh, Asher's reaction. Like this is such a good draw, and this is a visual bug. But this is we're dealing okay four three seven plus four. We're dealing eleven damage turn two on an attack. It's just it's a lot, 
And even though there's a Dragon Lieutenant on the budget attack side to try to minimize the damage, and we've seen in the match against Bratchet Kara how uh, not having uh, early game, I think it was Bratchet Kara, not having early game can make you lose uh, against the Zira really because they develop pretty fast. So this is pretty strong starter from Asher, even though we know from uh, budget attack side that he has sustain. And if this goes into turn 5 and there's a chance of a Radiant Garden dropping, this game can suddenly switch for the other side. So, we see Azir being dropped on 4. So, uh, and, and it's pretty good to have Azir early on. Uh, Azir is uh, definitely the key in, in this deck. And it's probably even stronger than Irelia. The, the, the most important thing about this deck is that Irelia makes it able so Azir can have his full potential uh, as, as a card. Um, we see Asher is is wondering on doing this attack, even though he knows that uh, Shivana trades pretty well into almost everything there. Uh, this is a risk, knowing that can be shape stone, which is going obviously to be played. And Bajazak can obviously answer with a sharp sight. Little does he know that there's another shape stone in hand that can deal. Actually, he can't. No, it can't deal because. There isn't a daze that it was played, so the other shape stone cannot actually answer this Shivana, so it's gonna be a good trade for budget attack side. And even though we're pretty low, this 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 was I would say a good trade in terms of value for budget attack side. So we see Shivana and uh, Lord and Protege just being dropped probably to get a trade. Uh, obviously, we're not going for Radiant Card in place here because uh, uh, we know there's no way for the opponent to kill our Shivana, and he probably doesn't have that intention because he knows that there's always a Radiant Card in possibility. But attack is taking some time and thinking. I and if and it's actually not budget attack, my mistake. It's uh, Asher is thinking if he wants to actually go for the the blossoming blade or not. He knows that there's a chance if he does that, it it definitely levels up um, Shivana's because he can get a trade and then Shivana just attacks and and levels up on the attack. Unless it gets homecoming, but uh, doing homecoming like this probably is not the best answer. We see Azir getting leveled up, which is pretty key to to, to happen here. And um, yeah, sh just Shivana doing an attack here. It's either getting homecomed or um, or leveling, I would say, or or actually even trade. We have the shapes on, which can get a good trade. This is the very hard situation to read from both sides, I would say. Because uh, budget attack having 3 mana, it can actually threaten either single combats or sharp sight, or, and we see the sharp sight in his end. And from Mate Asher's side, with 4 mana, it can, um, it can threaten with a gnome coming. But I think that probably Asher is just going to play shape stone into blocking with the tree tree just to make a, f a free trade it's it's a very hard yeah. way to so getting trade. into yeah and getting into the shivana here both players need to be very specific about developing if if asher makes a mistake then radiant guardian comes down homecoming is your only out against that and if Baj attack 
doesn't keep certain amounts of mana open for, you know, single combat uh, to threaten these developments, then it gives Asher so much room to do these combos and these bigger plays that he wants to do. Exactly. This is the, I think the game is not going to take more than uh, either two or three rounds at this point, because either uh, Asher finishes it now with uh, his uh, Azir, or the Radiant Guardian somehow uh, sticks into the board and uh, Asher doesn't have a way to answer because he has to choose either Homecoming into uh, Shivana or Fangs or Radiant Guardian is... And I say Fangs because it's the one being dropped now. And it's too many things to to choose at this point. And the fact that we didn't have one dice makes the shaped stones pretty clunky. And we drew all mm. three of them in this game. Yeah, all shape stones. And some some players even said like shape stone wasn't like in the original version of the list, but the ability to have your blades and whatnot trade up into your opponent's units is just so it's such a strong high roll some players have talked about maybe even running an extra copy of ancient preparations just to have another landmark in the deck but dancing droplet is going to try to go the distance here and, and deal a little bit more chip damage yeah the problem with attacking with the dancing droplet is that it can be okay it's, it's gonna show shivana i was going to say you just block with the uh, fangs and there you go uh basically all the hp you you were dealing it would be chunked back to his nexus but mm -hmm. it was not the case but a bit too late but i guess i guess and yeah so you have to take the hit and i think that bosh attack might have actually weathered the storm it's it's like we know that asher's hand right now is pretty clunky not a lot going on you can't just set up the homecoming in a desperation sense um, because it could just get answered directly by a combat trick, especially the strafing strike there. And now the double deus. This is too late. This is actually sad. This is this is the game pulling a prank on Asher because he drew all the three shaped stones, which would be good if he had the days before and now and they were not the best at the time. And now he just now you just have to go in. You just have to go in. Vaj attack has uh, seven HP worth of life steal on the board there's also sharp sight and concerted strike to just heal back up to full on top of this you don't even need to uh to worry because asher has cashed in the entire board yep and even with double shape stone here on the two units uh that are dealing damage to the nexus it's not gonna go through yeah with the sharp sight and the concerted it's just yeah, yeah. honestly, just go double shape stone and see if he's got it. Like, look at all those cards in the Dvasi and Targon player's hand. There's no way. Or you just you just sharp sight like further up the line to lifesteal for more and just save the concerted strike against inspiring Marshall or what have you. I mean, you definitely have to do it, right? The I mean, Asher win win just... because if you concerted strike to lifesteal for more, you homecoming to bounce that lifesteal unit and you don't heal enough, is it still lethal? Because there's not a single it's... combat to follow up with a concerted strike either. I think it is, yeah. Actually, Wait it is a the minute. Root. Yes, Hang it is on. lethal. Hey, Hang on. on. I got bamboozled. I thought chat was memeing when they said this was lethal. Wait. Oh, no. Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. Yeah, never mind. Wait, wait, not okay. Wait, no. Yeah, it, <laughs> hey, wait. No, 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 no. This is okay now. This is okay. It's just, it okay. just does that now. Yeah, okay. it's, it's talks <laughs> twice okay. the life still. Okay. <laughs> the, look, we, we were like, oh no, the double dance is too late. And there was still a line. There was still a line. But here's the thing. Asher failed to get lethal. He didn't, like, outright lose the game. He's just going to surrender now, though, because of the open attack. I think you maybe just let your opponent have this one. This was the matchup that Botch Attack wanted, though. The mirror match can get pretty volatile around just, like, you know, draw quality. And when you're playing Dragons into Aurelia Azir, it's one of those matches where it's like, okay, if I get the right cards, I can do it. And Botch Attack pulled through. Had the Lieutenant on two, got a little bit of chump blocking, had the Protégé to hold down the fort even further, and then into that lifesteal during the mid game. 
very slow hand from what you typically see from Aurelia Azir, and the curse has been broken. No more Deus on two. Yeah, and that's definitely something we were talking about early on. Almost all players uh, in this fight night have been able to just curve out uh, Deus on two into a zero on three. This was not the case. We even drew a zero on four, which was strong and needed, but uh, uh, apparently not enough. We just can't deal with uh, big chunks of eight, um, life steal like uh, uh, Radiant Guardian or Fangs, which was the case. And so getting into this new side, uh, Bosch attack now on the offensive. I can count to three, <laughs> Benitez. <laughs> and oh, no. this is looking a lot better. Asher now, however, does have Nightfall, which, you know, the fearsomes maybe do a little bit of work. You've got some elusives like the flight, the chump lock, the green glade duo. Um, the Crescent Guardian and Nocturne can do a lot of work. It's not over yet, but we'll see what this deck can accomplish against the curve. Dun, yeah. dun, dun. Yeah, because this is definitely a good curve. We just play Azir now, then we play uh, Aurelia on, on four. We play Flawless, Flawless Stewart, and it's just, yeah. And it, mm -hmm. Even showing us what is going to happen, this is just... Danger in... it's just going to be danger to, to Asher. There is a Diana though, which is nice. I was just going to say, you want a little bit more something something to even out the board and, and keep it answered. Like if you play Aurelia here, you you know, you know have your mana for the Flawless Duet, but you're opening yourself up for uh, Diana to snipe. So, Baj attack, just recognizing that Azir is going to be the safest play with the 5... Uh, with the 5 HP. Even showing us the foil, uh, Azir, and uh, I really, I just noticed them. If there was a better yeah. target in play, I think that uh, Asher really would have liked to go for Dusk Petal Dusk Nocturne around early and just like get a really fat hit. Mm, but this one, actually this one puts a lot more units on the board. Yeah. I think he wants to just be present on the board, do some damage now, and have blockers for next round when... Probably uh, either the Ribbon Dancer or Aurelia or, Aurelia or whatever drops, uh, we can have ways to answer it. And this is this is a really good draw. This is this is insanely good. This is filling the curve, literally. <laughs> we just play Flawless to it into Dune Keeper and we're just dealing so much damage into a, one attack. And possibly even leveling our Azir. Yeah, it's yeah, and then and then because you're creating the tokens in combat, the uh, the nocturne's not gonna really do anything to stifle. Um, you could, I wonder, maybe you just play out the shade stalker here, just have a two three chump. Yeah, there's a possibility. You can also then do the dusk battle onto the crescent uh, guardian to play another uh, unit. He opts to play the crescent. I think he's gonna do dusk battle into uh, shade stalker for the extra one. Mm. I mean, not now, but... Uh... Yeah, Crescent Guardian already has, like, you know, you, you, you're sacrificing the stat line. If it's a unit that you're expecting to just, like, chump block everything and just have it go down this round, you'd rather uh, have your Elusive, which is a little bit more guaranteed, versus uh, the Overwhelm, which maybe gets blocked by something bigger. Um, and by saving the Shade Stalker, you have an out against a Green Glade Duo development. Exactly. So now we're going to see a really big hit from uh, a Baj attack. I think he's not good. Yeah, yeah, it's showing us again. Uh, that what I was going to say is probably not attacking with Azir because his concern is a uh, pale cascade on the Crescent Guardian just trades evenly on Azir. Yeah, so it's a really hard call to make. Aurelia is going to be missing out on her level up, so if they do have the uh, Pale Cascade, then so be it. I wouldn't mind attacking with the Dune Keeper because it's extra damage and uh, mm -hmm. not even on the face, but possibly even in the units. And it's also important to damage units from the other side because if they're damaged, they take less uh, blocks to our uh, Sand Guardians and uh, and mm -hmm. um, and Swords. So 
Ooh, so Asher actually doesn't opt for Dusk Petal into Lunari Duskbringer last turn like we were expecting. Saves it in order to do Nocturne this round, it looks like. If you give minus attack to the Aurelia, then there are no fearsome blockers, and you would be able to just swing through with that. Um, if we look at the board state as is, Nocturne is two out of five, I think. Oh my goodness, punished for developing. How dare you play a unit and not open attack. Here's another volley coming through from Aurelia Azir, thanks to the Blossoming Blade. I mean, it gets traded. The Shade Stalker just trades directly into a 2-1. And we can just... Uh... Yeah, we cannot take all this damage. We cannot just block one because Shaped Stone just kills us and it's on range of that. But we can just ignore one of our two ones into the Sun, uh, Sun Guardian. And we can definitely play now the Nocturne into um, probably even a Zir to try to kill it. I'm not even sure. I mean, even though it's kind of late for it, could be an option. I did see the Nocturne was one out of five. Um, so when you attack with all the Nightfall units that are on the board, he would level. Um, but with the minus one attack coming through onto the Blossoming Blade and the Aurelia now, uh, they still will be able to block Fearsome after the debuff. Yes. So if we play Nocturne, it has to be on, uh, on the Zir just to kill it. The thing is, we would actually have to kill our... Um... Or Nocturne too, because it's the only uh, unit that can kill Azir, like functionally. Mm -hmm. The only unit that's big enough. And if you if you're threatening that way, uh, if you give vulnerable to the Azir and drag it with the two one, and then you attack with the uh, with the Nocturne and the rest of the Nightfall squad, um, you still don't have good trades into the Aurelia and the Blossoming Blade. Yes, exactly, and I think that's. I think this might be game next round because uh, this 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 attack is not getting as much damage as it, it should because of uh, uh, Azir's passive giving plus one attack into the four mana uh, that Pasha attack played and also the level up from Irelia, mm. uh, which means that uh, Azir can get a good trade into a two one or even I or even Diana. And yeah, we can just trade Diana with our Azir and we can trade Nocturne with. With our tree tree, I was going to say we can trade Nocturne with our tree tree, but I forget that he's leveling, so it's no longer a value trade. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is still there, and it's still going to happen to prevent six damage. We can just also yeah. kill our own. Yeah, we can yeah, kill our have, own. You have, you have the Deus, so I'm wondering if he, if you don't mind getting rid of the Azir, but I think, I think he might, because we don't have anything with Blade Dance in hand. And even with Homecoming, we don't have anything we can send to them to, to give extra attacks. So, okay, never mind. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Blossoming Blade coming off the top. You can just go for that volley right now if you'd like. You have to, you force Asher to sacrifice the entire board anyway with just a bunch of 1-1s one and uh, 1 HP units in play. Exactly. I think you still play, yeah, you still play the elusive one. Because if he doesn't block with uh, his elusives. Uh, this round is also... It, it can get one shot either by the Sun Guardians or by the Elusive, so... Okay, there there, there we go. Yeah, the, the, the passive from Nocturne doesn't affect the Sun Guardians, neither the Blades, so this is going through. All of the Blades are at 2 attack, and also the Sun Guardians. I think this might be game. And uh, Asher is not playing around... Uh, uh, Shapestone, I think, at this point. Yeah, you have to be, you have to, like, even with a block like this and surviving at 1 HP, there's still not enough. You can play the, the Cloven Way to stun the 6-1 or the, the, or the Blossoming Blade, I think, and you still have a 2-1 to block the Green Glade duo, but there's just too much damage coming around the sides thanks to the Sand Soldiers being created by Deus and Azir here. There's still an attack token, uh, from Baj yes. Attack. And Asher is at 1 HP, so even with this stun, uh, we have exactly 4 5, four or five attacking uh, units into 3 defending units, so I think this is going to be game. And uh, Baj attack is just 
going to take the game again, just like he did in the first round uh, against Asher. And he's going... Oh, it's actually four attacking units because the Dune Keeper is zero attack, but it's, it's still the same. And he's going to advance to the finals and he's going to try to get his revenge against Bratchet Kata after uh, this clean 2-0 versus, versus Asher. Yeah, having the having the life steal uh, was was immense, right? To to set that up and to uh, to sustain through that first matchup rather. And then once you take down the Aurelia Azir by some miracle, then uh, taking down your opponent's other deck is going to be the much easier accomplishment of the two. Uh, and both players, again, just like you have to play that game, the the matchups very specifically. I think that that Aurelia Azir into the Demacia Targon, we saw how both players were floating mana to threaten combat tricks, um, developing, trying to play around Homecoming, trying to play around Radiant Guardian being set up. So there's just a lot of lines to consider, even all the way down to the final turns. Exactly. And we saw that uh, in the case of Asher versus Bajatak in the, the matchup of uh, Irelia versus Dragons, we saw that even with some early pressure, Dice is very important. And yeah. there's a reason why everyone says it's the third champion. Uh, not being drawn at all uh, until the end of the game and having yeah. three shaped stones in hand clunked out because there was no um, landmark being played, so it was just yeah. a one mana beef plus one plus one, made a lot of difference in the game because it was uh, basically that I really was not aggressive enough and the dragons just ended up having a good curve to just respond to that. And getting the lifesteal. And after that, the other matchup will just be easy. Irelia Azir uh, just has to win yeah. two games. One of them is a mirror match. And the other one is, is, is easy peasy because it's Irelia Azir. <laughs> mm -hmm. And but, so uh, Irelia Azir has, you know, demonstrated its power, demonstrated its consistency as uh, Bajitak has been piloting it through the lower bracket. And with that final win... Uh, has earned the revenge match against Brajkata in the Grand Finals. And so we will see that faded rematch when we get back from this break.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Fight Night Legends EU. And lucky viewer, you are just in time for us to get into the grand finals here. Uh, we've had a very action-packed bracket throughout the entire day. Some very heartbreaking losses due to some poor draws and some really sweet explosive high rolls and card generations from Targod. But with that all, you know, working its way through today's broadcast, we are finally here and I'm glad that you're joining us. The players that have made it to the grand final are, of course, Badge Attack, who just qualified, versus Bratched Kata, who's been waiting patiently in the grand finals for that opponent to be decided. Uh... Bratch Attack, a younger player, has like just really jumped out, I think, and made a name for themselves already immediately against Bratch Kata, who is, as you already mentioned, a tournament mainstay. Uh, even if they aren't winning a tournament, you know that it's guaranteed they're going to make the top cut. And Bratch Kata has had vi several very strong showings throughout Fight Night EU specifically. Exactly. If you if you know Legends of Runeterra competitive scene, you definitely know Bratch's kind of name. So it's no surprise that he's obviously doing a good result in uh, this uh, uh, this tournament. And he just had two clean sweeps uh, on the winner brackets into the finals, where he just won two one against Budge Attack just to qualify for the finals. And now is going to play against him again, uh, which is gonna try to get the revenge. Uh, I would say. And uh, Badge Attack just uh, had basically a pretty good run until the finals where uh, faced Badge mm -hmm. Kata and just uh, got a clean sweep against Tasher. Just so, so basically, I think it's it. it both players had a pretty good run, and uh, I'm expecting again a really really good final from both players, which showed a really good good gameplay uh, through mm -hmm. the competition. Yeah, Badge Attack just fought out of the loser's bracket and is looking for that revenge against Bratch Kata. And when these players have actually have somewhat similar lineups, um, you know, when you roll the dice that second time, you shuffle the cards and you play another set, you know, things can go differently one way or the other. We're going to refresh ourselves on Bratch Kata's lineup, however, because we have not seen them play for a little while. And this is his first deck, uh, which is Trundle... Ledros. Uh, I always call it Trundle Ledros because that was the original TLC, but yes. now it's the, the L is Lissandra now. You'll have to forgive me. It's a TLC, and actually, Bratch Kata, one of the only players that was able to bring this, you know, all the way to the grand finals. It had a strong showing during last Fight Night EU, but the meta has shifted. Even the ladder itself, um, not just tournaments, has shifted against this deck, and it hasn't seen a lot of play just yet. But Bratch Kata is you know relying on the combo has the double ruination technology to scoop up a lot of these uh dragon decks that try to set up on you perhaps in the mid game uh can also counter lady of clouds which sometimes comes out of the woodwork to snipe this deck too and overall i do like it just a little bit of a nod towards the early game with the inclusion of avaros and sentry as well i think that the spread of removal for this list is quite good. There isn't any Ice Shard, but I think that the box being a bigger inclusion in this list goes a long way. Uh, Bratch Kata's second deck, however, is Dragons. We see the Aurelian Saul Shivana Classic, but no sixth champion. A lot of uh, players that bring this list opt for like maybe a Zoe or even a Jarvan to fill that last slot. And just a mishmash of a lot of one ofs and decent utility in the early mid game. Exactly. And as we theorized initially, the reason why probably not bringing a Zoe into this deck is to have less procs for possible slays and uh, um, Naz against Naz's trash. Because mm -hmm. uh, since it's a 1 1, it can get traded by almost everything or uh, even Vile Feasted. And, and it's, it's just not as strong against those type of um, uh, decks. So, but there there are a lot of tech cards here. The one of Solaris and Forger to make it more consistent against some aggros and for the HP. We have the Guiding Touch, which makes everyone plays around it. It's just a one off and gives draw, but it's yeah. it's there to do the, its job. And then there's Judgment. We yeah. all like to see some Judgment action as long as it's us playing the Judgment. But uh, <laughs> the one off probably doing some wonders. Uh, um, probably in this game, because we're going to see the deck in action. 
So we've got Baj Attack leading off with Aurelia Azir versus Bratch Kata, who is leading off with Dragons. We've got early game. We've got the Dragon Chow on one and Blue Sentinel, which are both excellent chump blockers and the Radiant Guardian in the hand and ready to go as soon as we get to that part of the curve. But Baj Attack, meanwhile, has the Dancing Droplet into the Deus, into the Azir, the Aurelia, the Forbidden Hand and attacking on turn two. Let's get it all ready, right out of the gates. Them, Baj attack hand is just, I think, how many times did he actually get a bad hand with this deck? Cause I feel that most of the times he got actually- Asher is the one and... who tanked all the bad hands for yes. Aurelia Azir. And the rest of the games we've seen so far with this list today have had like really potent curves. The, the saving grace, however, is that there's no homecoming. So if this Radiant Guardian can hit the board before it's too late, it can stabilize with the single combats. Exactly. And we see now that uh, Budget Attack is just going to be full aggressive and drops a Sparing Student that is going to be very big this round. We can still drop an Irelia and do the Follows uh, Dance. And we can mm -hmm. just try to do a big swing. So the only thing problematic is, and it's not just problematic, it's the most expected thing, is to see probably a Shivana from Bratchet cut aside with a Dragon mm -hmm. Show on 4, which is actually not the case. I it like that single combat as well. Takes down the Sparring Student and it gets countered by maybe Nopify or Lead and Follow, but by forcing uh, Baj Attack to spend mana on a defensive, a reactive play like that, um, you cut a little bit away from this offense. And now that it's resolved, you don't have to worry about the Sparring Student and you can just keep chumping the rest of these blades. Exactly. And there's still the chance of a Shivana drop. I mean, we know that there's no chance because it is not in the hand, but uh, the single combat play is very, very uh, strong here because uh, even if there's an answer to, for example, a lead and fall or something to make the Sparring Student survive or an Opify, as you said, mm -hmm. which is making everything more slow for Budget Attack side, and we still don't give the info if there's a Shivana or not in, in our hand. We're just... And there's uh... the... Yeah, and so passes back. Bajatak's going to take the opportunity to swing in. Uh, I like this better. You're, you're setting up for the Aurelia to go first. And uh, maybe force up... You're getting this three damage almost guaranteed. Because your opponent knows the Flawless Duet is coming. And taking advantage. Like, not wanting to develop the Fangs. Exactly. Uh, I think the main reason is he's trying to bait something about uh, mm. Shivana and make uh, Baj Attack play more uh, weird or clunky. And uh, this way with the pass is just probably saying, okay, I have answers in my hand, I have stuff to do to answer your attack. Or maybe he's just trying to bluff and say that he doesn't have anything and then plays the Fangs the next round. Mm. Even though this is this is kind of scary, even though if it's a bluff or not, this is a very scary situation because dies in on the board, Azir is leveled. Uh, okay, yeah, there's no I really anymore, but uh, mm -hmm. we Double also don't have combats anything. were cashed in in order to deal with two pretty strong threats. You got rid of the sparring student, you got rid of the Aurelia, but now you have less tools to proc your life steal multiple times or against a homecoming if you need to. The Equinox is an interesting hover. Uh, being able to silence an uninspiring Marshall, for example, uh, could be quite nice. The Trickster gives you blocks against this Dancing Droplet that's chipping away at you, or potentially a really big Green Glade duo. Uh, so it's very close what you pick here. And Brachikata goes for another reactive line with the Equinox, gets opened up with the Blossoming Blade off the top from Badge Attack. Once again, another good draw from Baj Attack while having no uh, Blade Dance cards, just pulling up the 4 mana and just having a very strong swing here. We see the sharp side going into uh, the Fangs to try to get some HP back and obviously a good trade. Uh, this allows also to uh, Baj Attack to be able to attack with his Fangs now to get the most value out of its sharp side, uh, sharp side and the uh, uh, um, lifesteal. From the unit. Yeah, if you attack with the 5 2, um, maybe you force Badge Attack to trade away the 4 3, but it's just going to keep it alive. Says, you know what, I'm going to top deck another Sharp Sight or something. I'm just going to keep healing. I can't give you that, that resource. And now Inspiring Marshall comes down 
and the Equinox, the prophecy is fulfilled. You're going to cut out a lot of damage. This is still a 4-6, however. Yeah, this is still a 4-6, and we still have a, a 0 on the board. We still have uh, a lot of things, and it's still scary. I mean, at least no, no longer uh, the Sand Soldiers are getting the plus 2 from the Inspiring Marshal. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a relief, but it's still a scary point. And this could be actually a finisher for budget attack, even if not this round, in two rounds, you can just try to finish the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can you can attack with everything here, I think. You can definitely attack with those. I don't, you're, I think you attack with the 3-3 too. Yeah, uh, you're, you're summoning two soldiers, so, you, so yeah, you would lose out on a soldier if you attack with more, but just not wanting to risk, I suppose, a, a buff Onto the, onto the fangs. So just going to block as much damage as possible. Get another rep of lifesteal. This will trigger the Radiant Guardian, um, which can finally come down. And so with Blossoming Blade off the top, Inspiring Marshal at the top, doesn't get Homecoming off the top. So now we can uh, we can get some more units in play and, and try to even this out finally. And, and, and we just drew another Blossoming Blade. So if we don't have blade dance cards, we just draw them. It's it's, it's not that hard. It's just from this position. There's a lot of cards that just combo so well. Once you get that early setup of Emperor's Deus and Azir, the rest of your top decks just have so much power added to them that even if you got a ribbon dancer or another Aurelia or just like a, a sparring student or a Dune Keeper, like the work will be done. Um, you can pull Azir now with Sharp Sight onto the Screeching Dragon, and then you have seven attacks so that you can still kill through Shape Stone. Um, there's still the risk of Homecoming, of course, to prevent Lifesteal, and just ends the round? Yeah, this makes sense. He was just uh, thinking about Homecoming for sure, and he preferred to... Okay, I prefer to use my uh, Radiant Guardian on a block, because uh, yeah. if he goes for an homecoming on his attack, I still have the block with the Radiant Guardian and I still block one attack, so it still saves me some damage. And yeah, you also have Sharp Sight against the Dancing Droplet. Yeah, and you also blocked a lot of damage. I don't think you have to block the Dance Dancing Droplets though, because it's, it's a lot of damage from the other units and the Dancing Droplets are just doing two damage combined. So I'm pretty sure there's going to be blocks on uh, both the Zir and uh, I really because of their stats on the attack and obviously on the Sand Soldiers now mm. if there's a, a flawless sweat. Yeah, going for the... not taking the risk of a trying to remove Azir from this board uh, is going to be rough because now we've got flawless duet, um, we've got blossoming blade to blade dance again. And so then we're just going to have a ton of blade surges that's going to throw... Uh, Azir into any open slot, right? We just got lethal being presented on board just with the elusive units. Yeah, the thing here is that there's an hush and the sharp sight in hand. So we can obviously just kill the elusive one and we can trade into the um, sand soldiers and everything is fine, quote unquote. Because mm -hmm. we have a lot of life still, we can get this round. Yeah, and then you've got blade surge to throw Aurelia wherever she needs to be. So so what's the play? Even if like even if you hush the, the Aurelia, you know what I mean? Like she can blade surge out of the way if you're trying to like set up a trade there. We've got nine HP worth of lifesteal. It's just that you have to sharp sight one of these in order I, to block further up the line. I think it's a sharp sight on the Radiant Guardian, blocking the elusive one, and then blocking with a 5-4 into a Sand Soldier. This allows us to, knowing there's the, bl the bl it's Blade Surge, I think it's the Zero Yeah, minus Blade Surge. Mm -hmm. If there's a Blade Surge into I really for some, some, something else, we can always ush it or, okay, it opts for the other way around. Sharp sight on the, on the Sun Forger gets an extra point of HP. And just a little bit more blocks uh, need to happen. Blocking the 1-1, one, one, though, uh, over the 4-1 means probably Hush is going to come through on top of that. And we can still block with uh, uh, our other units. We can block with our Screeching Dragon. This way, we're actually fine. 
Not sure about the block with the lieutenant because we can do it after. Yeah, yeah. I think you have to block lieutenant because of uh, blade surge, right? Uh, potentially just swapping into the open slot anyway. I guess so. Okay, this, this still doesn't make that much of a difference. Yeah, because you still have flawless duet in hand. <laughs> so Even another rep is going to be coming through. Um, it should, I don't think, actually, maybe you don't flawless. Now that your elusives are done, you're just giving them more bonus reps of lifesteal. Could this actually be the stabilization, though? I think so. I definitely think so. We know there's no home coming, so definitely Bratchet Kara has to just play the old school. If he has it, he has it. And cannot just uh, be afraid of uh, homecoming or whatever. He has to obviously try to get those HP and all these units are stronger in terms of stats and um, and value on the board. I mean, in terms of value, not exactly because Azir and I really, but in terms of uh, stats value, it's 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 better for the Bratchet Kata side. And more <laughs> lifesteal coming down to join the fight. Now that there's so many lifesteal uh, units in play, every time you blade dance, you're just giving your opponent more life. And so with a second Equinox being brought about, Green Glade Duo is no longer going to be the Hail Mary lethal. I think at this point is just stabilization for Bratchet Kata. If there's anything uh, blade dance related going into the board, we have all the ways to sustain to get the HP back. And there's also... I mean, we have to go for it at this point, right? Because if we're just stalling, we're just going to lose anyways. But uh, mm -hmm. at this point, we know there's a second Radiant Garden in hand, so uh, you can trade the... Um, you can trade the Fangs, I think. You definitely can trade the Fangs into one of the units. Yeah, and like and you can you can Blade Surge Aurelia or Azir to the front, but it's not, it's not a direct lethal from this position, so you're probably... Badge attack seems to be setting up some sort of, like, blade dance, blade dance again, then you attack, you have triple blade surge, and you're just gonna try to do some kind of zany swap to get, like, a one-shot from Azir and a couple other units to, uh, swing through. The thing is, at this point, while we blade dance, we're just putting, uh, Bratchet Kata back to full HP. Because every attack is just get, giving him HP. It, it definitely can't, like, one-shot you from 20 uh, very consistently. We can put the quick attack in front of the Radiant Guardian. Uh, maybe that eats a hush. But the thing is, we, we, we're we seeing two Blade Surge in hand, so if there's a hush, it's, it's just mm -hmm. going to Blade Surge back to some somewhere else. Yeah, and, definitely. like, even if you Blade Surge, like, a big Azir to the front here... Um, they can just hush the Azir and still survive. Yeah, I think it's definitely what a, uh, what Bajatak would be thinking is also the Azir. And this has to bait an Ash, I, I would think. Yeah, because you're you're losing out on the lifesteal from Radiant Guardian otherwise. Ooh, okay. lets it go through! Is confident Ooh. that the the second Ooh. Radiant Guardian following up here is going to be enough. Because he lost to Irelia, that's why he let it go through too. Yeah. And also the second Radiant Garden. I completely forgot about this interaction if you don't have the board space. Oh! I've actually never seen that. And neither Ooh. did I, but that's an actual interaction and this is actually pretty interesting. Now everyone knows, if there, if you have your full board, do not pull your uh, Irelia back from your back part into the, the spears, otherwise you lose it. Unless it's a part of the plan. In that case, you can definitely do it. Yeah, so... Amazing. The backboard was full, so Aurelia couldn't come back after she survived that combat and got obliterated. Now, the so important thing to note is that the, the blades that are summoned by your blade dance... Um, uh, have the wording that they obliterate when they leave combat in order to smooth out that interaction. But you can put the soldiers back on the bench if you want as well. And that... We all learned a little bit. We all learned a little something <laughs> today. And 91% of chat who is favoring Vaj attack uh, is 
maybe feeling a little bit sad right now as these lifesteal units just keep on walling out Aurelia Azir. Only 9% of chat, based on the statistics, was believing in Bratched Kata. And oh, there's Judgment! There's still God. no homecoming from Badge Attack. The key card you need in this matchup to send this Radiant Guardian back or the Screeching Dragon to offset this enormous tempo. We're actually seeing an Azir die in combat. This has never happened before in the history of this deck. I've never seen Azir just dying on combat. It generally just gets lead and follow or retreat or just gets saved somehow or because I'm coming uh, into my units. This is... This is a good change of pace. This, it's good to see something new in in interaction, I would say. Uh, but this is interesting. We we're seeing the judgment tag here, like and Yesh came, came down to just uh, save the radiant guardian. And no matter what he attacks with, judgment is always going through uh, because of the dice. So there's always one unit, and it, and it doesn't even need to just do judgment here. He can just keep on sustaining and uh, waiting. Because Radiant Cardin is just, and especially without Azir, Radiant Cardin is just always getting a free trade because it's not getting damage for, uh, for the yeah. sand, uh, sand soldiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when the sand soldiers and the blades are just one attack, they are so much more manageable, right? Because plus one attack on a one attack unit is doubling its attack, doubling its power, and you're just getting like so many trades, like here. Okay. It's the Screeching Dragon uh, procs. Rather than healing off the Radiant Guardian, 16 is enough. Wants to make the Screeching Dragon as big as possible. Just eat the next Azir that dares hit the board. And that is going to be the Surrender from Badge Attack. Once your opponent has stabilized that much, you have no Azir in play. Big Screeching Dragon to just challenge whatever you summon after the fact. It's not going to be enough. Yeah, so this was a very interesting match and I'm... Pretty happy with this one. We saw how dragons can stabilize against the Zira Aurelia. And especially because of Radiant Guardian, I think it's a very important card in this matchup. And uh, mm -hmm. um Card just knew the is out. It's just let, for yeah. example, his first Radiant Guardian just dies to play the second one and have the good trades and saving an Ush, which was key later on to make the second Radiant Guardian survive in a Shapestone trading unit. So uh, just going slow and steady and making sure mm -hmm. that all your trades still makes you be alive. Yeah, the, the early single combats did a lot towards stopping that really powerful opening from Baj Attack. And the fact that Baj Attack did not get the homecoming, such a key card to sidestep a lot of what Dragons wants to do, really sealed the deal. It allowed the Screeching Dragon and the Radiant Guardians to survive for multiple reps and get tons of lifesteal. So now here we go again, Dancing Droplet into Emperor's Deus. Gonna try to take down TLC. Now, reminder, Branch Kata's variant does not run Ice Shard main deck. It has two copies of the box and three Withering Whales, some Vile Feasts and Blighted Ravine, and Avalanche. But not specifically the Ice Shard, which at fast speed can wipe a lot of the blades and soldiers that are created on like a wider blade dance but i think that bratch Kata's take is simply to keep the board from getting that bad exactly and even though his list is less consistent we would say because of the lack of ice shards against these attacks from the the, the spears and this um not the spears the blades and the sand soldiers uh it is still possible even though it's a very favorable matchup for the easy really there are some ways and we see already like for example, the Blighted Ravine, which which can deal with Irelia's and uh, Elusive's uh, units. Uh, we have the Withering Whales, which uh, you were talking about, which can deal also with the, the Blades, uh, even though it's not the most efficient because it costs five mana. So there are ways for this game actually to go to Bratchet Kata, even though it's going to be a very hard matchup. And especially with this curve, we're already seeing Droplet into Dice, into Irelia again. Azir is missing, Azir will be actually the top cherry here, mm -hmm. but it's, it's still a good curve. Honestly, having dice is just uh, the best, one of the best cards for this matchup because it's a landmark that it can be re removed and every attack is summoning a uh, Sand Soldier. Yeah, just every attack having that little bit of extra damage just goes a really long way. Uh, the Avalanche does resolve. 
just to check against whether or not Baj Attack has lead and follow. And it's very similar to what Brachikata did in their previous game, where you put that removal on the stack, and if your opponent does have lead and follow to counter, you want them to take that line, where it slows down their aggression, even if they're sidestepping that removal and saving a unit. So now Trundle has a chance to come down, and with regeneration is also going to be walling out a lot of this damage potentially. And from Bajatak's side, we saw the the most important one of the most important cards I would say in this matchup to be drawn, and uh, in fact dropped, which is Inspiring Marshall, because now these Sand Soldiers are going to be three one, and even with having the Trundle, which can chump block a lot of the uh, the Sand Soldiers and Blades, um, not sure how much uh, Bratchetkara can hold until all these three one um, Sand Soldiers and Blades uh, start dealing some pretty big damage into his face. Mm -hmm. You have the Withering Whale and the Vile Feast to maybe help you out in this position, but you're only stopping one wave of, of the Blades and the Sand Soldiers here. Um, without Azir, it's, it's not too bad, but Ribbon Dancer just to kind of test the waters with a big attack, Blossoming Blade to follow up on top of this is still a lot of damage that needs to be presented. Exactly. And uh, Bajatak being very smart in playing first the Ribbon Dancer instead of the 4-drop, uh, because this way still uh, makes use to have 7 mana, which can uh, both bluff Homecoming or lead and follow. So there's a lot of possibilities still for Bajatak for play, and it probably will try to bait some stuff from Bratchet Kata's side, which might be the case. Now, we probably see the Withering Whale, exactly just to try to get the value out of it. And I think Bajatak is thinking about a Shapestone in the Sand Soldier to try to pull more damage. It would be exactly 6, 7... It would be 7 damage will put... Uh, uh, yeah, Bratchet cut on 9 HP. So mm. yeah, it's definitely worth it. Especially because yeah. we're attacking one more time now. Yeah, on top of everything else, you get another Soldier. And you're just trying to force this Trundle to trade. Brachikata wants to save the Trundle to make uh, to get value out of the regeneration, but because of the Inspiring Marshal, you aren't getting that long-term value you're really relying on. Exactly. So this this time, I think it has to be a trade from the Tavern Keeper into the five-two, just to take out one unit from uh, Bajatak's side and to just breed a little bit. But uh, this was a round where we took a lot of damage because of this Inspiring Marshal, which is. Definitely one of the most important cards in this matchup. Yeah, just huge HP, can't really be removed. And yeah, you're just threatening your opponent in a really big way. So three, four more damage being threatened here from the Sand Soldier. And Brachikat all the way down to five. No box in hand, no second avalanche. It's going to be pretty difficult to deal with any blade dances uh, from this point onward. Exactly. And... The worst part for Bratchet Kata is that we know there's another. Oof. There's another uh, four drop with uh, Blade Dance. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's called uh, Blossoming Blade. Yeah, Sometimes Blossoming Blade. Blade. And we've just drawn an Azir, which is <laughs> just one of the key cards in this matchup. And all matchups, honestly, because it's, this is mm -hmm. all around Azir. So this. We just drop a Zir and we can drop a Blossoming Blade and we're just threatening Lethal at this point. Yeah, with the with the Inspiring Marshal and Azir buffs now working together, there just isn't any more value trades to be had with this deck. Um, developing the Azir here is perfectly safe because there's uh, not enough H there's not enough mana to threaten a ruination, uh, to just wipe. And being one mana off feels so bad. I think that Brachkata might even be thinking about something like a Fading Memories just to develop another blocker uh, at the start of the next round. The open yeah. attack is just really scary on top of everything else this deck is doing. Yeah, the problem with all of this is that with only 5 mana from Brachkata's side and we know that there's no more Withering Whale and also the deck doesn't run any Ice Shard. If uh, if Baj attack develops here the Blossoming Blade, I think it might be game because we're attacking with four units that are 4-1 and two of them are dealing one damage if they proc the face. So yeah, this is this is going to be game, I would say. Yeah. 
because even though we can block everything and uh, we're at one HP at this point, we don't have any any blockers for next round, mm -hmm. either for Fire Marshal, Azir, uh, Blossoming Blade, or the two um, Sand Soldiers being summoned. So, Budget Attack actually taking the second game, which will lead us to third game, I believe. Yeah, so we're going to be going to game three. Uh, doesn't take the open attack. This feels... I guess it doesn't matter. If you play Aurelia, you get punished by a Ruination here. You still get the Flawless Duet in your hand and Green Blade Duo to develop after the fact. Yeah, and it's still little either way, so it's not going to be a punish. I was going to say yeah, exactly that, that this is a punish to Ruination, but seeing the amount of mana that uh, Bratchet Kata has, if he Ruinates, is just over. Mm -hmm. And like, even if you, you know, Spectral Matron to get another blocker on top of everything else, you can't go wide enough against this board. Once Aurelia attacks, uh, she's going to get Blade Surge and be able to swap into an open slot as well. And I think uh, Bratch Cat is definitely seeing the writings on the wall. You want to take time just to make absolutely certain, uh, which again, at higher levels of play, sometimes there are things that you'll overlook. Or, you know, you just take the extra time on your turn to start thinking about the next matchup. Um, with Badge Attack picking up the win on Aurelia Azir, he will be forced to try to get a win with his Dragon deck. Exactly. So the last matchup is going to be a matchup that is generally favored to TLC against Dragons. And uh, that's mm. the matchup that I really like. And it's a very slow-paced one until turn 8, obviously, because in turn 8, then there's the combo side of TLC that starts coming on. And I think we saw this exact same uh, pattern in the previous games from uh, Bratchet Kata and uh, Badge Attack on the winner's uh, bracket, I'm not sure. Uh, which was a uh, uh, favorite for TLC in the end. And when we talk about this matchup, right, TLC, because you are able to just obliterate your opponent's deck, it takes away that long-term value that Targon typically uses to grind you down. But as time has passed, Dragons have started to rely much more heavily on the Demacian side of things to develop a stronger mid game, have a bit more of a, you know, proactive plan to fight for tempo. And we did see it earlier where potentially Dragons can just get a huge like Shivana into double Screeching Dragon and that big HP is just threatening to close out the game that you can't answer. Bratch Kata has two copies of Ruination and that might be the ticket. Exactly, and we just see the Zoe being dropped. A very, very bold move, knowing that there are three Vile Fists and Bratchet Kata's... Uh, uh, yeah, there are three Vile Fists in Bratchet Kata uh, TLC, but uh, we're still seeing a very good curve. And uh, obviously, as you were saying, Shivana and the Demacia side is very important in this matchup, because TLC struggles a lot in dealing with uh, mid-game and strong units that Demacia provides because of uh, its stat line as a region on having uh, overall good value uh, uh, units for board. And it's just, this this has been just a good curve for a budget attack. He, he prefers not to drop the lieutenants on early game and for example drop the Zoe because this way doesn't give an info that there was no dragons at that time, which mm -hmm. was the case. Yeah, just relying on, on your curve being, uh, you know, a little bit better without giving that info. And then you can save the Lieutenant for maybe when Bratch Kata has tapped out for a different removal spell. It is going to be very weak to Avalanche and such at just 2 HP. Exactly. And uh, also this is this this consideration is very important from Baj Attack side. It doesn't want to trade the uh, Verosan Sentry because it doesn't want to give the draw to Bratch Kata. He knows that uh, uh, once uh, that there are all the tools for Bratcha Kata to win, like Lysandra, the Trundle, and uh, the Matrons, mm -hmm. and the Ephemeral, the Fading Memories. It is basically over if there is no Shivan, double Shivan in hand, or, 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 or any other thing that can answer that, so... Mm. So, decides to go for the block indeed, goes for the value trade, to and then cash it in the Screeching Dragon and gets the second one! It's coming together now on Baj Attack's side. The combo pieces are there for Bratch Kata, just needs the Trundle to get the pillar now, and Baj Attack now working on this really strong mid game with second Screeching Dragon and Concerted Strike to follow up. 
Exactly. Now there is the safety of playing the Lieutenant. I mean, not entirely because an avalanche deals with it, but now we're not giving... Uh, I mean, we're giving the info that there is no... That there was no dragon like the mm -hmm. early game, so yeah. we're just giving the info now that there is a dragon. But uh, this way, Bratuskata doesn't know when the dragon was drawn, or if it was from the Mulligan, or which dragon it actually can be. So mm -hmm. it's it's just playing slow and steady. I I also would like the the screeching dragon here because making two very good units uh, for the Massy side is also important. But this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just trying to kill an uh, entire board with Blighty Ravine from Project Kata. Uh, and get a right there on reaction. You get to it's keep perfect. that bonus HP when it's actually healing some damage, which is a nice interaction. So, Screeching Dragon still lives to fight another day. Um, I think notably when Badge Attack developed the fangs there and it wasn't a Shivana, I think it does give some info that Brachicata knows there's, you know, a Screeching Dragon or Eclipse or even Aurelian Saul in hand and is maybe a bit more worried here that Trundle has not shown up yet, that if we do get to the um, next couple rounds with Eclipse into Saul, maybe Saul does come down before the combo completes and you have to deal with that. 10-10 exactly. with Spell Shield to survive the Ruination too. Yeah, the main thing missing here for Bratschkat is definitely the Trundle to try to make the combo work. Mm, so, out of units, unfortunately, the Screeching Dragons without targets to feast upon and get bigger, um, despite their fearsome stat lines, can still get slowly whittled down. Uh, with the removal, and because they've hit the board like at a very lopsided cadence. Uh, there hasn't been a singular turn where a lot of damage has been threatened all at once. It's usually just been one unit or two units, and like one of them is just about to die. So here we go, Dragon Chow, gonna try to come down and get another card draw off of Aurelian Saul in this next round. This was the third Dragon Chow, I think. It drew all of them, I believe. Mm -hmm. So being able to cycle through the deck is nice uh, with the plus one, plus one. Sometimes it matters. And Trundle finally... Showing up a little bit late for Brouch Kata as well. This I mean, still on time. Yeah, just the right. Yeah, just the right time. I think for the for the combo to go off next round for Brouch Kata. Exactly, because now we. I think we still play, and it's kind of difficult to know what we actually play because if we play Trundle and uh, and and you know, Brouch Kata knows that if there's a sharp side in in hand, it's just GG. Um, but. We can still do the combo next round, no matter what badge attack has in on the board. It just needs to try to survive this round and somehow have Lissandra on the board uh, the, this round too. I think if you're really scared, you can go for uh, Flash Freeze to pop the Spell Shield into Ruination. I think there's a way to, to make it uh, work. Oh... Ooh. Oh, I'm gonna go for the box into Ruination. Okay, saving the, saving the uh, Flash Freeze for something down the road, maybe against an Immortal Fire. I was thinking about, for example, a Trundle into the Withering Whale in hand, in case mm. there's a sharp set play, because it puts us on 2 HP. And uh, then we're able to play the Lissandra, which means we can play Pillar Pillar, and uh, yeah, and, and then just do the combo. Yeah, and because of Aurelian Saul, the Great Beyond has also joined the fray and has an entire hand full of spells to back it up. Baj Attack, unfortunately, has all the reactive tools to buy tempo, but against uh, TLC, who really isn't developing a lot of threats, you know, you don't have things to use your single combat against or your concerted strike, and you're just sitting on all of these reactive cards that just aren't doing anything. Another full grip of spells. And the fact that there are two uh, Flash Freezes and Bratches cut of hand is really, really important and really good here. Because at, at this point, we can hold on some attacks. Like, we can hold on two attacks on the future. Look at this. Single combat to take down the pillar. Uh, so Fading Memories is going to come down to get that extra pillar to make sure that this combo will go off uninterrupted. This is going to grow the great beyond. It can't get big enough to stop a watcher though. Yep, yeah, and Lissandra drops. But the thing is, uh, Bash Attack has literally so many answers on his hand. He has two hushes, 
uh, to one concert, Crash and Strike and uh, one Equinox. So it literally can deal with uh, it can deal with the board. It can deal with three. Um, um, it can deal with the three Watchers at this point. Right. Uh, badge attack can stop his deck from being obliterated three times, but you still have to worry about the 11-17s that are still potentially in play. Um, with the pillar being able to give vulnerable to the uh, Great Beyond as well, uh, there is potential for that to actually just get scooped up by a Watcher. We'll see if the single combat uh, will connect here, or if this does bait out the double flash freeze. Might bait one flash freeze, but not sure if it's the second one. Yeah, this is this is good because we, we really like having Lissander because of the free ice shards and the tough maxes. And now here, here comes the part where we're going to get so many watchers on the board. It's actually going to and we got the third Ursh, so there there is all the answers possible. So just, I think, yeah, I think that Baj attack will be able to buy themselves another turn. Um, I didn't get a chance to see, I, I'm misremembering, what ended up popping the spell shield for that uh, flash freeze to actually go through to save the Lissandra? I think it was the Withering Will. Oh, from like a, a long time ago? Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Two rounds ago. He did the, I think he did the Withering Will to pop up the shield and get some HP. And honestly, I think that... Since there is literally no units on Baj Attack's side, I think Prashishkara will take this game just because of 11, uh, 17 attacks. Because yeah. he can just play the, the main one, and then he can substitute the other one. And doesn't matter what uh, he blocks, it's just too much damage. I mean, there is no obliteration in the deck, like no deck obliteration, but it's just... It's just game, I think, in terms of damage. I think we found our uh, Fight Night uh, um, winner. Yeah, Brad I mean... has been waiting patiently for the grand finalist to be determined to fight him after, you know, all this time. Badge Attack fought through the lower bracket to get the rematch. Brad Kata is the player who sent this also in a game three was the one that sent Badge Attack down to the lower bracket in the winner's finals. And even in the revenge match, the the Watchers are still here. And they are even if they don't blow up your deck, they're just going to go right for the Nexus. Yeah. If they don't blow up your, your deck, they blow up your Nexus. Exactly. It's just, you cannot escape the Watchers. They're just watching you patiently and waiting <laughs> to one-shot you. That's what is happening here. There is... It's just GG. Congratulations to Bratchet Kata, I believe. I mean, it can still hush. Hey, God, you can single combat, so you get to block two, and it's still exact lethal, right? Because of the 14 from the Watcher of Lissandra. Yeah, there is literally nothing possible. So Bratchet Kata takes the win. There is no need to go to second game. We and have our... spells. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I don't even know. We saw triple C3 today, now triple Watcher. Uh, I don't know. Eventually, you've seen the we're... highs and the lows, right? The the Zier Aurelia drawing well. The the deck not having Deus. The deck not having Homecoming when it needed it. We saw that deck just now, like just drawing units and then having all of these dead spells. Um, we saw dragons even not having plays for the first three turns and just straight up dying. It's card games. It is card games. There has been a lot of very high level plays and nuance to the lines that were taken despite everything. And that's where the heroes are made, right? Is when you can get those wins when you're not drawing very well. And maybe you're just able to bluff some cards that you don't actually have, force your opponent to respect. But when it all comes down to it, Bratch Kata, we already praised today as a very powerful player. And yeah, getting to the grand finals and then just winning it straight up. Uh, makes perfect sense to me, even with TLC, which um, was pretty unfavored and didn't have a lot of success for Spikes. Um, Bratchkata was able to round out that lineup with another Dragon List to, uh, you know, carry through. Exactly. Uh, honestly, I'm not surprised with this resu result since I, mm -hmm. I know the player and I know the, the potential the player has. Uh, also not surprised that TLC did well for, for the player. Uh, even though Spikes wasn't able to make uh, the list work, 
Uh, this is too, too strong. We just saw, for example, now the three watchers. It also depends on the way you pilot it. It also depends on the way you tag it. And also mm -hmm. depends on the matchups you hit. Obviously, if you're going to hit a lot of uh, Zira Aurelius or other bad matchups, like, for example, some tech NASA trashes that we've seen, it's possible that mm -hmm. the list is not going to do well. But uh, against other matchups, like, for example, Dragons, which we saw Bratchet Kata eat a lot of those matchups, it obviously, obviously, if played correctly, is going to do well. And it was the case. And I think most of the lines, or almost all the lines from Bratchet Kata in all the games we saw were pretty much optimal. And... Uh, Marriage to him is it, it was deserved, and uh, congratulations is also getting the invite for the next one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. The, the top two players will still be invited back to the next Fight Night Legends EU, and we are actually going to be back after this quick break with a short interview with our newly crowned champion to get some insight into the preparation and the thoughts in the current metagame, perhaps. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back with that interview. Hello everyone and welcome back to Fight Night Legends EU. If you're just joining us, I am sorry to say that you missed the hot, hot grand finals. And we are now here with the winner's interview with our newly crowned winner, Bratched Kata. Welcome in my friend and congratulations. Hey, hello. Thank you, man. I know that there's been a lot of appearances for you for Fight Night EU, some close calls, and you finally take one. How did you feel about the lineup that you brought today? Was it just decks that you were comfortable on, or were you trying to target a specific meta? Oh, it, it was just uh, too comfortable with decks. Like, uh, from when I grind, uh, from when I tried to grind for uh, EU Masters, like, those were the two decks I felt most comfortable with uh, to climb. 
And I was like, they're so good into the meta, might as well just bring those two into fight night. And whatever I have to play against, I'll probably do well as long as I don't lose focus and make some bad misplays. Like uh I I I rewatched one of my games and I saw um a situation where I missed Leto with uh, Dragon Dragon's Clutch. Oh yeah, <laughs> I yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, during that time I completely forgot about the second part of the effect. I yeah, even I missed did too. The I was, I was casting it. I was like, Bro, wait. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was it, it was so bad, but I, I, I knew in the back of my head, as long as I get to play ASO, get an elusive, I can probably win the game yeah. as safe as possible. So it probably wasn't as bad, but yeah, I could have still won the game right there on the spot if I just remembered the card effect. Mm -hmm. But I guess, I guess it, it happens sometimes. I was just so used to playing the card for draw to draw to draw through that. I know it's, yeah, it's I just, you forget for about me. that that other bonus effect. Yeah. I think I've only seen Dragon's Clutch cast for the buff like one or two other times, like over all of the time I've seen the the card be played. But yeah, yeah, I, you have very rare situations where that actually matters, and in that situation it should have mattered, but I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. In the end, you still got to win, and that's all that matters. So congratulations! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, when you were putting your lineup together, we noticed that your dragon deck was a little bit more flexible. Did you think that, you know, just not running Zoe is just correct here? Manitas had a theory that the reason you weren't running Zoe was to make the deck a little bit better into Nasus Thresh. You just, are you just not liking Zoe or it she just true. ended up getting cut? Uh, to be fair, it is true that uh, not running Zoe is a bit better into some of the matchups. Zoe just, like, you either run dragons, like Shivana, Aso, or the Zoe doesn't, she doesn't give you that much uh, mm. compatibility. Uh, yeah, she gives you one invoke, but that invoke really made me stabilize and it just made me use my mana which could have been uh, utilized much better so mm. uh, i didn't like her for that reason specifically and i just um, could have played uh, like a judgment instead of her which in some cases just yeah wins me the game on the spot against most aggro decks even sometimes uh, against uh, really azure if they tap out of homecoming so yeah, it uh, for me personally, it felt way better to play without Zoe. Yeah, and honestly, good on you for you know innovating on a card that typically, even with the absence of Zoe, some players will try to tech in Jarvan or or they'll just go three three and just call it a day. But you know, some of the the one ofs and techs in this list, I think that you know getting a more toolboxy style uh, really pays off, especially when there's a wide variety of decks potential potentially to yeah, account yeah, for definitely. in the current in the current meta game. And so now that you've gotten this fight night win, uh what is, you know, the on the bracket for you next? Like are you are you looking to uh just keep qualifying, keep playing, going for worlds? A lot of players are thinking about taking a break <laughs> from the meta game right now. Are you just gonna mm. keep strong? Oh I'm I'm definitely keep playing. I I I want to qualify for worlds of course. I have to prepare mm -hmm. the best way I can for the next seasonals. Although I'm pretty sure everyone would like to see some sort of nerf on that Irelia Azure deck because it's kind of BS. Mm. I mean if if they nerf Irelia Azir, and I think a few uh, viewers even in chat said, you know, that they, they probably also do need to address uh TLC. You know, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, your, your all, baby's of the, also all of get these hit. combo decks, like, they have to be addressed somehow, but mm -hmm. I, I guess the um, developers don't know yet. I'm sure they are working on some solutions mm -hmm. which can bring us a more healthy environment, but it, it takes a while. I'm pretty sure it takes a while. So we just have to wait patiently. And like we've always seen results from them. We mm -hmm. So I, I personally believe in them wholeheartedly. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Did you have uh, any final questions uh, for our winner, Manitas? Uh, I actually do have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Weren't you afraid of bringing TLC into a meta that has a lot of Azir Aurelia? Were, like, 
Weren't you expecting something? Why? Uh, I mean, oh, oh, TLC. Wait, you said TLC. Uh, ah, yes, nah, yes, yes. nah. <laughs> like, bro, when, when I climbed for uh, EU Masters, I played against so many uh, 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 Aziri Relia. Like, I just didn't care anymore. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was like, I, I found that it was beatable. And like, you just need a ton of board clears sometimes to set up a Trundo, Alessandra. Mm. There were some situations where you can just beat the deck through developing a huge board, and then they just don't have any sort of a good attack. Mm. Or the other is just go board clear after board clear. Well, is very huge usually in that matchup. Like, well, kind of wrecks them. Ice, Ice Shard could be very huge as well, but I, I prefer Box because Box just um, mm. can kill cards like Irelia Blossoming Blade. It has a bit more use for one more mana. It's a bit more efficient, let's say. Also, mm. plays around Shape Stone, for example, on a Sand Soldier or a Blade. Ooh, so very nice. I like that too. Yeah. That's that's a very interesting line. We also it, noticed... It's not the worst. Yeah, we also honestly. noticed the Double Renation. Do you want to talk about yeah, about double, uh, double ruination is, in my opinion, very important currently with all these um, Targon Demacia decks against Thresh Nasus, against Ashnox. It's it's quite important. Like I felt so comfortable with the double ruination just to have the card exactly on like uh, turn seven eight with nine mana available. It it's uh, it's definitely an advantage. They, they always have to play around it, and if they don't, they might just trade up loose on the spot. Mm. So you heard it here first, viewers. The double ruination is the new wave. Uh, TLC can, in fact, exist against Aurelia Azir. So, you know, jump back on that deck and see how it treats you. See if you can play it as well as our champion today who piloted it to near perfection. So I want to thank you once again for taking the extra time for this interview, Mr. Brachkata, and congratulations yeah, once no again worries. on your big win. We will see you, you at the next Fight Night Legends EU. You have a good one. Congratulations. So, you too. And so that will be the end of our Fight Night Legends EU broadcast, but there is still more Fight Night to be had. The NA variant will be taking place here in a few hours. If I have my time zones correct, I know it's midnight EU time, and then it's going to be 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the North American folks who might be watching today that, uh, for the East Coast there. So that is when the next fight night is going to be happening. Uh, my name is Skarzik. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you once again to Manitas for filling in for Panda. Any closing thoughts from you, sir? Um, I'm very happy for this opportunity. And I had a blast casting all these games. We saw a lot of good games. And as I said throughout uh, the entire day, I'm happy because I saw three Citrus uh, being played in one game. And now in the end, we saw also three Watchers just finishing an Axis. So uh, overall, I had a, a great day. And thanks uh, to Giant Slayer and, for, and also Skarzik for <laughs> and uh, the production. Basically, thank you everyone for, for the opportunity and uh, for, for all this day. It was, it was really good. All right, wonderful. So again, I can't, couldn't have said any better myself. Thank you to everybody for stopping by today, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one.